OK, we're now live. Thank you. Pippa, you're muted, I'm afraid. Thank you and good morning to everyone, to members, to officers, to any members of the public who are viewing this live stream um, of this planning committee meeting. So welcome everybody to the South Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee. My name is Councillor Pippa Halings and I'm vice chair of the committee. However, Councillor John Batchelor, chair of the committee, can't be with us today and so I'll be chairing this meeting and please bear with me. <laughs> Um, first time I'm chairing this meeting, so I hope I'll do everybody justice on this one. I've asked Councillor Anna Bradnam to act as vice chair of the meeting. So may I ask members please to agree to this by affirmation? Agree. Thank you. Does anybody not agree, which is probably the easiest way of doing that? Good, thank you. And thank you very much, Councillor Anna Brandon, for helping me in that way. Just to clarify, we'll be using the chat box specifically for requests to speak, not for any kind of conversation around the issues for debate, as this is a public meeting. So all conversation happens in public. So reserve the chat just to ask um, request to speak, which is for the committee members and for officers um, only for that. Thank you very much. So we are supported on the virtual top table, which is now dotted around. Um, and I'm going to ask each of these to switch on their cameras and to say hello and then switch off again. So first of all, we have Chris Carter, who is the delivery manager for strategic sites. Good morning, members. Thank you very much, Chris. And we also have Stephen Reed, who is our senior planning lawyer. Stephen. Uh, good morning, chair and members of the committee. Morning. Thank you very much, Stephen. And we have very, very importantly as well, Ian Senior, who is a Democratic Service Officer, taking the minutes today. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Many thanks, Ian. And I'm now going to introduce um, everybody else. There will be case officers and resource people who will be speaking to different issues on the agenda, and I'll leave that up to case officers to introduce them at each of the agenda items rather than um, naming them all now. So first of all, just a few housekeeping announcements. Please make sure that your device is fully charged. Switch your cameras and microphones off unless you're invited to do so otherwise. When you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. And when you've finished addressing the meeting, please turn your microphone off immediately. Speak slowly, clearly, and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone. Please ensure also that you've switched off or silenced any other devices such as phones or um, anything that you have so that they don't interrupt proceedings. Um, the virtual meetings do allow us to continue dealing with these um, important applications and we really want to make sure that this is um, a fair and efficient meeting, but everybody has the chance to take that. So please turn off your cameras and microphones until you're invited to do so otherwise. The normal procedure at planning committee is to take recorded votes and we'll continue with this tradition um, <clears throat> unless there's a clear affirmation otherwise. When we move to a vote on any item and there is not clear affirmation, I will ask for a roll call to be taken. I will then ask committee members to speak into the microphone so that their vote is clear both to the committee and to those watching the webcast. Members should respond for, against or abstain when their name is called. Um, and could I have somebody to second that, that the, these um, decisions are recorded? Yes, Chairman, I'll second that. Thank um, you very much, Councillor Fredman. Chairman, can I just point out that I don't know if it's the same for other people, but I have a meeting chat which is telling me I can't send messages because I'm not a member of the chat. Now, I don't know if that relates to an earlier conversation, but um, or an earlier meeting. I don't know if I'm the only one, in which case, if I am, I need to go out and come back in again, I think. Aaron, are you there? You are our support officer, tech support. Hi, yeah, it's Liam today. Um, Hi, Liam. 
<clears throat> Hi there. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure why that would be, uh, honestly. Um, if you if you go onto the tab at the top where it says yeah. uh, show conversation, if you're not able to um, like type into that into the meeting chat there, then I'm honestly not quite sure. I'm going to have to look up what to do. I mean, maybe if you want to exit and then come back in, that may help. Um, but yeah, I'm not quite sure. I'm going to have to have a think about that one. Sorry about this, um, members. I would just with Councillor Bradnam being vice chair, it's important that she can both see the chat and um, can type into the chat. OK, Chairman, I'll, I'll, I'll go out and I'll come back in again. Um, I apologise for the delay. Excuse me while I disappear. While we're doing that, I will continue. What we're doing is introducing all of the planning committee members. So I'm going to introduce, ask each of you to introduce yourselves. So please, after I call out your name, please turn on your camera and microphone. Just wait two seconds um, and then say your name and the ward you represent so that your presence may be noted. And then please remember to turn off your camera after your introduction. So everybody, as I said earlier, my name is Councillor Pippa Halings. I'm the member for Histon, Impington and Orchard Park, and I'm chairing this meeting. Councillor Henry Batchelor, um, please introduce yourself because I understand you're subbing for Councillor John Batchelor. Is that correct? Yes, morning Chair, Councillor Henry Batchelor subbing for John Batchelor. I'm one of the members. Thank you very much. Councillor Anna Bradnam, you're back with us. That's good to see. Yeah, uh, thank you. And the problem seems to have sorted itself out. Um, so that's good. So I'm Councillor Anna Bradnam, one of the members for Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Dr Martin Khan. Hello, uh, I'm Councillor Mart uh, Martin Khan. I'm a member for Histon and Pinkham and Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Peter Fain. Morning, Peter Fain, Shelford Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins. Uh, good morning everyone, Toomey Hawkins. I represent Cody Court Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Morning Chairman, Deborah Roberts, District Councillor for Foxton Ward. Thank you. Did we see you, Deborah? Oh, you better not really. I've seen my hair. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just checking it works when you do come in. Thank you very much. Councillor Heather Williams. I'm Heather Williams and I represent the Mordens Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Thank you very much Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for Whittlesford, Treplow, Heathfield and Newton. Thank you very much. And um, Councillor Eileen Wilson, I understand you're substituting for Councillor Judith Ripeth, is that correct? I am correct. Um, hello, good morning. Um, Councillor Eileen Wilson representing Cottenham and Rampton Wars. Thank you very much. And Councillor Nick Wright. Good morning, Nick Wright representing Caxton and Patworth. Thank you very much. Good. So I can confirm that the meeting's quorum. Do we have any other councillors present, please? Yes. Um, yes, uh, Councillor Halings, um, thank you. Um, I'm uh, Claire Daunton and I am one of the members for Fullborn and Fenditon Ward. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'm John Williams, also a member for Fenditon and Fullborn Ward, and I'm also present. Thank you very much, Councillor John Williams. Yes, Chair. Councillor Jeff Harvey, I'm a member for Borsham Ward. Thank you very much. Anybody else? No, good. Thank you. Um, and as I said, so if people could turn off their cameras until they are invited to speak, please, and make sure that your, your microphones are also muted until you speak. So if at any time a member leaves the meeting, please make that fact known to me um, or to the vice chair in the chat so that it can be recorded in the minutes. So members of the public are aware if a councillor is absent for any part of the presentation or debate about an agenda item, then they may not vote on that item. Given the technological um, issues around virtual meetings, we do make sure that we can try and get people back into the meeting so they've um, 
not miss anything obviously substantial. We'll always check that as well with our legal advice um, and that's how we'll be running for the virtual meetings. We have several public speakers today, so I'd just like to explain how public speaking works. The meeting is being broadcast live via the Council's website. And public speakers reminded that by participating in this meeting, you are consenting to being broadcast and to the use of images and sound recordings for webcast and training purposes. As usual, you will each have three minutes to address the committee, either individually or together with one another during that three minutes. When you start speaking, we'll start the timer. Please ensure you switch the microphone on before you speak. The timer will be displayed on the screen and when your time has elapsed, we will ask you to conclude your speech. If you continue to speak, we may mute you to enable proceedings to continue. Once you finish speaking, we may as members of the committee wish to ask you further questions for clarification. So please be concise in your response um, and if there are no more questions, you may leave the meeting and continue to watch the meeting via the webcast. And committee members are reminded that any questions to speakers should be for clarification purposes only. For the process for this should be as follows. I'll ask if there are any questions. If you do have questions, please ask to speak in the chat function. The committee can only consider planning reasons for or against the application. The committee can't consider general observations about the development site. The committee cannot consider comments from public speakers made outside the allotted speaking time. Therefore, the request that those registered do not interrupt outside their time. I as chair do have the ability to mute or remove participants as necessary. Once the committee has heard from all speakers and planning officers, we will debate and form views on the application. The committee will then vote and the outcome is decided by a majority vote in the event of a tie, I as chair have casting vote. When planning committee members vote, please can they ensure they identify themselves and speak into the microphone so that the vote is understood by committee and those watching the webcast. Members are reminded that they should indicate whether they are for, against or abstain when their name is called. We now go to um, the agenda item number two, the end of the chair's announcements um, and apologies, Ian. Thank you, Chair. Just to recap then, apologies from councillors John Williams, uh, sorry, John, John Batchelor and uh, uh, Judith Ripeth and their substitutes are councillors Henry Batchelor and Eileen Wilson. Good, thank you very much and noted. And now in terms of declarations of interest, do we have any declarations of interest members? Uh, yes, I do, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bradnam. Councillor Bradnam, um, just got my camera on. Um, I just wanted to say that I was on the planning committee when the application at Fullbourne was considered at outline. Uh, and uh, but I come to the matter afresh now looking at the reserve matters application. Thank you very much, Councillor Bradnam. And could you let me know if there are any others that wish to speak to this in terms of declaration? Yes, we have several. Um, firstly, Councillor Wright. Good. Councillor Nick Wright, please. Thank you, Chairman. And I have exactly the same declaration of interest as on item five, as I had at the last meeting, and on the enforcement issue number 10, 146 Cambridge Road, Wimpole, I have attended two public meetings in Wimpole many years ago uh, on this subject uh, when uh, going back to when I was planning portfolio holder. So um, that was some time ago. Good, thank you. Um, the next speaker chairman is uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. It was just on um, agenda item five. Obviously, that at the last meeting that did progress um, 
beyond just the introduction. Therefore, I just thought it's important that we all um, make it clear that we're we're um, looking at that item afresh. Good, thank you. And I think that, as you say, Councillor Williams, that, that applies to everybody. Yes. Um, the next speaker is Councillor Toomey Hawkins, Chairman. Councillor Toomey Hawkins, Dr Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. As you know, I'm the local member, um, but I've also been at meetings where the application was discussed um, as a parish councillor. But I come to the matter afresh. Thank you. Thank you. And Chairman, the last one we have on the list is Councillor Deborah Roberts. Councillor Roberts. Yeah, Chairman, um, I think it's probably covered by Councillor Heather Williams, but um, the the Bourne and the Long Stanton one, obviously, um, I've been party to the previous discussions, but come to these today afresh. Thank you, yeah. Chairman. Thank you. Um, yes, and I think, as I say, I think that goes for all of the committee members who were present at those meetings. I think we can say that applies to all of them for those items. Thank you very much. And we come to agenda item four, which is minutes of the previous meeting. Members, do you have any comments on minutes of the previous meeting? Um, in terms of accuracy, Chairman, this is Councillor Bradnam. Um, I have no objection um, and I will raise the matter that I wanted to raise which relates to the enforcement report but it relates back to these minutes when we're considering the enforcement report. Thank you Councillor Bradham and do we have anybody who'd like to speak to this to the minutes? Um, of the yes Councillor Henry Batchelor. Yeah. Councillor Batchelor. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just a small um, item of pedancy. On the first page of the minutes under item two, apologies, I think the word order is slightly jumbled up. Oh, yes, it was. <laughs> Chairman, it says Councillor Judith Ripith sent apologies, absence four. Um, and clearly that should say Councillor Judith Ripith sent apologies for absence. Good, thank you. Um, Ian, I think um, that will be duly noted. Good. Um, members, in terms of the agenda and the order of the agenda, um, as chair, I would like for us to slightly reorder the items of on the agenda. Chairman, before we proceed, do we need to um, Sorry, move to accept the minutes of the meeting? Sorry, thank you very we much. Need yes, sir. could we all accept the minutes of the previous meeting, given that there was just a little bit of jumble of words within that? Agreed. 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 Thank you, everybody. So, yes, in terms of the um, substantive items on the agenda, as chair, I would like to for us to consider agenda item six, which is Fullbourne land east of Teversham Road. There is a significant amount of public interest um, around this item and we've received multiple representations there are quite a few people who are going to be speaking to this item and also knowing that a significant number of them are also key workers within the health sector. Um, we have received information from the officers that they are advising a change to the officer recommendation, which is a change to deferral. I would like us to consider this agenda item before agenda item five, bring it to being the first item on our agenda in terms of the substantive issues, so that we discuss as a committee, we debate now a proposal whether to defer or to determine this application, given that if there is a decision to defer, that would mean that all of those people um, then could get on with, you know, the very important things that they are doing. And I understand as chair, I'm able to um, make that decision, you know, committee to put that forward and therefore treat agenda item six, Fullborn Land East of Teversham Road first. And given that, what I would therefore um, like to hear is from our case officer, Chris Carter, if you could give us some explanation and background to the change in the reasons for 
offers a recommendation on this application. Yes, thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. Um, just to confirm, I'm not the case officer, but we do have the case officer with us. Um, members uh, will have received uh, correspondence from me yesterday evening, um, setting out the proposed change in the recommendation for consideration this morning, uh, that being a recommendation for deferral of the application. There are two um, reasons for that change of recommendation. Firstly, um, as set out in, in my correspondence to you all, uh, the council received uh, draft copies of a legal challenge to any decision which may be made on this application today, should it be determined. Uh, that was received uh, on Monday evening. Um, and whilst officers spent some time looking at that, considering that yesterday, we haven't been able to reach a position where we feel we can advise members in the level of detail that would be required. Um, further to that, um, a separate representation was received yesterday uh, in respect of drainage uh, and flooding issues uh, from a local resident. That was passed on to the lead local flood authority yesterday uh, morning for consideration. And late yesterday afternoon, the lead local flood authority also requested that the item be deferred in order to allow them more time to consider that additional information that had been provided. Um, in the light of requests, um, uh, and a request from the applicant also for the matters to be deferred in order that these issues can be addressed. Uh, officers have considered that the um, best advice we can provide the committee at the moment is to seek to defer this item in order that we can return the item to you once those matters have been resolved and we're able to um, advise you um, uh, effectively. So Chair, those are the reasons um, for it, but happy to um, answer any questions that members may have. Thank you. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I'd just like to say we are now looking, therefore, and what's being referred to as agenda item six, which is on page 49 of the committee's papers. And this is application S3290-19, reserved matters for the land east of Tebersham Road, Fullbourne. And the proposal is for approval of matters um, reserved for appearance, landscaping, layout and scale following the outline planning permission which was given for the development of 110 dwellings with areas of landscaping and public open space and associated infrastructure works. Um, the applicant, Castlefield International Limited. Um, the key material considerations would for this, if it were to be determined, would be compliance with the outline planning permission, housing provision, including affordable housing, open space provision, and the reserved matters would include layout, scale, appearance, landscape, biodiversity, flood risk and drainage, highway safety, management of roads and parking, residential amenity, heritage assets and other matters. So there hasn't been um, a site visit. Mm -hmm. It is a departure um, and the extension of time has been agreed to 18th of January 2021, was being brought to the committee because Fullbourne Parish Council had requested that it be brought here. The original officer um, recommendation in our papers was for approval um, and that has now been changed as a recommendation to deferral. Chairman, we have a request to speak from Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. Um, Councillor Heather Thank Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Speaking in relation to the deferral, um, so, so I had a when, when we were emailed last night, I had a look at the at um, some of the dates again because I was worried. Given we'd already given an extension and it was the 18th of January, whether we would be at risk at non-determination from the applicants. However, I am going to make an assumption, but I would like this confirmed by officers that we don't consider this is going to be likely, given that. Um, if they were to receive a refusal at any point, then they would lose their outline planning permission, um, given that they had to put their reserve matters application in before October 2019, and they did in, in, in September 2019. So I would, I would like confirmation around the status of, of that, please. And also um, some explanation as to why, as it was submitted, the reserve matters application was put in um, in September 2019 and we're now in January 2021. The, the purposes of this deferral, is it to enable the applicant to provide 
further um, information because in, in my view if they've not provided adequate information and that's what we're waiting for then then tough tough luck um, we judge it on the information that they have provided and if that's not sufficient then it's not sufficient um, or is this some other other reason what, what I wouldn't want to see is us deferring this to enable to give the applicant more time they've had they've had plenty of time to put their proposal forward and it should be judged accordingly and if they haven't provided the right information then you know that's their lookout thanks chair thank you um and please bear with me everybody i just want to um allow the the case officer katie christa delides um, who's principal planning officer and case officer for this to introduce herself Hi members, it's Katie Custard Leaders here, Principal Planning Officer, Case Officer of the application at um, Tevisham Road in Fulbourne. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for that, Katie, and apologies. Please bear with me, everybody. <laughs> so um, who would be responding to that? Um, those questions from Councillor Heather Williams? Would that be you, Sir? Sure. Chris? I think Chair, it's yes. Sir. Hmm. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm happy to um, respond. Uh, firstly, dealing with the issue of the extension of time, um, when uh, these issues arose during the course of yesterday, um, we have been in contact with the applicants um, and as I, I said in my initial uh, comments, they have uh, requested a deferral in order that um, both they and the council can consider uh, any potential implications of the draft legal challenge. So in the light of that, I would be confident that they would be prepared to agree to a further extension of time uh, if we were to request one. Um, in terms of the purpose of the deferral, um, any challenge to uh, a decision, uh, should a decision be made today, would be a challenge against the decision of the council. Um, so the purpose of the deferral is for officers to have um, sufficient time to consider um, the potential risk of uh, challenge uh, and to advise members accordingly and if we need to take any action to mitigate that risk to, to do so. Um, now um, that's that's the first thing. The second thing is that the additional information provided by a local resident in terms of flood risk um, is something that the lead local flood authority, which members will know as part of the county council, um, have considered yesterday. But again, don't feel they have sufficient time to uh, provide um, the appropriate advice on that. So um, there's a detailed technical matter there, um, which um, the technical consultee um, needs to advise us on. Uh, but also from the count, our council's own perspective, we need to have sufficient time to consider the uh, the risk of, of challenge to any decision that might be made. Um, so those are the reasons that hopefully that clarifies, but I'm happy to come back if, if required. Councillor uh, Williams. Can I? Thank you. Um, yes, well, I just wanted to completely clarify that we weren't um, agreeing to a deferral to give the applicant more time. If it's to give us our, more ourselves more time because there are you know advice that's needed then then I will support the deferral I was just not um not minded to do it to to um help the applicant given the length of time that they've had thank, thank you. you very much um Councillor Williams Councillor Braddon could you turn your um camera off please sorry the oh, chairman there's um we have a, a series of speakers who've yes. asked to speak yeah um so um Perhaps the first we ought to take, although it's not the first in the line, is, is Mr. Stephen Reid. So thank you very much for our senior um, legal officer. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, it was my understanding that Councillor Heather Williams was suggesting that in the event of a refusal by planning committee, then the outline planning commission would be lost. Uh, it's my understanding that the applicant would be able to appeal any refusal by planning committee and it would only be on a appeal determination supporting a refusal that the outline consent would be lost. If the appeal was successful, then the outline would stand. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Councillor Bradnam. So the, the next speaker would be Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you. 
Uh, fair, thank you, Chairman. I, I think really we, we shouldn't waste any more time this morning. I think it's been perfectly explained by um, senior planning officer and by legal officer. And I move then, Chairman, that we um, support the recommendation for deferral. So you would you like to yeah, support that? Which is what I was just about to, make, do, to make that make that proposal. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Chairman, did I jump your gun? Sorry. If you want to propose it, Chairman, I'm happy to second. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for those who have also asked to speak, is would you still like to speak before I make the proposal that we, um, you know, a motion that we defer this item and take it to the vote? Yes, OK, so um, we'll continue with the speakers who've requested to speak. Uh, so the speaker who has requested to speak is Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Fain was actually before me. I don't know if he still wants I to I know, speak. but he hasn't asked to okay. speak. Yeah, I, 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 I must admit, I, I am a bit uncomfortable, so I was wondering if I could just ask for clarification by what, what we mean by officers taking steps to mitigate the risk of challenge. Um, I, I'm a bit uncomfortable that we're deferring this so that we've got time to rebut all the points that have been made um, against us in, in, in the, the, the apparent or the claimed judicial review. I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. I'm not very comfortable with that idea that we just defer so that we can, you know, um, so that officers' decisions can be made more robust. Um, so, yeah, clarification on that. And I'm also not very happy about the flood authority, which seems to have completely given up um, in, in the face of a challenge. It rather suggests they haven't done their job properly um, the first time around. Good. Um, thank you. Chris Carter, would you like to? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor uh, Williams, I, I apologise if my choice of words was poor. Um, I, I didn't mean uh, mean. Um, what what you're sort of uh, how you've interpreted it uh, the the purpose really was um, to understand uh, the legal challenge that's been made and whether or not um, we need to advise the committee in a different way as a result of that um, and given um, unfortunately we only had the course of yesterday to to consider that we haven't been able to conclude those uh, those discussions yet um, so so again apologize if uh, if I uh, chose a, a poor form of words uh, with regard to the the local flood authority, um, I, I take your point. Um, I think the only the only thing I would say in response to that is um, the additional information was only provided to us and therefore to them yesterday morning, um, uh, and therefore it, it's a short period of time. But yes, uh, I think we will need to look into the advice that was given previously because obviously you will have noted that they were re recommending no objection, um, and um, I think they like we would like to take the opportunity if they can to review that position in the light of the additional information that's been provided, given um, how important that issue is for this particular scheme. Thank you, Chair. And Chairman, we have an, a further. We still don't know if Councillor Fain wishes to speak again, but we do have a request from Councillor Martin Khan. So just to say um, for everyone to know that we, what I will be doing now um, immediately is to be putting this as a motion to vote to either defer or to determine this application. Um, Councillor Khan, would, do you still have a point you'd like to make or a question you'd like to make before you can vote on that? Uh, y yes, please. Um, simply wanted to comment that actually there is more than this issue why it might wish to be deferred. I had, uh, depending on what was said, in, it would have been said in any uh, discussion. I had reservations about the management of the uh, meadow uh, area, which uh, and the proposal. See, Mark, that, Martin, sorry, uh, Captain Khan, we, we won't go into a debate around no, the determination of uh, the issue. Uh, no, yeah. but what I was going to say is that uh, it's very possible that other other issues might wish to be referred. So I'm very much in favour of deferral, but not simply for the reasons proposed there in in the uh, by, by by the officers here. There's further issues as well. I think that might need to be uh, considered. That's all. Okay. Um, haven't heard from Councillor Fain and therefore I'm understanding that um, you're okay with us moving now to the motion. The motion is to defer, thank you Councillor Fain, is to defer the um, consideration of this application to allow officers to have enough time to be able to um, provide all of the guidance that's needed for committee 
to make a determination based on this recent information that's been provided. So the motion that I'm doing is to defer this application and that's being seconded by Councillor Roberts, is that right? That's right, Chairman, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Can I take that by affirmation, um, committee? Agreed. 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 Anybody who is against um, that, just so we can absolutely assure we've got it by affirmation. Anybody wishing to abstain? Thank you. In terms of the, the decision, therefore, is to defer this agenda item. I'd like to really thank all of those who've taken all the time to make representations, especially those, as we know, who are um, key workers and have taken the time to come along to this um, and to provide all those representations, as to all members of, of the public, obviously, as well. And thank you to officers for putting all the time in yesterday to bring us to this situation this morning. Thank you very much. We've finished that agenda item. And to those who have been waiting to, um, therefore, very kindly for us to return to agenda item five now, which is Bourne, the former Gestamp factory um, Bourne airfield. Thank you, which is page seven of our agenda. So as I said, this is agenda item five, the former Gestamp factory site in Bourne airfield, and the proposal is for a hybrid planning application consisting of full planning permission for phase one and outline planning permission with all matters reserved except access for phase two of the redevelopment of the former Gestamp factory site at Bourne Airfield for up to 26,757 square kilometres of commercial four space purposes, associated car parking and service yards, external earthworks, attenuation basins and landscape. And this application is subject to an environmental impact assessment. The applicant, Diageo Pension Trust Limited. The key material considerations relate to the principle of development in this location, whether the development meets the requirements of policy SS7, highway and transport matters, impact on landscape, design and appearance, sustainability and drainage, ecology and living conditions of local residents. It's not a departure. Um, in terms of timing, an extension of time has been agreed until the 15th of December 2020. Um, but so far, the applicant hasn't responded to a request to agree a further extension of time. Application is brought to the committee because this is a major application. The presenting officer is Kate Poyser, who will introduce herself and any other um, officers who may be responding and um, to concerns and considerations and questions. And I think as committee knows, um, this was deferred at the planning committee meeting on 9th of December, and I'm sure our presenting officer will provide us the, the context for that. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning, everybody. Um, I shall just prepare the presentation. Right, could you please confirm that you can see the presentation in front of you, please? Can do. OK, I so should just enlarge that. Right, um, this application was deferred at the last meeting of the planning committee. This was due to an additional consultation period inadvertently being added to the public access website when letters were sent out notifying people that the application will be considered at the planning committee. The additional consultation period has now expired. One additional present representation has been received as a result of this, and that is from Bourne Parish Council. Their comments are included and considered within the updated officer report to committee, which you will all have seen. I shall now move on to the next item. Next slide. This slide shows the site within its context. The site is outlined in red. It includes the access road from the Caldecott roundabout on the St Neots Road known as Wellington Way. 
the St. Nate's Road and the A428 run east-west across the top of the slide. Um, the village to the east is Highfields Caldicott, separated by the site by small woodland. To the west is the David Ball Industrial Site. To the northeast corner lie it, it, agricultural fields and Bourne Airfield, Airfield lies further to the east and to the south. Part of an old runway is visible running diagonally to the west. The application site lies within the strategic site of Bourne Airfield New Village. The slide shows a spatial framework diagram taken from the Bourne Airfield New Village supplementary planning document. The application site lies within the purple area. Um, and occupies most of this space. The remainder of the purple area includes the phase three land of the Gestamp site and the David Ball site. The pale yellow areas would accommodate the proposed 3,500 new dwellings. The dark yellow for mixed use. The large red area would be the village centre with shops and other services and the small red circle for neighbourhood help. Dark green is the existing woodland and the lighter greens for green corridors, open spaces and strategic landscaping. Except for the purple area, the rest of the site is owned by countryside properties and the Taylor family. A separate application for planning permission has been made for this land. It is in an outline application for the new village. Whilst it has not yet been determined, it has progressed a significant way through the planning negotiations and will be the subject of a special meeting to members. The supplementary planning document for Bourne Airfield New Village includes the existing employment site and requires there to be good connectivity between it and the new village. The applicants for both the Gestamp planning application and the new village have liaised throughout the process to achieve this end. The access parameter plan for the new village has indicative links into the employment site, and these are reflected in the layout of the Gestamp site plan, which will be displayed later. The green dash lines on this plan are indicative of those links. This is an aerial photograph of the site taken from above the A428 looking south. The application site is here. The Bourne New Village site includes the villages in the foreground and the villages and the fields the other side of the application site and includes the woodland beyond. It also includes a narrow strip of land on the edge of the woodland and the field in the corner. As you can see, the application site is enveloped by the new village site. Highfield Caldicott is over here. Here is the access road called Wellington Way. It is in the ownership of Countryside Properties and the Taylor family. The, applica the applicant for the Kassam site has right of access over it. Wellington Way will be reconfigured as part of the new village scheme and would include segregated facilities for pedestrians and cyclists. It is intended that it would be implemented with the first development phase of that scheme. This is the parameter plan showing three phases of the development of the former Gestamp site. The blue is phase one and includes details. The yellow Phase two is in outline and the orange hatch area is phase three. It does not form part of the application and is to be submitted at a later date. The green is strategic landscaping, black is existing access road. This is an illustrative master plan. The details for phase one are shown and the details for phase two are indicative only. Two green corridors um, 
the set are shown the central corridor and the land to the east and of the site. The central corridor is here and to the east of the site. The eastern corridor would contain an attenuation basin, a pedestrian cycle path and planting. Unit three abuts this area. It is the largest unit on the site and it is intended for a named occupant, Cambridge Design Partnership. Both of the pedestrian stroke cycle paths would link up to intended paths beyond the site and into the new village scheme. Surfacing would be taken to the rear of the units. Small units, which may well be occupied by local businesses, are to the south. Shared parking is to the north of the site and some to the south. A, a few spaces would serve the industrial units. Cycle parking is scattered in various locations around the site. The Leylandi hedge we saw in the aerial photograph earlier would be replaced by a new planting tree belt along the northern boundary to, to create a lasting screen. The land beyond is intended for mixed use development under the new village scheme. This slide shows the two main oh, next one, sorry folks. This slide shows the two main elevations of Unit 3. The remaining elevations are largely blank. This would be the largest unit on site, measuring just over 14 metres high. It would be clad in shades of grey with gold highlighting the insides of some of the fins. Right, um, this is the multi-storey car park that would occupy the northeast corner of the site. As you can see, it is just two storeys high, and if you look at the ground level, you could see that it would be par partly sunk into the ground. And this is the final slide. This is an artist's impression of units one and two, the north facing elevations with a green corridor running between them. Uh, that's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. So do we have any um, clarification questions, members? I've I've got one chair. Yeah, I just, so Richard yeah. Williams, yeah. Yeah. Thank thank you, Chair. Um uh, I don't know if you can see me, but um it, yeah. it um it's rising from the officer's report. Um and I wanted to ask for a bit more detail about why condition one that was there in December um is no longer there um about this cycle path. Um because because I must say I'm a little a little bit concerned that the applicants, as the report says, have withdrawn their support for condition one. Um, and I'm not really sure why we've just we've just agreed to that. If we thought it was necessary on balance in December, I'm, I'm not really sure why we should think it's not now, just simply because the applicants have withdrawn their support for that condition. It, it seems quite important to me um, that we uh, that we have proper cycle links um, and the other point I wanted to get some clarification on is the fact that there is as the report says uh, no pedestrian and cycle access down um, Wellington Way um, and, and and why we aren't requiring that either I, I'd like a little bit more detail on that because that that to me seems quite quite important the the, the report seems to say well we just have to hang on um, for the housing development and the housing development will do it um, I'd like some clarification on why why it can't be in this application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, thank you, Chair. Now, condition one, uh, when the applicant withdrew their support for providing uh, works to the footpath uh, within Highfields Caldicott, 
the uh, highway authority were reconsulted it seemed that over time there had been several attempts to um, gain this additional uh, work to the highway under various development schemes and um, they'd all been unsuccessful for various reasons and um, the highway authority felt that whilst it would be desirable to have this work carried out at the end of the day it wasn't necessary something that is required of a condition is that it is necessary um, and they, they felt that they too could no longer support the requirement for that work due to the difficulty of providing it. Uh, so that's condition one. Uh, the next question um, relates to the access way, Wellington Way. Now Wellington Way, it does form part of the application site, but it is not within the ownership of the applicant. It is countryside properties, the applicant for Bourne New Village who owns it. And um, it is not possible to require the applicant to provide uh, a footway alongside that, uh, alongside Wellington Way because it's not land within their ownership and it's not land within their control. So we can't do that. Uh, however, the, the road Wellington Way is wide enough to be able to accommodate a, a cycling with on, within the carriageway. It's wide enough for cyc cyclists to travel along there. Um, so it cannot be provided. So the question is, do we refuse planning permission for that reason? And it is felt that um, there's two things really. One is that it will be provided in the future when Bourne New Village um, it is uh, started under construction. And the second one is there is an extant planning permission on the Gestamp site for the redevelopment of the site for industrial units, uh, which could still be implemented today and does not have any better facilities for cyclists and pedestrians than the Camel Wellington Way. So adding those matters together has resulted in a recommendation for approval. So can I, can I just thank ask you for just so through the chair, thank you, Councillor. Yeah, thank you. Through, through the chair, can I ask a very quick follow-up? Could it not be part of a 106, the um, upgrading Wellington Way? Um, it, it, it may it may have been possible, but you'd have to have had you'd have to have the willingness of countryside properties as well. Um, which we don't have that in front of us at the moment. Thank you very much. I'm sure it will come up in the debate, but that's good in terms of the clarification. Thank you very much. Councillor Bradham, do we have any other speakers for clarification? Yes, we have Councillor Henry Batchelor and then myself. Thank you. Councillor Batchelor. Thank you, Chairman. I think my question links very much in with Councillor yeah. Richard Williams's question. Um, so in the officer's report, item 47 on council transportation, there's a still a holding objection um, regarding sustainable links to surrounding villages with the explanation being the applicant has been able to overcome these. I mean, given the fact that we that the one of the conditions was removed from the December's report, I just wanted to ask clarity from the officer that they feel the applicant has done everything they can to overcome this objection. Um, I think the officer may have answered it in response to Councillor Richard Williams, but just a bit of clarity for me would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and Kate, if there's anybody else you want to bring in on any of these other clarifications or yourself, that's fine. OK, thank you. Now, with regard to links, uh, pedestrian and cycle links, uh, there has been quite a lot of liaison with countryside properties. Uh, in relation to the new, new born village and there is a master plan for that and the applicant for the Gestamp site has sought to provide links through their site that would link into the master plan for the new village. Um, the, uh, the 
the two cycle paths and footways that go run north south through the site, uh, the central one and the eastern one, will link into the intended um, footpath cycleways through Bourne New Village. And there is also intended to be within the, the countryside scheme a east west link that will go into the Gestamp site and across the fields to Highfields Caldicott. Uh, so the Gestamp site, their scheme, takes that into account and provides a link into the countryside land. Thank you. So just, just clarification of the chair. So there isn't in paragraph 47, there isn't a change to um, you know, the removal of any objections as a result of the change to condition one. That doesn't change what's there in, in no. 47. No. Thank you. Thank you. OK, and Councillor Bradnam. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to clarify, and I'm struggling to check whether, as I recall, the question was asked um, previously about foul uh, water management, and there's no condition in the current um, officer report. And I just wanted to check with the officer whether that whether foul water uh, treatment has been dealt with under the uh, outline or whether it's under this application. Uh, thank you. I, I do believe there is there are there is at least a condition relating to that. If you just bear with me, I'll try and get the report in front of me so I can see where it is. Members will appreciate I'm asking that because we know that the um, there have been questions about the ability of the pumping station at the south of Highfields Caldicott to, to the capacity of that pumping station. Right, um, now condition 22 in the recommendation, flood risk and drainage, that relates to uh, um, a drainage report from Consultants Bradbrook's report, and it requires the, uh, the the drainage system to link into that to be in compliance with the Bradbourne report. But this is referring to surface water, is it not? It, it does include foul drainage as well. So it, just everyone to know, we're on page 39 with condition 22. Is that right, Kate, that we're looking at? That's right. I yeah. mean, we do also have condition 26, which relates to surface water drainage. But con condition 22, the Bradbrook report, relates um, to foul drainage as well. OK, OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any further questions for clarification for the case officer? No, we don't, Chairman. OK, thank you. So now we'll go to um, the public speakers. And as I understand, we have um, representing for the applicant, Mike Biedemann, and the agent, Jeremy Aitchison. And I understand that you're going to share the three minutes between you. Is that right? That's correct. Thank you, Good. And so would you like to introduce yourselves first then, please? I'm Jeremy Aitchison of Aitchison Developments. Thank you very much. And do we have Mike Biedman? Uh, yes, I'm Mike Biedman from Cambridge Design Partnership. Good. And so who will start between you? Jeremy. Jeremy Aitchison. Thank you very much. So you, you do have three minutes to be shared between you. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chair, Councillors. I'm Jeremy Aitchison of Aitchison Developments. My company was appointed by the site owner, Diageo Pension Trust, two years ago, and the vision was to create a development that would exceed what a standard industrial estate offers in every possible way. We wanted to create a place that would attract both local industrial businesses and larger technology companies. We wanted a highly sustainable development that looked amazing and that would attract high quality companies and their staff. That development is called Bourne Quarter. 
It was a visit to the high tech campus in Eindhoven, Netherlands in March 2019 that gave the team the inspiration for the design that is the subject of this application. We decided that a landscape led parkland set using very high quality materials would enable us to develop builds that are immensely flexible and can provide both standard industrial units through to buildings that can incorporate large office and laboratory areas. We sure that staff from all businesses choose to come to Bourne Quarter will appreciate the environment that we are creating that includes a cafe, crash, gym and outdoor trim trails. We're delighted we've signed our first tenant, the Cambridge Design Partnership. Bourne Quarter will be deliver much needed commercial space on what is currently a brownfield site and will deliver over 800 jobs to the area. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair and Members. Um, I'm Mike Biedman, Director and one of the two founders of Cambridge Design Partnership. Um, we've grown Cambridge Design Partnership in Toft since it was founded at almost a consistent 20% per annum uh, since 1996. And we've done this by adaptive, uh, adapting and diversifying our engineering consultancy and making use, making us one of the top four consultancies in the Cambridge area. As of today, we're 203 people. Uh, we've been based in Tuft from the outset and our countryside location is an important part of our image for both our clients, and most of them being international, and our employees, most of whom obviously live locally. Since 2016, we've been looking for potential new sites. Uh, we've now overpacked our site in Toft, and I'm sure it's come up at planning committees several times. Um, and we have temporary buildings. We've now taken on additional space in Barton, um, out in Cambridge, and most recently in Sawston just to cope with our expansion. And this has given us quite um, problems from sort of distancing and everything else. And it's made us quite inefficient, although has enabled us to remain very COVID friendly in a bizarre way. Um, while we've looked at options within Camborne and Sawston and elsewhere, they're all single buildings um, and without any scope to expand. Bourne Quarter offers us the perfect opportunity to regroup into a unit of 56,000 square feet. Um, and then we have the option to expand further into an adjacent building in the second phase development in a few years time. Over the last year, we've worked with interior design teams and architects to fit out the labs and offices and workshops from the design for Bourne Quarter such that we can move in in 2022, which will barely be soon enough. Uh, for our employees, Bourne Quarter is again west of Cambridge. It's almost the same distance from central Cambridge, but with even better cycle access and other transport options compared to soft. So it offers us more advantages as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you both as well for managing that task to present those um, within three minutes. And um, are there any clarification questions from members. Um, Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins would like to speak, Chairman. Yes, Dr Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to ask uh, Mr Aitchison if you would explain a bit more to the committee why they went to Eindhoven um, to get inspiration, so to speak. Well, uh, th uh, thank you um, to me. Uh, Eindhoven was um, probably most of you will know as where the Philips uh, industry was originally based. Uh, and uh, when they moved all their production uh, into the Far East, uh, it was uh, an area that had um, to reinvent itself and huge unemployment. And it's been the um, engine house of um, high tech and industrial uh, business for the Netherlands. It's been immensely successful. They've got leading um, architects and design ideas. It's very inspirational. You go there and you see buildings that you don't really see in the UK at all. So we felt Bourne Quarter warranted something different. We think we were delivering something different. And the, the inspiration came from that. Thank you. 
Thank and, you. and a follow up, if I may, to uh, Mr. Biedman. Um, I know, I mean, I've been fortunate to see uh, Cambridge Design grow because uh, Toft used to be in my patch <laughs> until 2018. Um, and I just wondered, I know, you know, as a local business, you were keen to stay in the area. What was it about this site that uh, appealed to you? Um, it's the um, largely the ability for expansion, um, but also you know, we have well, in the summer, probably we have 40 to 50 people that cycle to work. Um, I want to keep them happy. Uh, so, you know, alternative transport methods. I think we've, we've just invested in two move bikes or electric bikes just to allow us to get to and from Barton, where we've just opened an office uh, for the next 18 months. Um, so it's the it's that ability, the transport links and also the we want to avoid um, being within Cambridge because we just everybody that works for us um, enjoys the fact that we actually go against any traffic. Um, you know, we we we're not adding to the congestion within the city. Uh, getting out of Cambridge in the morning is quite simple. Um, so when we can come to work, which uh, at the moment is quite tricky, um, that's that's one of the advantages of being out in the countryside. And obviously. You know, we have quite a few people from Camborne, so Caldecott, Toft, they're very similar to our current uh, geography from that transport link. And, uh, and then for our clients, you know, considerably better uh, facilities in that area with the hotels in Camborne and, and uh, links back onto the M11 down to airports and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any further clarification questions? If not, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And we move now to hear from Bourne Parish Council. I understand we have Councillor Des O'Brien. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. You have. Do you have your camera on? Uh, I am just about to turn my camera on, which I think it's on now. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. You were with us before and you're here again. Thank you very much. So you do understand the, the timing and the way that this works. I do. I do. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. So could we, yes, if you want to start. Uh, can I just start off by saying that I do have the authority of the Paris Council to make the comments here today. Uh, so I think uh, the um, the piece that I sent through in the interim uh, between the deferral and now covers the points that we really want to make. And while we are not against this uh, this development in principle, we are against uh, we are we, we object on the basis of the issues to do with transport. And we've we've already touched in the previous speaker's comments about the issues around transport, and it is about to do to do with sustainability and about choices for public transport. And we have an issue around public for trans public transport because, uh, as you all probably know, the Camborne to Cambridge busway has been substantially delayed. And there's still a significant question mark over what and when it will be delivered. And I noticed in the applicants transport assessment, they made much of uh, the, uh, the, the possibilities and the advantages of a public transport system, the Camborne to Cambridge busway and the 428 corridor. They mentioned it probably eight or 10 times, but we don't know what's going to be delivered and we don't even know whether something will be delivered. So we have significant uh, reservations around uh, what is actually going to happen in terms of public transport. The second comment relates to um, the, a discrepancy, as we see it, between the number of parking places, 624 over both phases that will be delivered, and the number of car journeys into the site. They're saying 124 in the morning rush hour. So we don't understand, and we would like some clarification on how, if you're going to have 124 cars, you need 624 car parking spaces and this this speaks again to whether or not uh, we are truly committed to having public transport options for sites like this uh, and then finally the issue uh, around the cumulative development impact because there's going to be a born airfield a new settlement site as well uh, and in, in fact to Mike Beadman's point about congestion and and, and the fact that they, they run against traffic coming from you know, their, their staff coming from um, Cambridge to Toft, congestion will become an issue because we already know there are something like 9,000 car journeys generated by Camborne, you know, and so we're talking about maybe 7,500 car journeys being generated by Bourne Airfield 
without even taking consideration of the car journeys that 800 people on this new site will generate. So I would ask the uh, committee to look at this issue of deliverability of a sustainable site when there are so many question marks around the high quality public transport system and also issues to do with provision of car parking, which seems to suggest that the car will still be the main means of transport for this site. Um, so our, we would like those things to be considered uh, before the application is given or even conditioned before the application is given permission. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for keeping within the time and for confirming that you do have the authority to speak for the parish council. Thank you very much. Uh, members, do we have any clarification questions? No, nope, I don't think so. Thank you very much and I'm sure members will be picking up those points as we go into into the debate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in terms of local members, um, we have Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins, would you like to speak now or at the end of the debate? Uh, Chair, I will speak uh, during the debate, if I may. During the debate, yeah, or yes. at the end of the debate, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have, um, I think that's all in terms of other local members to speak. Thank you very much. So members opening this up to debate now. Do we have any speakers? We don't have any speakers so far, Chairman. Except for uh, except for Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Thank you. Councillor Toomey Hawkins, you would like to speak now then as local member? Uh, actually, Chairman, we do now have Councillor Richard Williams. So if you wished to take him first before Councillor Hawkins, that's up to you. Uh, I put my hand up because I thought we were in the debate, but happy to um, happy to let Councillor Williams go. Thank you. And so, so Councillor Richard Williams will speak first and then Councillor Hawkins. We are in the debate, so you will be able to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I was going to say, yeah, my, my, I, I am intending to speak in the general yeah. debate. So um, rather than ask, ask for clarification, um, I, I just want to say I mean, I'm, I'm not very happy about the removal of condition one. Um, I, I take on board the officer's clarification, but but it is a bit unsatisfactory that the Highways Authority again seems to take flight um, at the first sign of challenge. I mean, either they regarded that condition as necessary or they didn't. Um, and whether the applicant supported it or not should be irrelevant to that consideration. So I don't think it's very satisfactory that they just changed their mind because the applicants changed their mind. It, it looks like they're just taking the path of least resistance um, and that, you know, one way or other, they were wrong. I said they're wrong now or they were wrong in the first place. Um, so, um, so I'm not very happy with that. And I think personally, I'd like that condition to go back in, but it'd be interesting to see what other members um, think um, about that. Um, I'm also a little bit disappointed about the, the, the fact that the 106 doesn't sound like it's been explored on Wellington Way. I mean, if we are serious about, you know, minimising car journeys, then um, that, that, that access road is directly relevant um, to this um, site. And, and it, it, it would be good if we had um, the necessary infrastructure to enable people to cycle walk um, to the site from the start rather than waiting for another development, which, which, which may or may not come um, come come more quickly. So um, I am quite concerned about those things and I'd be very interested to hear if any other members share those concerns as well. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bradnam, do we have any other speakers? Yes, we have. Um, well, you may wish to take Councillor Toomey Hawkins now, but we also have Councillor Peter Fain and Councillor Deborah Willi Roberts. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Uh, oh. Chair, considering I have quite a lot of knowledge about this site, perhaps I could speak at the end and also make comments or pick up some of the issues that have been raised. Fine. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Peter Fain. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is the third attempt on this particular site. Um, as we hear, a visionary concept uh, supported by a key 
local firm needing accommodation of this sort. Uh, I was very interested to hear the concerns of the parish council um, in relation to the transport issues. I noted uh, Mike Beekman's comment that a key concern was to secure better cycle access and other transport options for staff within the current constraints. Um, and I find, find it interesting that this is accessible by sustainable transport, both to employees from Cambridge and those from Camborne. And of course, it will be important to have local employment in place if and when we consider further developments on Bourne Airfield. On the condition one that's been mentioned, I have looked at the reasons given for the change here. They're technical reasons which have satisfied the, the Highway Authority. And I think we should accept that because there will be scope to improve this later on. So for those reasons, I think it is time that we should, as recommended, give approval to this development. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Deborah Roberts. You can turn your camera off, Councillor Fain. Thank you. Deborah, are you, Councillor Deborah Roberts, are you able to speak? Chairman, while Councillor Roberts is trying to sort out her laptop, um, Councillor Williams has asked to speak as well. Councillor Heather Williams, thank you. Chairman, um, I'm happy to speak, but if Councillor Roberts is having technical issues, should should I wait? Otherwise, I'll have to repeat it for her or she won't be able to vote. Mm -hmm. Do we so have can I just, hear thank you very much, Liam. Can I can we confirm that Councillor Deborah Roberts is able to hear us and participate? Sorry, you want to confirm whether Deborah Roberts is able to hear you? Yes, if she's if she's able to hear, so she'll be able to hear Heather Williams while she's sorting out whether she can speak. If if uh, Councillor Roberts, if you can hear us, maybe make some sort of indication within the chat or. Alternatively, if you can hear me, then go on to the live stream. Um, I'm just trying to see if she's dropped out. Is it Roberts? Yeah, Roberts. Like, like the radios, right? Um, Chair, can Chair Councillor Roberts no longer appears in my list of attendees, so she may have dropped out. Good. Yeah, it appears. It appears that she might have dropped out. So what I would like to suggest is, as we've agreed in the protocol, if we just give a couple of moments now to enable um, Councillor Roberts to to rejoin. Um, so what I'd say is it's 11.19 now, so if we, um, 11.21, if we um, all just make sure we are still here and um, ready to continue the debate if we've managed to sort out the problem with Councillor Roberts.
Hi, Chair. I've sent her a couple of uh, requests to join. Um, so if she has uh, sort of got lost somewhere, <laughs> then um, yeah, she now has the links sent to her again. Um, do you know if anyone has, has tried to call her or anything like that to try and establish what's what's going on? Does um, anybody have Councillor Roberts number? Chairman, I do. Um, I can try and contact her. Thank you. If you would. Yeah, I've I've re-invited her, um, which is all I can really do from my side, which means that whatever um, address she joined from, uh, she should get an email or some sort of notification um, if, if it's been lost. But yeah, um, I think the best bet is to wait and, and see if we can get hold of her via telephone. Thank you, Liam. Yeah, it's really important. See if we can bring her back in. Yeah, no problem. Um, Chairman, I've just been in contact with Councillor Roberts and apparently she's had a power cut, um, which is a bit drastic. So I think perhaps, um, I think Deborah, we'll have to proceed you without you. Fine. OK. OK, right. -o. Thank you, Deborah. Bye -bye. She, she could dial in if she if she wanted to uh, uh, try and in the dial in number. Yes. OK, that's the point. Um, sorry. Let me, Let me just, just try and find that. Oh, Deborah, Deborah, it's me. You could dial in. Um, Liam has sent. I'm just trying to find the, the specific dial in information um, to I can email it to her or something. Oh, but then if there's a power cut, maybe her computer. Yeah, sorry, of course, she can't see the dial in number because she's had a power cut. So she said, don't worry, proceed without her because OK, no problem. Yeah, it's sort of catastrophic loss, as it were. Thank you. So, um, and Catherine, Bradham, if you just let her know that if she does manage to, you know, if the power does come back on and she does come in, that she lets us know is in the chat and we can then know where we are in terms of the proceedings and what her participation beyond that would would be. Um, it would be wonderful if she could rejoin at some point during the meeting. Okay. Thank you very much to Councillor Bradnam and to um, Liam for helping with that. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. And um, yeah, poor Councillor Roberts, we do hope that um, to be able to resolve that that issue. Um, so in continuing, we do have um, Councillor Heather Williams. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so, so listening to the, the speakers, we can we can hear that there's um, a lot of people that are within easily sort of um, cycling commuter distance. And that does make me concerned about the issues that Councillor Richard Williams has raised and, and the changes that are made there. I do feel that there are, even if not conditions, there are mechanisms such as Section 106 or unilateral undertakings, etc., that could be could be used. And I, I don't think we've explored enough of those options to be able to sort of say that it, it's not doable um, just on the applicant's resistance. Um, I do think the parish council has made valid valid points around the transport as well. Um, it, it does feel a little disjointed, um, and there is a reliance on things that um, that aren't quite at a, a developed stage that we could realistically rely on them. So some it could be argued that it is slightly premature to be to be looking at this. Um, 
So I'll be very listening very carefully to what the local member says, because obviously she has um, a lot more experience and, and what have you of this site and, and has meetings, etc. So I um, I remain on, on the fence, Chairman, uh, but they are my concerns. Um, but we'll be listening very carefully to the local member. Thank you very much. Councillor Bradnam, we have any other speakers? Yes, Chairman, there's me and then Councillor Batchelor uh, and of course Councillor Hawkins. Um, so I just wanted to um, agree with Councillor Fain that although the matters to do with access are regrettable, I think we should proceed. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but my concern is that we're relying um, for pedestrian accessibility on an application um, that that may not come, you know, that has not yet come forward, and I'm concerned that actually accessibility ideally ought to be established at the outset. Um, so it just seems very unfortunate that this might uh, impact the use of public transport that the employees at this business site uh, use. And I think it's very a great shame, but I think nevertheless we should proceed probably. Um, Councillor Batchelor is the next speaker, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I share a similar view to that of Councillor Fain. I mean, my main concern um, was the holding objection from the County Transportation, but having quizzed the officer on that and having heard the response, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm satisfied enough to, I think, make a decision on this now. Um, which will be which will be supporting the application. So unless I hear any strong views the other way, pr presumably from Councillor Hawkins, um, I will be supporting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so then we just have Councillor Toomey Hawkins, Chairman. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you very much, Chair um, and members. Um, I mean, as I said earlier, you know, I've I know a lot about this site. It's it's been a long standing employment site, uh, which actually was quite problematic uh, for Highfields and for the council to, due to the noise that TK used to generate. So when the uh, former owners you know, decided to stop operations and get planning permission for a, a new, you know, all singing, all dancing, quiet factory. Yeah, you know, there was uh, there was a party in the village, basically. Um, but they didn't build that. Instead, the site has been sold off um, to DAGO pensions, which is great in the sense that it is still an employment site. So it has planning permission, <clears throat> excuse me, currently as an employment site. Um, and the current planning permission that it has has nothing to do with Camborne to Cambridge Busway um, or you know, this this the strict uh, applications that we're trying to impose now. However, um, if I take the point of the Carbon to Cambridge busway, I mean, let me let me step back. This site is unique in the sense that it is surrounded by land it does not own. OK, so at the minute, people from Caldicott can cycle and the discussion seems to not understand that there already is a cycle path along Highfields Road. Yes, it could do with improvement, but there is, and people do cycle. How do you think we get to the bus stop? <laughs> we walk and we cycle. Wellington Way, yes, people still walk along it because when bond market happens, that's what they do. And if you look at paragraph 71 on page 24, it does state that, and I quote, the applicant and their agent have been in regular discussions with countryside properties for the purpose of providing a coordinated approach. So whilst there might be a delay in the C2C, uh, we know that Bonnie Airfield is not going to be brought forward or cannot be brought forward in full until the C2C is in place. So that is something that this applicant cannot control. So in my view, I don't see that we can impose on them something that they have no control over. Um, as you will see, Caldicott Parish Council does support um, the application. And you know, they have been in contact with us in the village. They've even asked you know, about the you know, history of the village, if they could incorporate some of it within the, uh, within the site. I think what um, 
uh, Ms. Leitch is probably didn't say to you is that the, the re they did revisions um, on the original proposal that they brought forward to us because they talked to us. And I will say this, that I wish lots of developers will do that in the way that HSN has done. Um, which is why you find Code of Parish Council supporting it. And I recognize the objection from Bourne, but I'm saying that that is not something we can impose on them because it is not within their control. Um, so for me, I am happy to support this application. And especially because <laughs> It, we, in some respects, we see the way in which uh, you know we can work together as a community. Whilst HSN was talking to us as a community, um, the owner of Kenry Design Pro, uh, Partnership was looking for space and mentioned it to me. And I said, ah, I know somewhere that might be useful for you. So you can call me a matchmaker, but that's what happened. So I put them in touch with HSN and this what we have before us today is a result of that working together of communities, developers, local members. And I would put this up as an example of how we should be working uh, to get the, the type of developments we want. In the beginning, there wasn't anything for small businesses on that site, but now look at it. They have listened to us and they have provided uh, spaces that small businesses, you know, your one man bands and things like that can use. Again, taking note of the needs of the of the district and of the community. So I would say to my fellow members, this is one that we need to support. So thank you. There are no further speakers, Chairman. Thank you very much, um, Vice Chair. So Members, what I've heard is there are some sort of concerns about, you know, the removal of that condition and the sustainable transport uh, issues that were raised by Bourne Parish Council. Others who are on the fence and will that, you know, they were they're minded to um, approve this application. I think it is time now with no further requests to speak that we go to a vote. And so um, the vote is in terms of the officer recommendation, which is approval of this application. Um, and I will now do a roll call and ask each of you, therefore, to register. Register your vote. We do have um, a comment that's been put in the chat, but this the chat is not for members of the of the public. So we'll continue with the vote as we're moving forward. I'm going to call out each of your names in terms of members. Stephen Reed, is I see in your planning lawyer, yes. Um, sorry, Chair, it's j just that uh, you have recognised that some members have have reservations I think, therefore, that before you take the vote, you should establish from those members who will vote against their reasons for refusal. Thank you very much, Stephen. Yes, um, as I understand, if those who are considering refusing the application from what you have said within the speaking, that would be in terms of highway and transport matters. Um, especially around sustainability, transport. Is that correct or are there other issues um, that you were raising, those who are minded to reject the application? I shall be voting against, Chair. Um, uh, for those reasons, I think it is reasonable and necessary to have a condition to upgrade the cycleway um, and the other transport points you've made. Thank you, Councillor Richard Williams. Um, Stephen, is that fine? We're, we're moving ahead with that. Yeah, so I think we're going to move to the um, vote now. Chairman, before you proceed, there's a request to speak from Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins and also from Chris Carter. So could I hear from Chris Carter first, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, it was just to uh, just to clarify that reason, should, should the vote uh, go against the recommendation. Um, uh, and I think what I heard from uh, Councillor Richard Williams was um, his concerns about the inad inadequate sustainable transport connectivity, uh, both uh, to and from the site and within the uh, the settlement of Highfields Caldercott. Um, is that correct, Councillor Williams? 
That's correct. Thank you. Thank you very much for that clarification. Um, Councillor Hawkins, I'm moving to the vote, if that's so OK. Um, Chairman, if, yes? before you proceed, just to clarify, the recommendation I've been hunting for is actually on page 32, a paragraph after paragraph, well, strangely, after paragraph 103. But anyway, it's on page 32. Thank you, Vice Chair. So I will go to the vote now as we were going to do that. This is on the officer recommendation to approve and grant planning permission. I'm going to do a roll call. And so when I do the roll call, please turn on your camera, wait two seconds and, and then say for, against or abstain. Um, um, call first of all, Councillor Henry Batchelor. For sorry. Chairman. Chairman, sorry to be a nuisance, but could I just ask you for clarification? Having found the recommendation, I found that the first condition is for a pedestrian refuge on Wellington Way. Now, are we clear that that is part of the land that is in their control? Well, this is talking about a pedestrian refuge on the Wellington arm of the Caldecott roundabout. Now, I thought we just said that that land is not in their control. Mr Carter's put his camera on, so. Sorry, Chair, through you. Um, sorry, I put my camera on before putting speak please in the chat, but um, that relates to uh, land within the public highway. Um, so it's the arm of the roundabout, so where pedestrians would cross there uh, rather than on Wellington Way, where it's in the private ownership of countryside. So it's land within the highway, hence the condition that's the, that's recommended. Okay. Thank you very much for that clarification. Sorry to interrupt your you, Chair. Yeah, I, I, I think we're in the middle of the voting. So if there had been a query, we should have done that before we moved to, to the vote on this one. So um, just to repeat, we've had Councillor Henry Batchelor, who has said four. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Four. Councillor Martin Khan. Four. Councillor Peter Fain. Four. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Four. Councillor Heather Williams. Against. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Against. Councillor Eileen Wilson. For. Councillor Nick Wright. Hey, Chairman, not voting in line with my uh, registered interest in the site. Thank you very much, yeah. And myself, um, Councillor Pippa Halings, I'm four. And we have Councillor Deborah Roberts, who is not with us in the meeting at the moment. So we have seven votes for, um, two votes against, and one member not voting um, because of the um, issues that he would mention first, Councillor Nick Wright. So this motion has been carried and um, planning permission has been granted for this application. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to suggest that we have a short break. We've been going. We do have some health reasons for members in the committee. And before we then go on to the next items, I just suggest that we take a short break. So it's 11.40 um, and I'd suggest it's just a five minute break. That's OK, so that we will come back at 11.45. Agreed. <laughs> Thank you, Liam. Um, are you there, Liam? Sorry, yeah, I was muted. <laughs> That's OK. Yeah. So do, do we keep live or we um, stop the live transmission while we're just having the short break? Uh, if it's for five minutes, I'll just advise everyone to mute their microphones and um, turn their cameras off. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's probably the best thing. Thank um, you very much. And, and Stephen, yeah. if you could lower your hand, please, um, and then raise it again if after the break you would you think we still need to speak. Thank you. I can I can lower his hand. Thank you. Uh, cool. 
Yeah, ju just to be aware, everyone, that it is still live, even though for five minutes we're taking a break. So, yeah, thank Good. you. Good, everybody, if you just mute your microphones and turn your um, cameras off if you like. Thank you.
Members, it's um, now 11.45. Can I just check that you are all here and with us so that we can continue with the agenda? I'll do a roll call to check yep. that everybody's here. So, um, Councillor Henry Batchelor. Still here, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Present. Councillor Martin Khan. Councillor Peter Fain. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Here, yeah, Chair. Thank you. I'm assuming Councillor Deborah Roberts is still not with us. Don't see her. Councillor Heather Williams. Here. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Here, yeah, Chair. Thanks. Councillor Eileen Wilson. Present. Thank you. Councillor Nick Wright. At some. <laughs> you, uh, myself, Councillor Peter Thane, I see you're with us now. Present. Thank you. And Councillor Martin Khan. Councillor Brennan, do you have Martin Khan's number? Oh, sorry, oh, I'm here. I'm just sorry, I've just really got there. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. OK, so we're, we're all present. Thank you very much. Thank you also to members of the public and to officers. We're now um, continuing with the agenda. We're at agenda item seven, which is on page 95 of the um, committee papers. This is um, about application S3215-19 and the discharge of conditions in Longstanton for the retreat Fuse Lane, Longstanton. Um, discharge of condition four for foul water drainage and condition five surface water drainage of the planning permission S stroke 2937 stroke 16 um, full application. The applicant is Mr. Jerry Cadu of Landbrook Homes Limited. The key material considerations for us committed today are on foul water drainage, surface water drainage and flood risk. Um, there was no site visit given the, the COVID conditions at the moment. It's not a departure. Um, the decision due by 11th of December 2019. And this has been referred to committee on the basis of a parish council objection, third party objections and the level of public interest in this application. Presenting officer is Lewis Tomlinson who wasn't very happy we took a little break. It seems by the, <laughs> by the chat, but uh, Lewis. And the um, recommendation of the officer is that this um, members are requested to support this application, as I understand. Lewis Tomlinson, yes. Do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Chair. Um, Lewis Tomlinson, Principal Planner and Case Officer for this application. Would you like me to proceed with the presentation? Thank you very much. Yes, Lewis. Sure. I'll just share my screen. So if I could just check the members can see that in front of them. Great, check. thank you. Yes. So the site is um, within the development framework of on Stanton Village. It's known as the retreat. It lies outside of the conservation area and sits to the rear of the retreat, an existing bungalow of late 1960s construction. Extent plan permission exists for demolition of this bungalow and replacement of two dwellings. To the west of the application site are two recently constructed dwellings. The application site is currently a residential garden associated with the retreat and benefits from planning consent for the erection of three bedroom bungalow with parking. So that's just an aerial site view. So the site in question today is this element. So the rear of the site there's the existing bungalow and this has planned permission to be demolished an erection of two dwellings here and the bungalow back here. The application site is accessed off the high street via Fuse Lane. So we've got high street just here. Just apologies, I'll put the laser pointer on so it's clearer. So this is the high street. The site is accessed off the high street down Fuse Lane. Immediately to the north of the garden lies an existing watercourse ditch which outfalls into Lonstanton Brook. So the ditch is along here. 
The site lies within flood zone one and therefore has a low probability of flooding from rivers and sea. The Environmental Agency Service Flood Water Map shows that this site is an area of low to very low service water flood risk. Lonstanton Brook is shown to be nearby at a medium to high risk of service water flooding. So plan permission was previously allowed on appeal for the erection of a free bedroom dwelling with parking um, September 2018. This current application seeks to discharge condition four of that permission, which requires submission of full details of the foul water drainage strategy for written approval by the local planning authority. The application also seeks discharge condition five, which requires submission of full details of the proposed service water drainage, both from the building itself and from the proposed driveway area for written approval by the local planning authority. Both conditions were imposed um, on the consent by the planning inspector in order to prevent flooding. So I'll just quickly run through the plans for the approved bungalow. So as you can see in front of you, these are the elevations. This is the approved floor plan. And this is the approved site plan. So the application was submitted to and validated by the council on 16th of September 2019. Delegated decision was issued on the 28th of October 2019, confirming discharge on both conditions four and five. Subject to the installation of the foul water and service water drainage systems in accordance with the approved details. This decision was subject to judicial review from an interested third party who wished to submit comments on the proposed foul and service water drainage scheme prior to the local planning authority's determination of the application. A consent order was issued on the 12th of May 2020, quashing the council's delegated decision to discharge both conditions dated 28th of October 2019. The application is subsequently being passed back to the local planning authority for reconsideration and to allow for third party comments to be submitted. These third party comments have since been received and are summarised within the report. Officers can confirm this application has been subject to the reconsultation as required, including further reconsultation following receipt of additional submissions from the applicant. Um, this application has been referred to committee on the basis of a parish council objection, third party objections and the public interest in the application. Members will recall considering this application discharged both conditions at the 14th of October 2020 planning committee meeting. The committee resolved to defer the application to allow a further 14 day public consultation to take place. This was to ensure that third parties were given an additional opportunity to comment on the Stantec drainage review, which is attached to this report as Appendix A. This review was commissioned by the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service to provide further specialist drainage advice in relation to the application. It recommends that both conditions four and five can be discharged. The Stantec drainage review has been available on public access since 24th August 2020, but further to the committee resolution, the additional consultation was carried out on the 10th of December um, to seek third party comments on the review document. I can confirm this consultation period expired on 24th of December 2020. No further representations were received. So as discussed, the proposal seeks to discharge foul drainage in um, the foul drainage condition. And the details of this is the foul drainage into an existing foul sewage uh, sewer in Fuse Lane. The service water drainage proposal is to discharge service water into attenuation tank located within the rear garden of the dwelling. A hydro, blade, hydro brake flow control chamber is shown at the outfall to the proposed storage attenuation tank, which discharges to the existing watercourse ditch to the north. The driveway serving the dwelling is proposed as a gravel driveway operating, operating as an infiltration feature. The Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service has appointed expert advice on drainage matters to allow the local planning authority to fully consider submission details provided by the applicant. 
to consider any third party comments and to assess the proposed scheme for the found service water drainage at the site, having full regard to adopted national and local planning policy, as well as publish and acknowledge approaches and best practice. Um, as already mentioned, a full copy of the report prepared by the appointed consultant Stantec is provided at Appendix A, which includes details of the qualifications of the consultant and providing advice to the local planning authority. Launstanton Parish Council objects to discharge condition five. Third party representations have been received objecting to discharge of both condition four and five. Numerous concerns have been raised as summarised in respect of technical details relating to proposed foul water and service water drainage. Accordance of the proposals with the service water drainage hierarchy, accordance of the proposals with adopted local plan policies CC slash 7, CC slash 8, CC slash 9, as well as national policy and guidance, lack of information, that the proposals will increase water runoff into Lonstanton Brook, increasing flood risk, and that the proposed service water will be greater than the existing runoff rate for this site as undeveloped, and that the proposed outfall into the existing water course is outside of the red line application. Both officers and the appointed drainage consultant are satisfied that the proposed submission details are in accordance with the adopted national and local policy, which is outlined in detail in the officer reports. It is considered that it's been satisfactorily demonstrated that the scheme provides a viable and fully justified foul and service water drainage strategy that will not increase flood risk elsewhere. In officer's judgment, the extension, if any, of the development beyond the red line boundary would be de minimis and in any event into an area within the same ownership as the site. Even if the development could be said to extend beyond the red line boundary, it would not be appropriate or proportionate, nor in the public interest to require plan application to extend the red line in those circumstances. I'll just run through the rest of the slides for some reason it wouldn't change, so just bear with me. So as you can see in front of you, it's proposed drainage layouts. Apologies, it's slightly blurry, I've had to zoom in. So you can see the attenuation tank just located here at the rear of the site. This is the ditch and outfall section. So again, you can see the attenuation tank here, and this is a section showing the discharge into the brook. And this is just in relation to the red line application boundary, which I've just gone over. So in conclusion, officers recommend that the planning committee approve this application to discharge conditions four and five attached to plan permission S slash 2937 slash one six slash fl as outlined in the officer report thank you chair thank you very much for that lewis um and i see councillor bradnam you have a question for clarification thank you chairman yes i do thank you very much to mr tomlinson for that helpful and clear um explanation of the situation just wanted one clarification and it is to do with condition five the surface water drainage um, and I quite under I accept that the development adjoining the water course actually has riparian responsibility for the water course so it's perfectly reasonable that they should discharge into it I just wanted some comfort around um, you'll see that in condition five on page 113 where we have the recommendation, the condition five includes um, the document titled below Ground Drainage Operation and Maintenance Strategy Report prepared by Andrew Firebrace Partnership Limited and the detail of which is on page 226 and it talks about the maintenance strategy report and it talks about inspection, these underground storage tanks needing to be um, jetted and cleaned every three months and general maintenance and cleaning of below ground systems should be done after each major storm event and on an annual basis. So can we be clear that that will be part of the condition that the owners will have that responsibility to clean out those storage tanks? Thank you, Councillor Bradnam. Lewis. Thank you for your question. Um, so 
that is an approved document. Um, so it's what officers are putting forward. So if a members uh, decide to approve the application today, that will be listed as one of the approved documents which we'll have to adhere to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Brandon. Do we have any other questions for clarification? Yes, we do. Uh, we have Councillor Eileen Wilson. Councillor Eileen Wilson, please. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, my, my question is about the surface water drainage and um, the water being drained into Long Stanton Brook. Now, um, I, I'd be interested to know where the, um, the drained water from Long Stanton Brook carries on beyond the boundary of, of this area and whether the local drainage board has been consulted on this particular application. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Lewis? Thank you. Um, I don't have that information in front of me, but if you could bear with me, I can find that out during the course of this um, debate. OK, and we have a further question for clarification from Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you, Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you, Chairman. Just uh, points of clarification on the two conditions we're being asked to include. Um, just a quick question on the wording. It says conditions four and five will only be fully discharged once the fell water drainage system has been installed and made operational in accordance with the approved detail. Um, can I just clarify who would be responsible for uh, checking that? Would it be the applicant building control? I just want a clarification on where the responsibility lies for them. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um, the recommendation is to discharge conditions in full. In order to achieve full compliance with the conditions, they must follow the, um, the condition wording and the approved details. Um, it's not something that we would carry out a site visit to. We can only be reactive in this case. Um, so it's up to the applicant to ensure that they carry out the details in full. Thank you. And you're still um, looking for the, the response to Councillor Eileen Wilson's um, question, I understand. Councillor Bradham, do we have any others? One yes, other? we have another question from Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can, can I just go back to Councillor Bradham's um, point about, about the maintenance um, and just get a, a bit of clarification if we know what the flood risk is if the maintenance isn't carried out or, or what the risks are around that because it, it is quite a complicated solution um so i'd welcome a bit of clarification on um on, on the risks around what would happen if, if if the maintenance for whatever reason um didn't happen as specified if members would just bear with me i think it'd be helpful for simon darch who represents stantec to answer these questions um i just need to make to get him to dial into the call. So if you just allow me a few minutes just to sort that out. That's that's fine. So Lewis, I understand. So that would be the sustainable drainage consultant for Stantec. Correct. I think that's that's important it, to have. It's the author of the independent review that was carried out. So if you'd just like to bear with me, I'll just get him on the call. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Chair, for your patience. I believe Simon Darch has um, joined us now and will be able to answer those questions. 
Yeah. Hi, can you hear me all? So I, I think the first question was, um, where does the water go? Now, the, the tributary that sort of sits behind Fuse Lane actually discharges into the Longstanton Brook, which is an award drain uh, under the jurisdiction of South Camden District Council. Uh, from there, it joins the Swayze drain system, which drains down uh, through past Swayze village uh, into the Swayze drain where it meets Webb's Hole uh, and Webb's Hole is effectively a, a, a tide lock sluice, if you like. It's not actually tidal, but it, it gets locked in high flows from the River Great Ooze. Uh, so in times of high flood in the Great Ooze, that gate will shut uh, and Swayze drain acts as a sort of conduit for uh, storage. Uh, so effectively, it's all part of the Longstanton Brook and Swayze drain system. Thank you very much. Um, Simon Darch, Sustainable Drainage Consultant from Stantec. Councillor Eileen William Wilson, does that answer your question? Um, I, I, I just have a further question, if I may, Chair. Yes. Um, uh, over Christmas, we saw some heavy um, surface water flooding in the area of Cottenham and, and around and about. And I just wonder how the um, surface water draining off this particular development would have been affected by that heavy rainfall and the the heavy surface water um, almost fl well flooding, actual flooding would have fed in um, under those conditions, that very heavy rainfall that we experienced on Christmas Eve and over Christmas. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not I'm not aware of any problems at the site uh, and the site uh, does sit on slightly higher land in the village. Um, but yeah, the rainfall that you saw, particularly, I think it was on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, there was about 40 mil of rain recorded locally in the area. So it was uh, a fairly intense storm, um, but that wouldn't have naturally impacted that site. Um, you know, the, the site isn't at flood risk. It, it sits out the flood envelope. Um, but yes, the, the system itself uh, probably would, would have seen some localised flooding. Thank you very much. And so the answer to the other question. So there was Councillor Henry Batchelor's question about um, uh, who will check whether things have been... So that, uh, that was answered by, by the officer, I think, okay. on that one. So I think it was Councillor Richard Williams, Dr Richard Williams, which was, you know, what's the risk um, if the maintenance strategy, which has um, you know been detailed and shows that there's quite intensive cleaning um, takes place regularly and periodically, and so that the sort of the concern is one that would be part of the condition that's been clarified and confirmed in this meeting, but two, just to understand the risk if that didn't happen. Yeah, in in, in terms of the local system in, within the property itself, yeah. Uh, th those risks always occur with a domestic property um, uh, and on the, the scale of a domestic property, actually the, the, the risk, uh, the greatest risk is probably to the property itself. Uh, so if the property owner wasn't maintaining that system, the, the biggest risk is that that system would back up and probably flood their garden. Uh, now that's got the potential to, to have sort of knock on effects downstream, but in the quantities that we're talking, it's actually negligible. Um, so the biggest risk is probably to the property itself. Uh, so it's in the property owner's best interest to um, maintain that system. Um, the soils are permeable. Um, so actually the impact again is slightly mitigated by the fact that water will infiltrate into the ground. Um, uh, what, what we've advised is that actually they push those soakaways away from the building just to protect the building. But actually if that water were to encroach and sit in the garden, it would eventually soak in. Um, but it, it's of such a small scale that it wouldn't be a major impact on the system downstream. It, it's more of a localised issue and probably to the property itself. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Eileen Wilson, you have got a further question. Um, and is this for Simon Dutch or is this for the case officer? Um, I, I'm not sure which of them will be able to answer it, but um, it, was, it was part of my earlier question whether the local um, internal drainage board were consulted on this on the application about the impact potential impact on the Swavesy drain 
Thank you. And I see that Lewis has requested to speak. So yes, Lewis, do you want to come in first? Thank you. I'd just like to uh, pick up the point about if maintenance isn't um, kept up. So with most conditions, there is um, an onus on the applicant to ensure either they carry out the details um, as approved do maintenance going forward. Um, if that's not carried out in accordance with the details, it becomes an enforcement issue at a later date. Um, I'll just double check this consultation question. So if you just bear with me, thank you. Thank you. So what you're checking is the question around whether or not the IDB, the um, Thermal Drainage Board was part of the consultation. Correct. And Councillor Bradnam, do we have any further clarification questions? No, we don't, Chairman. Thank you. Sorry, just bear with me. The system is always slow <laughs> when you need to do something, so just bear with me. Don't worry. So I've just checked the application and they weren't consulted, but it's my understanding they wouldn't be consulted on this scale of development, given it's only for one dwelling at the rear of the site. Um, the consultee includes Angler Water, um, Lonstanton Parish Council and the surrounding neighbouring properties. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you very much. Do you, do you want to come back on that, Councillor Wilson? Or that was a very clear answer. Um, I, I just have concerns around the fact that the IDBs aren't always consulted and and I, I know this is a particular problem in areas where there is surface water drainage problems. Yeah, so maybe we take that into the debate. Yeah, but we have the clarity, you know, we've, we've had your um, question clarified. So thank, thank you, you very much. So we'll move now to we have, a, we have a request to speak from Councillor Williams. I'm not sure if that's in the debate or for clarification. Thank you very much. Yes, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. It's clarification through yourself to the officer, because what we've just heard um, is about the um, internal drainage board hasn't been consulted with, um, which obviously is going to be of concern to some of us. What size of development would we normally consult on them with? Sort of what is the what is the threshold? If if I could have that information, please, because then it then yeah. that will. Um, give me a sense of proportion. Thank you. I think that's a good. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Lewis, if you'd like to come back on that particular question in terms of thresholds, um, given that you, you mentioned that this was a, a, a domestic site and therefore not necessarily requiring that level of consultation with the IDB. And I also see that Simon Darch um, is offering to come back on that question as well. So Lewis first. My understanding is that it's for major applications, um, but I will just check with my colleagues and just make sure that is the correct answer. Um, in the meanwhile, if Simon would like to come back, thank you. Thank you. Simon. Yeah, I, I was just going to add that um, uh, Stantec to uh, offer advisory services to the uh, training of the IDB, um, so the IDB that is. Um, and we are advising them on various applications within that catchment. Um, so just to let you know that, um, you know, if it's a, are the IDB's interest being looked after? Well, yes, we're not working for them, but um, we would have certainly taken that into account in terms of our assessment. OK, thank you. Can I, I just um, looks like we've got very good news and we have Councillor Deborah Roberts who's been able to join us. Thank you. I'm so sorry that you've had those problems. 
glad that power is back on. I, I'm assuming Councillor Roberts. So you will you'll have missed the um, first presentation of those, which means that you know you, as I'm saying, you can take part in the debate but can't vote. Thank you very much, Chairman. Yes, it, it was the washing machine now that's blown everything. Last week, last week it was the oven. I'm sure that these machines know when an electrician comes in my house. OK, Thank Chairman, I quite understand and I won't take part in this um, this particular one. Thank you. Yeah, we're just we've heard from the officer. We've had, we're just finishing the clarification questions and then we'll move to public speakers. But thank you for, for letting us know that. Yeah. For you, Chair, so I've just checked and um, yes, it would be majors and it's also at the discretion of the council. Um, given the minimal impacts of the um, scheme, it wasn't considered necessary in this case. Thank you. Um, Councillor Heather Williams, in terms of the, as I understand, therefore, um, usually major, but that is at the discretion of the council and therefore on the basis of that, they've made that decision. Do you want to come back on that, Councillor Heather Williams? With any further clarification? Uh, Chairman, no, um, maybe some advice that there should be a threshold. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's an important point that's been raised in general and specific to this application. I think it's clarified that that was um, the decision taken by the council on the way to proceed with this one. Thank you very much, um, public speakers. We almost had a full start there. So we will move to the public speaking section now. And we do have an objector and that's Daniel Fulton. Um, Mr Fulton, you know very well, I think, how this the section um, works and you have three minutes now to um, speak to the committee and we know that you have provided significant representation on, on this issue. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, just in response to Councillor Wilson's concerns, the Internal Drainage Board, of course, was not consulted and the Internal Drainage Board's ongoing concern about the capacity of Swave Sea Drain have not been addressed in the Stantec report. Um, as you know, there's significant risk of flooding not only in Longstand but downstream in Swavesi, and this is being exacerbated by the increased uh, outflows from the Udden Drove sewage treatment plant, which uh, is responsible for all of the North Stowe uh, discharge. Um, so there are serious flooding issues downstream that have not been addressed. Um, to start my prepared remarks, I'll just uh, start with a brief quote from the Local Government Association report that just came out. Quote, officers' reports are not properly quality assured by managers before the committee reports are issued. And this has led to a large number of mistakes, member frustrations, and in some cases, deferments. Unfortunately, this is yet another case where an officer's report has apparently not been subject to quality assurance or even subject to review by a manager. Had a manager reviewed the report, that manager would have realized that the officer's report misdirects the committee as to the interpretation of planning policy CC8 of the local plan 2018. Policy CC8 states that, quote, development proposals will be required to demonstrate that service water drainage schemes comply with the Sustainable Drainage System's non-statutory technical standards. However, the officer's report states that CC8 only applies to developments of 10 dwellings or more. Yet there is nothing in the development plan to even hint at this interpretation. The officer's interpretation ignores the actual words of the policy, and it instead substitutes conjectural statements that were made in the House of Commons before the technical standards were even adopted or had even been consulted upon. Um, this is really a ridiculous level of, of misdirection and it's only one of the numerous errors of misinterpretation of policy that are littered throughout the report. Furthermore, the consortium has also submitted this is that, that this application proposes development outside the four corners of the planning permission granted by the inspector on appeal. In response to this point, the officer's, report, the officer's report acknowledges in paragraph 72 that operational development would be required outside the boundaries of the application site, but argues this would be de minimis. However, this view fails to consider the actual scope of the planning permission granted. Had the officer read the planning permission in question, it would have been apparent that the application form has been incorporated into the planning permission by including language to that effect in the operational part of the decision granting permission. Had the officer read the application form, he would have seen that it ex expressly states that there is no water course within 20 meters of the site, 
how anyone can consider 20 meters to be de minimis is beyond me. This is clearly a material consideration that has not been taken into account by the officer's report. Should the committee be minded to approve this application today, it will need to address all of the material errors in the officer's report uh, when it uh, creates a statement of reasons. The Fuselink Consortium demonstrated conclusively in July that there was no way the council could reasonably approve this application. Yet rather than refusing the applications, as the material considerations indicated. Yes, please. I'm almost finished. I have one more paragraph. Stephen Kelly decided to spend 4,000 pounds in public funds to obtain expert evidence supporting the development. That expert evidence, which misinterpreted the key material policy of the development plan, has now been discredited. When material considerations so indicate I think we have to, we have to end then. recommendations yeah. should be for refusal. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions for clarification yeah. for Mr. Fulton? Um, Councillor Heather Williams has a question, please. Yeah. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you. Through yourself, Chairman, um, to Mr. Fulton, that I appreciate that in the three minutes you're you're trying to cram quite a bit in, um, but I'm just wondering if you could reread slightly slower this section of where you read from the local plan because I'm, I'm trying to find the policy but not quick enough I'm afraid um so if that's for yourself chairman if that's um acceptable so the, you, your question is um as a clarification question therefore to Mr Fulton would be what is the details of that um section being referred to could could you just recite yes. and reread uh, uh, that section. Yes, I think it is the first or second bullet point of policy CC8 and the policy states, quote, development proposals will be required to demonstrate that surface water drainage schemes comply with the sustainable drainage systems, non statutory technical standards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay. Um, do we have any other clarification questions for Mr. Fulton? I, I have one, Chairman. Yeah. Thank you. Through through you, Chair, to Mr. Fulton. Um, I just wanted to check that Mr. Fulton would accept that any landowner has responsibility for maintenance of a watercourse running adjoining their property up to the midpoint of that watercourse. And does he accept that for that reason, the outflow to the watercourse is acceptable? Um, to, to answer Councillor Bradnam, um, the operational development is any um, construction operations that occur in, on, on or under land. Digging a three foot deep trench into a watercourse where there is an established population of water voles is development. Um, it's outside the scope of the permission. And furthermore, uh, it's an adopted water course. So uh, South Cambridgeshire District Council, I believe is responsible for the maintenance, uh, not the riparian owner in this particular instance, if that's helpful. Thank you, that's helpful. Thank you, anybody else would like to ask a clarification question of Mr. Fulton? No, um, thank you very yeah, much. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Fulton. Um, as I understand, we don't have um, anybody speaking for the applicant who's requested to speak in this public speaking slot. So we'll move on to Longstanton Parish Council um, and Libby White. Are you with us? I am. Can you hear me? A little, a little, yeah, a little softly. Oh dear. Okay. Yeah. I have this issue. Hopefully you can hear me and I'll yes. be very, very brief. Can I just um, ask you, Louise, and, and we can really hear you well. So that's perfect. Lovely. Thank you very much. I can see you everything. Do you have, um, yes, authorisation to speak yeah. on behalf of the Parish Council? Yes, I do. Yep, we met yeah. on Monday. And you do have three minutes, so just take your time. I know you're only a little bit safe, but just take your time. <laughs> it won't take long, don't worry. Um, I attended your committee meeting in October to express the ongoing concerns that the Parish Council have with the applications for Fuse Lane. And um, you will be aware that Longstanton Parish Council have recommended refusal for all applications, initially in respect to highway safety and overdevelopment of the site. I believe my first representation to you was in 2019. 
having attended the planning authorities meeting in October, the dis application for the discharge of conditions was discussed and it was agreed for um, by the committee to allow extra time for the parish council to review the technical report from Stantec. I can confirm that there was no co communication after this meeting um, about that. And had I not been at the meeting, we would have been unaware that the documentation um, was available and that the time had been extended for review. Having looked at the document on the system, councillors believed it was too technical for them to understand with their limited knowledge of drainage. And we requested by email in November that a summary of the document be provided to help members understand what the document was suggesting. This has not been received. So again, Longstanton Parish Council do not feel they are in a position to provide a comment on this application. That's it. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you and important. Does anybody else would like to ask clarification questions? Councillor Henry Batchelor. Uh, yeah, one second, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just, I think it's probably more a question for a legal officer, just what their response to that comment by the Parish Council was that they haven't been given suitable, um, legible documentation to read and comment on. Thank you. Um, and so I put that to, would that be Chris Carter or to Stephen Reid that would help us with, with that? Sorry, Chair, just took me a moment to unmute there. Um, the purpose of the, the Stantec report is clearly um, a technical one uh, to advise the Council. I'm, I'm sorry um, if the re request from the Parish Council wasn't um, actioned. Um, I'm afraid I wasn't aware of that and, and don't know why that would, would be at this stage. But given the purpose of the report uh, is to inform the decision making of the District Council uh, and there's clearly um, uh, significant uh, information there provided by Stantec uh, and included in the officer report, then um, I, I don't think that's a reason why we shouldn't continue to consider the matter now, notwithstanding my apology to the Parish Council for their request not being actioned. We have a further um, request to speak from Councillor, Councillor Heather Williams. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chairman. If I could just clarify my understanding is correct about what's been said. Um, I think Councillor Batchelor has, has covered the, the, the technical nature of that report, um, but that the Parish Council is, is my understanding correct that the Parish Council was not informed of the extension of time, um, but found that out through another means and so therefore has been able to respond. I'm not saying that that's, that's right, but is, is that my understanding or is it a case of you haven't been able to respond sufficiently because you weren't made aware of it. Thank you. I, that, I think what we heard was it was a mixture of kind of the two reasons. But Libby, would Libby White, would you like to respond? Yes. Um, so we knew about the document because I attended your meeting in October. Otherwise, we wouldn't have known about the extension. We did look at the document, but councillors felt they were unable to comment because of the technical aspect. They asked for a summary, but that was never forthcoming, so they haven't felt they can comment. Hopefully that clears it. Yes, no, I, and I think that does. Thank you, Thank you. And I think, you know, later in the agenda, we will be looking at the Planning Advisory Service report and the improvements that we can make to the way in which the planning committee works. So hopefully we will also pick this up for future occasions um, going forward so that the, the issues about sort of advice and communications are, are made very, very clear. Thank you, Stephen Reid, Senior Planning Law. Your cameras come on. Is that because you're wanting to speak? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, the um, point I was going to make is that um, the Stantec report is a technical report because by the nature of the matters contained within the report they're dealing with very technical matters and uh, Mr Carter has apologised that in fact the uh, uh, parish weren't responded to but I, I think the apology should be that um, the parish council should have been advised that there's 
a danger in trying to um, turn a technical report into something which then loses the technical nature. By the nature of the report, it is technical. And I think um, there's a, the, there is a danger trying to um, convert a technical report into something which may be more readily um, got to grips with by a lay person. But uh, so I think the apology is that we should have responded to the request to say um, it felt that uh, it's not a suitable request that the um, district can actually help with. Thank you um, for that clarification. So I think there's one sort of is picking up is how the communications around decisions of the planning committee of an extension of a consultation period is there something we need to explore. Second, there was an apology from Chris Carter for not responding to um, that request um, to explain whatever its its response was. Um, I see that there are no further clarification questions. Thank you very much to Libby White Clark of Longstanton Parish Council for that. And I see that we don't have um, having a request to speak of a local member and therefore committee will move to the debate um, on this application and the debate being around um, the, the merits and the balance um, of the recommendation that, that this be approved for the discharge of conditions four and five. Do I have anybody who would like to speak? Chairman, I would like Bradman, to... Yeah, Councillor Anna Bradman. Thank you. Um, my feeling is that we've, um, whilst this has not come straightforwardly, actually we've done, the District Council has um, addressed the issues that were concerned and has obtained an independent um, report on the matters of drainage. And that report has assured us that they feel that the concerns that have been expressed um, are, are fair, but in this case, they feel they have those concerns have been overcome um, in the methodology that's been proposed. Um, and so my feeling is that um, my feeling is that we should accept that independent advice. Uh, and I, I personally feel um, we would not have good grounds for refusal on those grounds uh, because the advice we have from the independent engineer is that those concerns have been addressed. Thank you, Councillor Bradenham. And while you're then sort of looking at the list of speakers, I see that we have Councillor Nick Wright first of all, and then you can continue to help me with the rest of the speakers. Councillor Nick Wright. Thank you, Chairman. And through you, um, Picking up some of the points, um, uh, Councillor Bradman is right. We have that expert uh, opinion um, and so much else of what has been said, principally by people objecting to the site, are interpretation of various policies, etc. Um, we have to trust our officers that they are doing their job and they have recommended approval on this. Uh, having taken technical advice. Um, the procedures need to be followed correctly to move to a decision on this and we need to be absolutely certain from our officers that that has been done correctly. Um, I do know a little bit about awarded, course, awarded water courses having several across my farm and to be absolutely clear on that is you know, the riparian owners own the watercourse. The council has a duty of maintenance on it to a certain size. So ownership is not in the council's ownership. It is in the riparian owner's ownership, just to clear up that point. Um, on the IDB, as a former member of the Swavesy IDB, we were consulted on every application that came forward in the Swavesea IDB area and consulted also on uh, uh, applications that move through Swavesea but not necessarily individual households, certainly the major ones in the past and I presume that is operating on the same 
the same uh, basis as it always has done. Um, so much of this application depends on the technical advice. And you know, when you're requesting a, um, a, a detailed report on that, for goodness sake, let's have an executive summary to it that people like parish councils can understand in the interests of transparency and everything else. There's no reason why this should be you know, hidden from parish councils or objectors or anything else like that in future. So, you know, it's difficult, you know, with that technical advice, you know, and officer's advice, you know, that uh, to find reasons for refusing this if the processes have been followed correctly. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Councillor Anna Bradnam, do we have other speakers? Uh, yes, Chairman, we have Councillor Heather Williams. Good, and, and while we're doing that, given um, Councillor Nick Wright's sort of concern and question, if Chris Carter and the case officer could be ready for to, to come back and you know, reassure us in terms of procedure as, as um, for our decision making in that. But apologies, Councillor Heather Williams, thank you, go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have to say I, I sympathise with Long Stanton Parish Council because I am struggling with this one. I'm not going to pretend, you know, I'm an accountant. I'm not a drainage specialist, and and that's actually the point of us as a as a planning committee is is that we're not professional planners. Um, we're we're democratically elected. Um, and saying that 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 does require that does require the the reports or summaries to be accessible to us as well um, and I have struggled with this this um, document and reread it I think five times now um, and I'm very, very conflicted because I can see that how the policy TCA I've subsequently been able to look at our local plan how that could be interpreted as um, as the objectors have, um, and I can see we've got technical expert advice telling us from both officers and Stantec that this is okay, and um, and it it leads to an I have to be honest an internal conflict that I'm wrestling with, um, and right now can't say can't say how I'm minded because it's um, very difficult. Thank you, um, Councillor Heather Williams. Councillor Bradnam. Uh, Councillor Martin Khan, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Martin Khan. I've tried to look at this from a very simple, straightforward point of view because we've been blinded by, by, by uh, technical detail. Uh, the policy, the aim is to try and not exceed the uh, normal discharge, uh, natural floor off from that site. Uh, we're told that the uh, system would do it. But what if the worst situation, the whole system was clogged up and the whole of the uh, water went into the stream? I was looking at it's perhaps 100 square meters of of um, hard standing uh, that, and there's a massive storm. You might get five cubic meters. It, it's n it's not of itself going to flood adjoining areas or be no detectable. Um, it's the whole point of these uh, this restriction is basically to prevent a cumulative um, impact upon the stream. And of itself, I don't see the fact that it might not be maintained to be sufficient reason for refusal. So I can, we're told that it would work. Um, we have to take uh, respect ex uh, expert advice that we've been given. I cannot see any particular reason for refusal for this proposal. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, the next person wishing to speak is Councillor Henry Batchelor. Catherine Bachelor. Thank you, Chairman. Um, again, I'm probably going to echo what other people have said, but uh, I mean, I think if the planning officer is satisfied and we have contracted a company to give us some expert legal advice, which I think was pointed out was didn't come cheaply. Um, I don't think that we as a committee are in a position to second guess that expert advice. So unless I hear anything between now and the vote, I will be voting in favour, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Peter Fain next, Chairman. Councillor Peter Fane. Thank you, Chairman. The question before us is actually quite straightforward. 
Uh, this planning consent was granted on appeal over two years ago now. The question is whether conditions four and five are now met. That's a technical issue on which we've had not only technical advice, but also a very helpful explanation from the drainage consultant who wrote that. Um, some have wondered why there was no summary. Well, I read this report not as a surveyor and former drainage consultant, but just as an ordinary member of, of the committee, as is my job, and I was confused by one or two places. That's not surprising. This is a technical report, but the conclusions mm. are very clear mm. on page 144. It has been satisfactorily demonstrated that the scheme can provide a viable drainage strategy that will not increase flood risk elsewhere. It concludes that the application would accord with policy CC7, with CC8 and with CC9. We therefore recommend the discharge to conditions four and five for the site. I can find no technical or other reason for rejecting that advice or indeed the advice of officers who I am satisfied read the application and all the other details and therefore I come to the conclusion that it is time now for us to approve this application. Thank you and, and Councillor Braddon and do what I'd like I'm hearing um, that we have some people who are still listening very carefully um, but we also have heard quite a few now who feel that on, on this basis you know there has been the the technical expertise sought which was the reason for the deferral and it's come back to us and they are looking to be minded to follow that guidance and advice i see that we do have two other speakers if you have anything additional to add um, but if it's just a confirmation of that then um, please you know let's respect this and we could move to a vote but however if you do have additional comments to make on this or that would help us come to a balance in terms of our reasoning around um, this application, then please go ahead. So the next speaker is Councillor Eileen Wilson, Chairman. Oh, I, I have nothing different to, to add. Thank you very much. And Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins, Chairman. Uh, I'll be quite quick, Chair, thank you very much. Uh, just to um, uh, give a um, perhaps a numeric um, uh, point in paragraph 4.3.31 on page 142. Uh, effectively, what we're saying is the discharge uh, from, uh, you know, into the water course will only take a capacity of, and that's in the worst case scenario, right, less than what, 0.05% of the capacity of that ditch which is why it said it's negligible, which means there is no reason why we cannot approve this. So I will be voting for approval of the discharge of this condition, which is something that, you know, the technical report has uh, recommended that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Tina. And I understand that we've also has been debated, which is the accumulative impact, not just the impact of this particular one, but that the review looked at accumulative impact. Uh, Lewis, I see you are requesting to speak as the case officer. Thank you, Chair. So for you, um, apologies that the Parish Council request wasn't uh, responded to, but I can confirm the consultation was sent out, um, acknowledging that it wasn't sent out until December. So there was a delay between the October planning committee date and the consultation being sent. Um, the Stantec report is a technical document. It has been summarised by officers in the committee report um, to ensure that members are informed. And I'd just like to um, reiterate that the application has been assessed against policy CC slash eight as per the officer report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And just to come back on your point there, Lewis. So when you say that, you know, it wasn't communicated immediately after the committee meeting, um, in your earlier comments, you said that on the 10th of December was when the further consultation started. So what you're just confirming is at that point, that was when the parish council was um, did receive a communication or it was sent. Correct. It was a delay and yeah, it was due to my workload that I didn't get around to sending out the consultation. So there was a delay between the actual committee date in October and the consultation being sent out in December. Right, but, but at the time of the consultation. So. Correct. 
Thank you. And I think it's really important to to hear here the, the apologies that have been sent to the parish council in the way that's done. Um, and I think also, unless Chris, you want to come back in terms of procedure, the, the issue that Councillor Nick Wright brought up in terms of our procedure around decision making in this, we can move to a vote. Chris, would did you want to say anything on that to reassure members further? Thank you, Chair. I don't think there's anything uh, additional for me to uh, to add, um, but I think um, Lewis has covered the issue about the, the timeliness of the reconsultation, but obviously the reconsultation did happen. So thank you. Thank you. And if any members are um, minded to reject um, this decision to um, go forward with the to approve the discharge of conditions four and five, would you like to let us know what would be the grounds for that, please, in terms of the material considerations for that? I have heard uh, things which are about process and procedure. Yeah, um, and, uh, but I haven't sorry. heard anything which is sort of technically or that um, provides a, a material consideration for why we wouldn't be accepting that technical advice. Is that right, Chris? Yes, sorry, through you, Chair. Um, no, I think uh, given uh, what the conditions require, we would need to have uh, a technical reason related to the requirements of those conditions in order to substantiate a refusal. And I haven't heard anything to that effect. Mm -hmm. Does any, would anyone speak to that if they were minded to um, refuse? Councillor Bradnam, do we have anybody? Um, uh, no, I can't see anybody. And I just wanted to, to assist you. The recommendation is that at paragraph 75 on page 113. I've also got it on page 96 at four. Is that, I don't think there's a difference, is that? No, no it's the same. So yes, so what we are voting on members is the officer recommendation that planning committee approve um, this application to discharge conditions four and five attached to planning permission S 2937 stroke 16 stroke FL um, and we have the details of that in terms of the conditions that on page 113. Um, can we approve this? Stephen Reid, sorry senior planning lawyer, legal advice. Before Thank I go you, to the vote, Stephen. Um, can, can I just highlight paragraph 438 on page 137? On page 137. Paragraph 438 at the bottom of the page. Oh, yes. This relates to the number of dwellings. This relates to the number of dwellings. Uh, we've heard from um, Mr. Fulton this morning that uh, uh, he says, well, my interpretation of what he says was that what's contained in 438 is not legally correct, but uh, I would invite members just to consider why if that is his contention. He didn't raise the point during the period of consultation when he could have highlighted it rather than to bring it up this morning. Um, thank you, Stephen. I'm going to go ahead with the vote members. Um, can we take this by affirmation? I, I think no, until we'll go through the roll call because I have heard certain points. We're not sure exactly where everybody yeah. is minded to vote. So I will go to a roll call then. So starting um, here, Stephen, if you could take your camera off, please, and lower your hand. Thank you very much. Councillor Deborah Roberts, yes, absolutely. We understand that because you missed the, the debate and the well, the presentation at the beginning, that you won't be voting on this item, but we're very happy to have you back in the meeting. So I'll start with the Thank roll. Chairman. Just before you proceed, Councillor Heather Williams has asked to speak. Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. I, I thought because of the um, comment made by Mr. Reid that we may be needed to discuss that point. Um, and I was only going to speak to say that I think it'd be inappropriate for us to challenge as and when people raise their, their comments 
we give people an opportunity to speak at these meetings, the fact that they've not given us advance warning is not something that I think is appropriate for us to challenge. That that was all, Chairman. Thank you. Noted. Thank you. Um, I will now go to the roll call on the vote, and the vote is around the recommendation that I've just read out, which is to approve the application for the discharge of conditions four and five. Councillor Henry Batchelor. In favour, Chair. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Four, Chairman. Councillor Martin Kahn. Four. Councillor Peter Fane. Four. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Four. Councillor Heather Williams. I'd like to abstain, Chairman. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Four. Councillor Eileen Wilson. Four. Councillor Nick Wright. Four. And myself, Councillor Pippa Halings, at four. In my count, we have nine votes for and one abstention and one member who is unable to vote because they missed the first part of the presentation of this application. Therefore, um, the decision is to vote, is to approve this application for the discharge of conditions four and five. Thank you, everybody. Chairman, did you yes. want to take a pause before the next? Um, Oh. Yes, th I think <laughs> we've had a short break. Um, yes. Councillor Eileen Wilson, are we OK with you unless anybody else would like to do it? We continue with the next um, application and we would be then nearing. Um, we then may be nearing the four hours when we would take a longer break anyway. Mm. I I'm fine. Thank you. Oh, OK. Thank you, everybody. We are now um, looking at agenda item eight, which is on page 243 members. And this is around the application 20 stroke 02453 stroke S73, the retreat fuse lanes Long Stanton. Um, and this is around the variation of condition seven the traffic management plan pursuant to planning position permission S stroke 0277 stroke 19 FL to reflect the proposals in the traffic management plan to substitute the current wording in condition seven with the development hereby permitted should be carried out in accordance with the traffic management plan prepared by SLR consulting version final one and dated December 2019 which is resubmitted. The applicant is Mr. Jerry Cadu of Landbrook Homes Limited. The key material considerations for us are members, highway safety, including the safety of all users of the adopted and unadopted highways in the vicinity of the site. No site visit, it's not a departure, um, and the decision is due by 16th of July 2020. This has been brought to committee um, because it was referred as a result of request by the parish council and because in the opinion of officers the matter should be determined by committee. Presenting officer is once again Lewis Tomlinson and Lewis thank you do you want to um, give us your presentation? Thank you chair I'll just share my screen. Could you just confirm that you can see that in front of you? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chair. So again, it's the um, property known as the retreat um, down Fuse Lane, Long Stanton. This application is in relation to the front of the site, so where the existing bungalow is to be demolished and replaced with two dwellings. Um, under planning permission S slash 0277 slash 19 slash FL. Parking for these two, two new houses will take place from the site frontage onto Fuse Lane and a further single storey dwelling is permitted to be erected in the former garden area as um, subject to the previous application. Um, Fuse Lane is not an adopted highway and comprises of a single vehicle width gravel service track. 
The lane currently serves as an access to a double garage serving 135 High Street to three other dwellings, the Willows and the two recently constructed dwellings, as well as the uh, development plots at the retreat. Um, the lane varies in width and the half service track runs alongside a treed and vegetated area to the north with boundaries to number 135 High Street and the Willows to the south side. Um, a footpath public right of way linking home farm residential development to the south and west of Fuse Lane with High Street emerges on the south side of Fuse Lane at a point to the immediate west of the Willows and before the existing informal turning area beyond. The site lies within the designated village framework and is otherwise unconstrained. So I will just run through, so as you can see again, uh, High Street here, um, Fuse Lane accessing the retreat. So this is an aerial site view. So just to be clear, this application relates to this part of the site, which is for the erection of two dwellings. Um, the double garage for a for 135 High Street is just here, and this is the Willows. These are the recently constructed dwellings. You've got a public right of way which runs along here and down here. Just run through the approved plans. So this is the approved site plan. So on here you can see again Fuse Lane, the two uh, dwellings which is the subject of this permission, the bungalow as discussed previously and two recently constructed dwellings. You've also got the willows here and then the double garage here. These are the approved elevations for the dwellings. This is the approved floor plans and section. And this is the approved street elevation. I'll just run through a number of photos just to make members aware of the site. So this is a view up Fuse Lane from the access of High Street. We've got number 135 High Street on the left here. You can just see their garage just there. This is a view along High Street past frontage of Fuse Lane looking north and you've got Fuse Lane on the left and please note the traffic calming just here. There's a view along High Street past the frontage of Fuse Lane looking south of Fuse Lane on the right. View along High Street past frontage of Fuse Lane looking south of Fuse Lane on the right taken from the entrance to Mitchcroft Road Fuse Lane entrance is just here. You've got the traffic arm in here. Um, this is a photo taken from the Fuse Lane entrance looking towards the north. And this is a photo again taken from the Fuse Lane entrance looking towards the south. Um, and this is a, another photo looking down Fuse Lane to further into Fuse Lane with the garage to 135 High Street just here and the Willows just here on the left. Again, another photo looking down Fuse Lane. As you can see, the retreats and the existing bungalows just on the right here. The recently constructed dwellings just in the foreground. This is the infer, informal turning head opposite the retreat. And this is a photo showing the access onto Fuse Lane from the public right of way to Home Farm. So the proposal in front of you today is an application that solely seeks to consent for the variation of condition seven, which is in relation to a traffic management plan of plan permission S slash 0277 slash 19 slash FL to amend the wording of the condition from a pre-commencement submission to a compliance for the approval of a detailed traffic management plan. So the current wording of condition seven is in front of you. Um, please note one of the key parts of this condition was um, part two, con contractor parking shall be within the curtage of the site and not on the streets. The applica application seeks to amend the word in condition seven to the text in front of you. Development hereby permitted shall be carried out in accordance with the traffic management plan prepared by SLR Consulting version final one and dated December 2019. 
So the reason why this is in front of you today, so the applicant claims that a submitted traffic management plan is informed by lessons learned during the construction in 2018 of the two existing new homes on the site. The traffic management plan um, Traffic management plan includes details of the arrangement for the delivery of materials, turning movements, enclosure of the site and contracts of parking during the construction phase, as well as detailing areas for material storage, keeping the on-site turning area clear and the site office. The site circumstances in this case, notably the size of the development plot itself, however, mean that the space for parking within the site is limited. Accordingly, the traffic management plan refers to provision for contract parking at Digital Park and Station Road on Stanton, noting that Fuse Lane itself is, a, is of ad, inadequate, inadequate width to accommodate parking adjacent to the site. The plan also proposes arrangements for addressing condition 15, control of hours in respect of vehicles arriving early. The provision of off-site contract parking is meant, however, the terms of part two of the original planning condition above cannot be met and is this departure from the original condition that's prompted this application. The third party representations and parish council comments highlight a number of concerns around the access and movements of vehicles into and along Fuse Lane. Insofar as uh, the traffic management plan can address these issues when the application site is of this size, Officers are satisfied with the Highway Authority conclusions that the measures outlined in the traffic management plan are appropriate and reasonable. For larger vehicle movements where the turn area is, is insufficient because of the size of the site itself, officers have noted that the traffic management plan proposed that vehicles would reverse into the site with the assistance of a banksman to maintain safety in long fuse lane during these manoeuvres. The parish council and third parties have expressed concern um, <clears throat> about this approach, but officers consider to be a few practical or safer alternatives to this approach for development of the scale where the number of large vehicles movements would be limited. The traffic management plan commits to keep clear access to the existing homes along Fuse Lane throughout the construction phase and to maintain the right of way clear of obstructions for pedestrians. Vehicle speeds along Views Lane itself are in officer's view likely to be a low, um, likely to be low. A five mile per hour limit is proposed within the traffic management plan and would be subject to normal care and consideration. The risk um, to pedestrians and vehicles drivers uh, using and entering and leaving Views Lane is accordingly considered to be satisfactory addressed by the traffic management plan. At the access point into Fuse Lane, intervisibility intervis between vehicles or pedestrians on the High Street and Fuse Lane, note an existing footway width for Lon High Street and position of hedges and boundaries has been judged to be appropriate. The Highway Authority has assessed the submitted traffic management plan and considers it to be acceptable and supports proposed variation to wording of condition seven. So there are two update points um, that I'd just like to bring to members' attention. So the first one is officers can advise members that as a fresh permission will be issued since S slash 0277 slash 19 slash FL was approved, there's been no material change of policy or other circumstances which might require a reassessment of other conditions or indeed a reassessment of the development as a whole. Whilst paragraph 21 of the officer reports covers a reassessment of conditions, officers should add that they are satisfied that no wider reconsideration of the principle of development is called for or justified. And the second update point is, having had further recent discussions with the Highway Authority, the council maintains a position that as the local plan authority has lawful authority to entertain this application pursuant to Section 327A of the 1990 Act and Article 7 of the DMPO 2015. There is no flaw in the red line as submitted when the, applica uh, um, when the application under reference S slash 0277 slash 19 FL was approved, which appears to be the root of third party concerns. The issues is understood to concern whether visibility displays at the end of Fuse Lane were required to be included in the red line plan of the original application. 
Council's legal advice, including from external counsel, who has reviewed has reviewed all the correspondence, is clear that it did not, and that in any event, any event that the issue is not directly raised by con consideration of this application, and it is too late to challenge the original permission. The Highway Authority remains satisfied that the uh, resquit displays exist, and as they are on highway land, will continue to do so. The issue of lawful authority cannot be resolved conclusively today. There is no case law that supports the third party position on this matter and council's advice is clear. In these circumstances, it is open to the Fuse Lane Consultorium to test the point by issuing judicial review proceedings if the application before you today is approved, if they wish. But it's officer's advice that notwithstanding the extensive correspondence, there is no underlying legal flaw. So to conclude, the officer recommendation is approval subject to the conditions imposed on the planning permission S slash 0277 slash 19 slash FL and the revised word of condition seven as proposed within the section 70 application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Lewis. And from the chair, I'd just like to um, say how much we appreciate having that level of detail and clarity in terms of um, looking at the, the debate that we will be having, you know, and the, the questions that may come in. So helping us to understand that, particularly around the legal um, aspects of this. Councillor Bradenham, do we have any clarification questions for the case officer? Yes, we have one from Councillor Deborah Roberts and uh, one from me and one from Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman, and uh, hopefully my electricity will bear with me for this part two of this exercise. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a huge tome that we've been um, all trying to get our heads around. And um, I shall be asking Few Lanes Consortium something to do with page 260, if it would like to get that in mind. But for the officer, I, I would, and I don't really think it's for Mr. a question for Mr. Tomlinson. I think it's a question for the legal um, department in that the bottom line there said there is um, no case law. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily in my mind say that um, there is not a case. Is, is that presently nobody's brought, brought these sort of matters to the High Court for judgment. I don't know whether that's correct or not, but that's how I read it. And I have to say, um, especially in regards to Fuse Lane, uh, I'm, I'm sure that we've thought ourselves quite clever in the past where legal advice has been um, argued in our side, which has proven to be wrong in the High Courts in London. So I would like some clarity on just what this um, last sentence about there is no case law, whether that actually means that um, there's no way that it won't go to and be proven against us. Thank um, you, so Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Roberts. And I think in the, the presentation, the case officer did say that um, it is as you've said and therefore obviously the applicant and um, the objector you know can take this and test it um in the courts it's not saying that it wouldn't would or wouldn't yeah. win um, yeah and, sort of saying, and I, I i appreciate that um that you've reminded us of again of, of of what we were told there but that even seems to me even clearer that i'm not sure if that last sentence should have actually been put in because I think it's trying to, well, I won't say it's trying to, but it, it, it has the ability to, to mislead um, members into thinking, well, there's no case law, um, it, it, therefore we're, we're quite happy and OK to go ahead with it. I just personally think that that line should never have been put in and should be disregarded. Thank you. In terms of clarification, um, I don't know, Lewis's case officer, whether you want to come back and to just clarify anything there or Stephen you put your camera on you yep um, senior planning uh, lawyer for planning thank thank you chair uh, thank you council roberts the the, the 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 wording was included uh, having been endorsed by uh, queen's council and having 
uh, had that endorsement by Queen's Council, I think it was it was appropriate that it that it should have been included. Uh, you're absolutely right. We're not saying that because there is currently no case law on point that it doesn't mean that there won't be case law uh, in the future. Um, but uh, members might wish to consider the uh, the following, uh, which is um, there are a lot of planning applications up and down the country where local residents are vehemently opposed to the application granting permission. Um, those residents are supported by uh, some very clever lawyers and to date uh, no objection on the red line point has been taken. We're not saying it can't be taken, but don't you think that if you had a development of hundreds of houses and you had a sound basis on which to object that in fact uh, somebody wouldn't have already done so to date. Uh, so we're not saying it can't be done, but what we are saying is that uh, we are ad ad advised uh, that um, um, we do not think the court will support what would in effect bring the planning system up and down the country to an immediate halt because there are so many planning applications where the red line does not extend to cover visible displays within the highway and, and that's the nub of the issue. Yes, but we, we can't ignore that somebody um, is actually saying to us that that is a point um, of law that they could and maybe will be prepared to argue. No. Thank you. Thank you. I think I think that's very, very clear. And thank you, Councillor Roberts, for coming back. Thank you, um, Stephen, for that. And I think it's, you know, we often wonder, you know, what's the implications? What's the likelihood? What's the viability? I think what's been put forward to clear is, um, you know, that we have to take into consideration, but we will be looking at the merits of this um, and we just do know that it could be open to a judicial review if that's what um, the objector considers to do. And I think that all that the, the case offer has just done is given us an outline of the land. But of course, as Councillor Roberts says that, you know, and as the case officer said, it's quite within the, the rights of the objector to take this further if, if we were minded to reject this application, um, which we haven't done so far. We haven't gone to the debate. We're still on the clarification. So are there any other questions for clarification? Yes, there's my own, please, Chairman. Um, and, and, can, and Stephen, yeah. uh, can you yes, take your camera off? Um, so Chairman, through you, um, this is a question for um, the case officer, Mr Tomlinson. I just wanted to clarify. Uh, firstly, I have no um, objection on the matter of uh, visibility displays. I think we've had satisfaction that the what is uh, proposed is reasonable. But my concern lies around the original question, which was, um, if I take us down to the bottom of page 248, at paragraph 17, it talks about the fact that this is the, the change is being requested and I wanted clarification from Mr Tomlinson on this point. Am I right in understanding that the, the change in this condition has been requested because they don't feel they can park the contractor lorries on the site? First question. And so their solution then isn't to say where they might put them. They then go on to say, uh, and it also is the uh, discussed on pages 250 and 251. So they then go on to talk about the fact that instead, under the transport management plan, the lorries will back down Fuse Lane with the aid of a banksman and the fact that they, they feel this is reasonable because people will, by the very nature of the lane, be going extremely slowly, five miles an hour, so it wouldn't put anybody, any pedestrians at risk 
and um, they will ma maintain access. But the question remains, are the lorry, where will the lorries rest? Because if there's one lorry in on down the lane, where will it stop? If it can't go onto the site, where will it stop? So it's 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 the fact that the original request was to remove the um, requirement that the contractor lorries should park on site and replace it with this, oh, instead they're back down the lane. I just wondered if um, Mr Tomlinson could just explain if I haven't understood it correctly, is that what's happening? Just simply a replacement of one with the other. Um, this might be a good opportunity for you, Chair, um, to introduce Dr John Finney from the Local Highway Authority. Um, John, are you with us? Would you be able to answer some of these more technical questions? I am. Can you hear me and see yeah. me? Great, thank, you. thank you, John. If you just want to, um, yes, introduce yourself. You are um, from I'm, County Highways and the Transport Assessment Office, is that right? I'm Dr John Finney, I'm Principal Development Management Engineer for the County Council as Highway Authority. Thank you. Um, through you Chair, the, the, the question isn't, the, the interpretation isn't quite right. The contractor parking refers to parking of vehicles owned by the contractors on site. So the tradesmen, etc, electrician, plumbers, people like that, general ground workers. Mm -hmm. There is sufficient space on the site to accommodate the likely level of tradesman parking. So the developer has suggested quite reasonably, in my opinion, that they will gain parking at Digital Park and then use a minibus to bring those um, operatives into the site. So it's related to the contractor parking. The reversing of the vehicles down Fuse Lane is for specific vehicles which need things like roof trusses, Obviously, as you can appreciate they're quite large. You can't have those broken down and delivered by small vehicles. So for specific times, you are quite right. Large vehicles will reverse down Fuse Lane guided by a signaller rather than a banksman because it's non-gender specific so that they will then obviously be manoeuvring within a reasonably safe fashion. So anybody approaching the vehicle can be guided by the signal or the vehicle can be stopped while the person passes. Is that satisfactory? That's really helpful. Thank you, Mr Finney. No problem. Thank you very much. And I see that Councillor Richard Williams has um, yes, sort of withdrawn his request to speak because it was around the same question. So thank you for that. Uh, do we have any other clarification questions for the case officer? None, none at the moment, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move now to the public speaking section um, of the meeting. And Mr Fulton, welcome back. Hello again. Hello again. Um, um, anyway, and, I yeah. just want to thank the committee for your very thorough consideration of these two applications today. Um, I think I, anyway, it's been a very edifying discussion and I just appreciate all of the work you've all put in tremendously. So thank you. Um, just a couple points. The first point I was going to make. Just to, you're going to start your three minutes now. Is yes. that right? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Fulton. Yeah. Uh, so the first point I was going to raise is that under Article 15 of the Development Management Procedure Order, England, 2015, um, quote, an application for planning permission must be publicized by the local planning authority uh, if it affects a right of way to which Part 3 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 applies. Uh, this includes publishing a notice to that effect in a newspaper. Now, an Article 13 notice was published for this application, but an Article 13 notice is a notice to landowners published by the applicant uh, of development affecting particular land. An Article 15 notice is a notice that identifies the land uh, being developed as land uh, that contains or is related to a public right of way. Um, this notice has never been published in a newspaper or on the council's website, uh, and there is a clear statutory requirement that this takes place. I don't know why this wasn't done, but it hasn't. It hasn't been done, and it was the council's responsibility to do so. Um, why is this important? Um, potentially because I know that a lot of campaign groups who campaign on right-of-way issues specifically look at Article 15 notices, and there hasn't been one in this case, even though it's required by law. Um, 
I'll just very, very briefly go through the key points. Uh, first of all, uh, in regards to case law, our case is based on um, statutory law. Um, the Development Management Procedure England order says that the instructions in the application form are to be followed. That's the law. The instructions in the application form says that land to be visibility space is to be within the application site within the red line. The council has uh, gotten legal advice that's very creative, um, but we disagree with it. And I would also point out that the council's legal advice, their uh, interpretation of the statute is not based on any known principles of statutory interpretation. Um, our interpretation of the statute is based on case law, which the council's is not. I realize these are legal points, but I just wanted to clarify that since Councilor Roberts mentioned it. Um, I think the key point is something that Councilor Richard Williams hit on in the first application today at Bourne, which is when can the local authority attach planning conditions um, pertaining to land that is not within the application site and is not within the control of the applicant. When is land that is within the application site is the ownership of land, regardless of whether or not it's land to which the application relates, material to making planning determinations? I'll just say that one more time. Is the identity of the owner of land material in making planning determinations? Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions, but I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any clarification questions for Mr. Fulton? Um, Chairman, we have um, a question. All I was going to say was, do we need to get some, a response on that first? Well, it may be that one, one of the, the people who are asking the clarification question asked that. So, okay. goes so, first. so Councillor Deborah Roberts. Sorry, yeah. Chairman. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you very much, Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Fulton. Hello. Um, I was sorry I couldn't join in the first, but electricity got in the way or didn't get in the way. Um, I did say uh, that I would be referring to page 26 naught um, on the agenda, uh, which is um, a uh, correspondence that yourselves put into South Cairns um, with lots of bullet points. Um, I, I did enjoy your uh, description of the uh, legal representation that looked for from outside council. I hope that was quite sweet and interesting. Um, and I would say, first of all, um, you saw that piece about um, case law, which I was not happy to see actually put there. So what, what would your feelings be about case law? And with regard to page 260, um, paragraphs 10 and paragraphs 12. So paragraph 10, which is about the question of the visibility displays and whether that is um, a requirement, a proper requirement. And, and do you feel therefore that that particular paragraph still holds sway? And at paragraph 12, um, the information, and I'm going to emphasize here that whatever you say here will not affect my decision making here, but it would be interesting to me to see whether at paragraph 12 that would be um, the Fuse Lane Consortium's um, still intention that uh, if this was to be passed, that is the way that you would be going forward. So thank you very much. Um, OK, uh, to start going back to the case law issue, um, the council also has no case law to support its interpretation of the statute. Um, the council also has no statutory law to support its interpretation of the statute. Um, the council has no law period to it to support its interpretation. But we have statute law and we have case law to support our interpretation of statute law. We've spent three years campaigning against this development. We have sought legal advice from three extremely qualified, experienced public law barristers. Um, as you know, I have put a lot of work into the Fuse Lane Consortium, and this is an issue that is not only of crucial importance to us, but I think is going to set a precedent that is nationally important to local planning authorities 
across England. And we are um, not that this is material to the decision, but we absolutely are going to move forward with judicial review because I think it's an important point that needs to be established in case law um, because it has real ramifications for the highway safety of this particular junction. There's no visibility. The highways authority has there's no visibility zero. Um, and there's no clear indication that the um, council has considered the relevant material considerations uh, in regards to um, this issue. Thank I you think that addresses everything. Thank, thank you. Mr. Thank Fulton. you very much, Mr. Fulton. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Councillor Deborah Roberts. We, Chairman, we have a further request for clarification from Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you very much, Councillor Heather Williams. This may be more along the lines of what the, uh, you were referring to, Chairman. Obviously, my um, attention is to the notice that was said. Um, again, my apologies. It's really hard. And I know everyone's trying to cram things in when they're speaking and um, with the Internet. The, if I could have the, the reference of the notice that you said and then the response um, may need to come from officers, Chairman, and I appreciate that. So through yourself, if if as chairman you could get some clarity on on that issue please and um, one other thing we we did have a site visit i've just remembered uh, way back where were we way back got elected yep. so um, we may we may just want to make that clear as well i i, I recall it well um so i uh, just the uh, notice i mentioned is a notice under article 15 of the town and country planning development management procedure order england 2015, which is commonly referred to as the Development Management Procedure Order. Not that that's much shorter. Um, and this is required for development that affects uh, a public footpath. I know Councillor Williams will remember the application at Church at Darrington. This is one of the notices that needed to be published there. It's specifically in regards to the public footpath and it alerts all users of the public footpath in the newspaper that the development will affect their public right of way. Thank you. And so, yes, on, on that point, if we could therefore go to um, either Lewis or to legal advice on whether or not that Article 15 um, notice was considered um, as necessary and, and was implemented. Chris, I see that you're, you've got your camera. Sorry, Chair. Yes, thank you. Through you, just to say Toby Williams, the team leader, has just been looking into this point and that you may wish to invite him to address this point, please. Thank you. Hello, Toby. Welcome. And if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, afternoon everyone. Uh, my name's Toby Williams and I'm the Area Development Manager for this part of the um, district. Um, I have I had a look at um, Article 15 that Mr Fulton um, has referred to. Article 15 um, relates in the first instance to an application for planning permission. This is actually an application for a variation of a planning uh, condition. So I think the first point is actually whether or not this this um, particular uh, paragraph 15 is engaged. I think my view is that it is not um, engaged as you read it on the face. Um, in any event, if it were to be engaged, I would read this article as whether or not a development in terms of it affecting a public right of way in terms of the alignment of that public way, it's it's realignment of it or it's stopping up, etc. And this is not this proposal is not affecting that right of way in terms of its route um, at, at all. It is seeking um, effectively to uh, utilise Hughes Lane as anyone would do along Hughes Lane if permission were granted. Um, for access for delivery vehicles, etc. So I don't think that um, the uh, paragraph 15 is engaged. And even if it were, um, my interpretation is that the public right of way in the in the in the sense of how it's phrased is not affected. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. Would you like to come back on that? Thank you. If I if I could just come back on that to to make sure that you know got full clarity and, and forgive me Chairman, this may be more appropriate for, for Toby than for Mr Fulton. Um, but my recollection from before, it, 
the case that got referenced in Arrington was that it, there was going to be no change. It, the right of way went through someone's garden. It, it was going to have no impact in that respect, other than the, the change of use of the land to, to garden use. Um, so that had an even lesser impact than what's being proposed here. And yet we did we did do that that order. So I am struggling with that explanation um, that's that's been given and, and if officers or whoever can can really do something else, because I appreciate it might not have had a material impact, but if it's part of the process that we should have done, then then that and given that we are facing, um, I have no, that's one thing I am certain today, we'll, we'll face some sort of challenge either way on this application, whatever the outcome. Um, I would really like some, some reassurance around process here. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. And, and perhaps if you could clarify, I think, what Cat Feather Williams brings up there. So one is whether it's sort of change of use around this, or this is, a, um, if I'm trying to understand it as well, we're looking at temporary construction um, discharge of condition around this one. Does that make a difference or, or not? Toby, can you help with that? Yeah, I mean, I'll just reiterate that I, I, I really do not think that this is a process that is, in, is engaged through this particular... Uh, do you want, so, so just so we all understand process, you mean so, you know, actually taking and implementing Article 15 notice, is that what you mean by process? Yeah. Yeah, so if you if you read if you read uh, the article 15 it says um, to start off with an application for planning permission must be published publicized by the local planning authority to which the application is made in the manner prescribed by this article. So that the first point chair is that this is not an application for planning permission. It is an application to vary um, a, uh, a a condition. And there is, um, I think there is a distinction there. And the second point is whether or not it would affect um, that right of way. The proposal is not in any event uh, proposing to affect that right of way in any permanent manner, um, as I understand it. And the council would not ordinarily, as a matter of process, if there were temporary impacts, um, <clears throat> such as through construction, think that this article were were engaged at all, uh, Chair, and that's my interpretation of uh, that particular part of the management procedure order um, as I see it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams, you want to come back? Thank you, I, I do appreciate that. Um, I'm just wondering, Chairman, if if you will permit five minutes if, if Toby was able to send the link around because as he says if, if we read it for ourselves it's not something that we've got to our fingertips I, I very much would appreciate having five minutes to just read the article myself if that was possible. Uh, um, in the interest of everybody I think we'll ask Chris Carter about that but we could um, it could be on the screen rather than mm, around. Exactly. Also I'm happy with both of those options Chair I would just like a, an opportunity to view it. Yes, Chair, through you, I'd suggest, Toby, are you able to share the screen with that? I am able to share my screen. Bear with me. Ooh. Can you zoom in a little bit for us? Yeah. And, and could he unhighlight it because it makes it slightly harder to read? <laughs> oh, perhaps. That's it. And, and if you could just read it out for us, Toby, that would be really helpful. Yeah, publicity for applications for planning permission. An application for planning permission must be publicised by the local planning authority to which the application is made in the manner prescribed by this article. In the case of an application for planning permission for development, which A is an EIA application accompanied by an environmental statement, B does not accord with the provisions of the development plan in force in the area in which the land to which the application relates is situated or C would affect a right of way to which part three of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 public rights of way one applies. The application must be publicised in the manner specified in paragraph three. And then paragraph three goes on to state 
an application falling within paragraph two, paragraph two application must be publicised in accordance with the requirements in paragraph seven and by giving requisite notice uh, by site display in at least one place on or near the land to which the application relates for not less than 21 days. Um, and uh, by in B, by publication of the notice in the newspaper circulating in the locality in which the land to which the application relates is situated. Thank you um, for that, Toby. Do you want me to stop sharing my screen, Chair? Yes, thank you very much. So members on, on that, we've heard that the, um, we've heard from Toby Rimps, who is the development manager for this area, has given his interpretation of that challenge by by Mr Fulton. Um, Stephen Reid, do we want to hear anything else from you in terms of, you know, as committee, we are guided by um, our officers and by our legal counsel on these issues. Would you like to say anything additional or just support um, what Toby said? Thank, thank you, Chair. I, I would um, endorse the comments made by Toby Williams that this is not an application for a planning permission. Um, if the point was to have been taken, it should have been taken when the planning permission was originally granted. And the advice we've received, we have received is that um, Fuse Lane are now out of time to challenge the original permission in in relation to the points that they've sought to argue. We're dealing with a section 73 application and we need to focus on that application. So the, the legal advice is very clear. If um, Mr Fulton wishes to break case law, he may have to do so in relation to uh, uh, an application for a future planning permission where he can take points as to the red line, where he can take points as to our so Stephen, I, I don't think we, we're not ask, we're asking for you to provide us with reassurance as members of the committee because we're not, you know, we're not sort of legal experts in this. So we are hearing from both you as our legal um, advice and from the officer as well that you're giving us reassurance from your interpretation um, of, of policy and of these articles, that what has been done in not engaging with Article 15 um, is fine. You're giving us that reassurance. I don't think you need to give advice to Mr. Fulton's what he takes. No, no, that's, sorry, but if, if we're the, fine there, do we have, the, so Council, that's, members, that's as much as we can have, which is we are hearing from, at this point in time, this is what our, our officers are saying to us. Do we have any further clarification questions? Yes. So yes, the, the, chairman. The, the advice chair is that the any application for judicial review of the original planning permission is out of time. I, I understood that. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. OK. So, Chairman? Yes. Um, there's myself and Councillor Toomey Hawkins. So the point I would like to make is um, that that actually the main point is as to put your camera on Councillor. Oh, sorry yes sorry I do apologize uh, the main point is as um, Toby Williams mentioned that as my, my understanding um, in the small way of being a footpath officer for my village is that section 15 relates to diversion or a, an establishment of a new route because the old route has become onerous or difficult or problematic for some reason or a stopping up of a route it does not ever councillor have... we're still Brad, no. we're still in the clarification questions is yours Sorry, a question so or... i just wanted to clarify that no, not you uh, to clarify a question no, to... No, i just wanted to ask for clarification that my understanding of what toby williams is ha has said is that that the point that the point of law is that 
the section 15 relates to the stopping up or diversion of a footpath, not to its occasional being occasionally being blocked by a lorry, you know, in the course of a construction. Can, can we have clarification from Toby Williams that that is my understanding is correct? Toby. Through you, Chair. Yes, Councillor Bradman, I, I, I would agree with your interpretation. Thank you very much, Toby. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think I was just going to say, we're, are we here to discuss law? Or are we here to discuss material planning considerations mm -hmm. for an application to vary a condition? I think we need to focus on that. And if this, whatever decision we make is going to be challenged, it will be challenged. And that is not for us to determine. Ours is to determine this application to vary a condition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Martin Khan, I see that you have requested to speak, but we, um, is that on this to Mr Fulton or we would then move to the, the next public speakers? It's a clarification simply that uh, I wanted to ask a, a lawyer, just wanted to ask a, um, either Toby Williams or uh, um, that a lorry could at this moment uh, without a um, would already have permission uh, to uh, approach the uh, the site um, as is proposed in this thing, and so that the uh, there is no actual change in what the uh, what is allowed to do. It is only regulating how that is actually to be carried out. Toby, through you, Chair. Yes, uh, that that's that's correct. Vehicles can travel down um, the access, which is a public right of way. Presently, this is just seeking to manage that process in relation to a development pro proposal um, off Hughes Lane. Thank you, and I think just as you know, as Councillor Toomey Hawkins said, so what we're looking at is the varying of a condition which is making specific reference to a traffic management plan. You know, specifically saying which of the traffic management plan that is, in which it is then proposing um, this way, and in which the traffic. That transport of the heavier items would come through a backwards motion down the lane. So that's what we're that's what we are focusing on. Um, Councillor Bradham, do we have anybody else asking uh, clarification questions? Chairman, Councillor Deborah Roberts has asked for to speak. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate that you called me back in. Greatly appreciated. Can I put a very quick question to Mr. Fulton again, please? Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Fulton. Obviously, you've heard um, the uh, officers, legal and planning, uh, what they have had to say about uh, about the uh, stat whether it would stand up in a court of law. Can I just confirm that the people that you have um, taken legal advice from, I presume that they have read uh, what was being quoted themselves in full. So the argument that's been put by officers is that that's about a planning application uh, and therefore it's not appertaining to to what you're challenging. Um, your views, please. Um, I can say we were aware that uh, officers might make such statements um, and that was taken into account when we received legal advice. If that's helpful. Thank you. And, and, and what you said and, before, and your, sorry, Chairman, and your experts, Mr. Fulton, have read that um, particular law policy in full, haven't they? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thank you for your time again, Mr. Fulton. And we'll move on um, now with the other public speakers. And so we do have, um, in terms of the applicant and the agent, we have Patrick mm -hmm. Lanaway, who is the agent. Patrick, hello. Yes, good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, We can committee. see you perfectly. We can hear you as well. And you understand, you know very well the, the procedures. We've got three minutes for you to. I do, I do. And uh, obviously, in view of the discussion we've had to date, <clears throat> um, I hope not to take up too much of that. Um, I'm going to leave aside the, the legal issues because obviously they'll be rehearsed with the, the officers of the council. But what I do want to clarify is that, um, and I have started my three minutes, if <laughs> just in case, that purpose of the transport the traffic management plan which has been submitted and which is before you now 
is to provide very specific detail pursuant to the original condition, which effectively set the parameters within which the traffic management plan should contain. Um, and we've heard already through the um, presentation by the planning officer, the fact that it, it contains very specific um, requirements and proposals relating to, for example, the hours of traffic activity to ensure that, that the importation and exportation stages do not occur. And during the afternoon period for an extended period, taking into account obviously the, the levels of activity elsewhere. Um, it is based very much on the experience which has been gained from um, developing and building the properties which are already down Fuse Lane and specifically therefore how best and how most appropriately the traffic management of this stage of the development can be managed. So hence why areas have been laid out within the site um, for parking, turning, loading, etc, etc. And only where very specifically required and as set out in the traffic management plan, will it be necessary to occasionally, very occasionally, reverse under control, as Dr. Finney has said, the um, the need to bring in large scale and therefore low loaders or larger vehicles to reverse down there. But as Dr. Finney has said and as, as set out in the traffic management plan, they will be fully under the control of the signaler. Um, it also contains, for example, um, a strategy and a an inspection regime to ensure that any damage caused by any part of the process is swiftly and appropriately maintained and repaired. It sets out things like wheel washing. Effectively, I consider that what we've put together and what SLR have presented as the traffic management plan in association with the experience of the developer provides a very robust and as comprehensive as possible means of controlling parking, turning deliveries, both in terms of where, how and when. Um, one thing that also has um, needs to be taken into account, we believe, is the fact that a lot of these issues were considered by the previous appeal uh, in September 2018, and the findings of the inspector then have also been taken into account in the preparation of the traffic management plan was put together. Obviously, very happy to uh, provide any clarification for any points that you, you wish to, uh, to present. Thank you very much. Um, Patrick for that and for Thank keeping you. within the time and for uh, giving additional information which is always really important. Members do we have any um, clarification questions for Mr Lanaway? There are no questions Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much Mr Lanaway for that and we will now move to the Parish Council, Long Stanton Parish Council and invite Libby White again, the Clark Pride Council. Hello, Libby. Thank Hello. you for keeping with us and being with yeah. us again. Um, thank you, Chairman. Very quickly, um, with respect to the second application for Fuse Lane. Uh, and sorry, the very you do have, I'm going to have to repeat it. You do have author authorization. Yes, yes, yes on there yeah. um, with, re with respect to the variation of condition seven, we'd like to reiterate Longstanton Parish Council's concern over highway safety. And it's noted by members that the plan shows that contractors will park at Digital Park on Station Road and make their way to Fuse Lane. Concern has been raised that contractors will not wish to walk the one mile from Digital Park and parking may be abused in the village. Longstanton Parish Council have not changed their views on the application and continue to be opposed to it. However, should this variation be approved, the council would ask that the addition of the limited listing of streets where there is commitment that no parking will be undertaken be removed with a statement committing that parking on any roads in Longstanton will not happen or that the list of streets is extended to cover additional roads which could only be which could be used by the contractors under the paragraph 3.2.4 workforce parking. Thank you. Thank you very much and also for that specific and constructive um, recommendation if indeed this were to be minded to approve this. Thank you very much for any questions um, members. Um, Chairman there's a request for clarification from Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you Chairman. Um, I'm just reading the Longstanton Parish Council's comments in the report which is point 11 I believe. 
Um, it's saying that the main uh, reason for opposition was the safety uh, aspect, i.e. pedestrians and lorries sharing the same road. I just wanted to ask um, Lily if she thought that the inclusion of a signal person to guide the lorry down would have overcome that objection for the parish council. Um, possibly. Um, I do use that path um, pretty much every day. Uh, is it um, is narrow, it is only the width of a vehicle, so if there is a banksman that would make it a lot easier and safer for pedestrians, yes. Thank you very much. Councillor Bradnam, do we have anyone else? Uh, yes, we have Councillor Eileen Wilson, Chairman. Thank you. Um, Councillor Wilson. I, <coughs> yes, I just sat through you, Chair, I have a question for Libby White. Um, we, we've heard that the proposal is that workmen will be brought from the parking area by minibus to the um, building site. Would that respond to the parish council's concerns? If they use that, yes. Um, I think they've, because they've also used that statement saying they won't park on the high street or Mitchcroft Road, which is nearby. They've omitted other nearby streets. So I think that's why they're sort of suggesting to change the wording to either cover all the streets or just to say no parking. But yes, if they're going to come by minibus, that would make a, a big difference. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I'm, I'm sure during the debate, if members wanted to pick up um, any of those recommendations that you have, um, Libby, they could they can do so. Um, Councillor Brown, am I right that there aren't any further clarification questions? There are no further questions, Chairman. Yep. Thank you very much, um, Libby. Libby White, the Clerk of Longstanton Parish Council. And we don't have any comments from a local member. Therefore, members will move to the debate on this. And remember that what we're looking at is to approve the application for the varying of Condition 7 specific to um, the specific transport management plan, um, which is identified. Thank you. Do I have anybody who'd like to speak? Um, Chairman, just for clarity, um, the recommendation is that we're looking at is on page 253. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Many thanks, Chairman. Uh, well, again, it's a, a very complex day, isn't it? Um, and I'm really quite surprised to hear a leading councillor saying we don't need to take any notice of um, legal implications here. We just get on with it as a planning application. We, we've got serious reason to make sure that we um, do not act unlawfully or break the rules uh, because um, to do so or to not do so risks putting us in financial and humiliating circumstances. Now, we, we've been in the High Court for a number of times recently where we've locked, lost on every occasion because of what really appear initially to be minor breaches of not following planning law. But nevertheless, they've ended up uh, in cases going against us, and has been publicly, in my opinion, publicly humiliated. And we can't go on this way. So however tedious it may seem to some, we have to make sure that we do, you know, cross the I's and dot the T's or whichever way around you're supposed to say that. And it seems to me here that we, I think Councillor Heather Williams said it, one way or the other here, this is going to end up in the court. But I would rather end up in the probably planning appeals rather than the High Court. Um, because I'm far from um, satisfied that um, the council's advice that we took, and I'm not on about our legal officers or our planning officers, is actually will actually stand up in a court of law. There are also parts of the of this request that give me concerns. Um, I really don't see workmen on a cold wintry day um, getting park in their car and getting on a minibus and tootling with all their bags and baggage and all their toolkits 
down to this site a mile away. You know, we know what human nature is like. They'll come in their cars and they'll all park at the end of the road and just walk down the lane. I also think that actually that lorry um, backing down is um, not something that I would want to see if I was a householder there. And it, it's going to inevitably cause um, disputes because it will get in people's way. People won't be able to go up and down um, to to in cars um, while that's going on. And we know how long these builders take. You know, it's not a five minute exercise getting a load of roof trusses off a lorry. Now, I don't know whether that's a material reason to refuse this, but I am concerned about just sort of these generalities in it, which to me are going to cause a lot of problems. Maybe they can be overcome, but my main concern is this legal situation. And I really don't think we can um, act in a manner where we know that there is a chance of it going to legal um, and going to the High Court and us being found wanting again. Thank so you. I will, I will listen to the to the debate from my colleagues. I haven't made up my mind, Chairman. I'm betwixt and between, Thank but you. I'm not happy. Good. And just, just to clarify, so in terms of our material considerations, as we've been directed in the papers, it is around the safety issues. Yeah the highway yeah. safety issues, just to forget. And we are focused on the varying of that condition in a traffic management plan, which is looking at specifying to mitigate you know, yeah. any of those circumstances we've been raised. And we have heard from Longstander Parish Council that it does to you know extend some of those, deal with some of those things. There was also a proposal or a recommendation from the Parish Council that could um, improve that as well. And I'd like to sort of see if anybody would like to explore that as well within the debate. Um, I see um, that Sharon, you've put your camera on. Yes, do you want to <laughs> introduce yourselves to the to the committee, Sharon? Um, and I see that you would like to speak perhaps in response to this. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, so my name is Sharon Brown. I'm Assistant Director Delivery. Um, so I've obviously been working with the legal officer with respect to some of the legal issues arising uh, from this application that have been raised. Um, I would just confirm and reiterate that uh, in response to the issues raised by Councillor Roberts, uh, the Council has taken its own external legal advice from uh, Queen's Council. That is the position that we are relying on um, and as you have said, Chair, the key issues in relation to this application are the matters before the committee, which is that this is a variation of a condition relating to a traffic management plan and the considerations of members needs to be on those matters. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Sharon. And obviously each member will then themselves consider everything that they've heard and how, how they're confident. But as members, we must, one, what's in front of us and two, the advice that we're be being given um, by both officers and our legal counsel. Councillor Bradnam, who's next in the debate to speak, please? Sorry, I was muted. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins, Chairman. Thank you. And if we can keep this very much focused on the condition that's being varied and this, you know, the specifics of that condition that's being varied, um, really I ask all members that that's where we focus our, our attention. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm sorry, but I have to say this, I refuse to have another councillor put words in my mouth inferring something I did not say. I think we all heard what I said, and that was to focus on the material considerations. OK, and I will correct this. We have not had many cases determined against us in court. I would refer her to the reports that we took to scrutiny back in December. Now, on the matter stop at digging hand, your hole to me. Stop, stop digging your hole. Can I, can I just ask for respect? What we did say at the very beginning in terms of the protocol was there is a way to respect to speak, ask to speak, and also that we won't 
talk over people because it's very, very hard, especially in a digital format for people to follow the, the debate. So Councillor Hawkins, if you were now focused on the specifics of the um, of this condition. Uh, thank you, Chair. We have had um, expert advice given to us. We have had Dr Finney explain the situation to us. Um, the reason for the change is because the applicant has learned from the work that he's done previously in building the, the other two that are there now. And what he's seeking to do is to make sure that the development does not impinge on those who are you know, in the neighbourhood and who are going to use the path. Hence this request for a variation. And if we've had, um, uh, you know, if you're preparing uh, something like this based on previous experience to make sure it doesn't happen again, and you have the expert highways authority telling us that they are satisfied, and we've had a look at this, we've seen the pictures. Um, I think for me, it's difficult to say that we should refuse this. The principle of development has been established. It's a case of how the development is implemented and we need to take note of this and take note of the advice that we've been given. And yes, some have been to the site, some have not, but we've seen the pictures and nothing in those pictures suggests that this won't work. There are concerns from the uh, um, parish council, which I take, um, and that is workmen might not want to walk that way, you know, that longer distance, but there are options to doing this. And what I have found, at least in my village, is this. If you have workmen who are parking where they shouldn't be parking, as long as villagers know that and report it to the site manager, the site managers do actually take action very swiftly. I have had uh, one site here where somebody actually was toughed off the site and lost his job because he refused uh, to do what was being asked in the traffic management plan. So there are ways of dealing with these issues. And I think um, if we were to put conditions in that ensures that A, um, the community is able to uh, have direct links with the site manager, uh, you know, as a small liaison or, uh, you know, however it is done through the parish council, then I'm sure that there is uh, opportunity for the requirements to be met, monitored, <laughs> and enforced locally without even having to go to enforcement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who do we have next to speak? Chairman, the next speaker is Councillor Henry Batchelor. Yeah. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as with the other applications today, I mean, I'm going to base my decision on the professional advice that we've been given. We've heard from the council's planning officer, the council's legal officer, an external legal advice that the council have taken and also the county council highways department or who which say that this application to vary a condition is acceptable. I don't think we're in a position to refuse what is in front of us today. Um, as Councillor Hawkins just said, if there are breaches of the enforcement, sorry, if there are breaches of conditions relating to parking, then I'm sure you know the people of Long Stanton will be the first to, to let the site manager and South Camps planning enforcement team know that. So, as I said earlier, I don't feel in a position to refuse this. So, uh, as it stands, I'll be supporting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, everybody, we've just gone past the two o'clock mark, which is four hours. I would like to, um, if possible, by affirmation, agree that we um, continue and extend this meeting. Once we finish this particular application, we will have a break before then continuing with the rest of the agenda. So could I have, um, by affirmation, your agreement that we extend the meeting? Agreed. 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 Anybody Agreed. who doesn't agree? Good, thank you very much. Uh, Chairman, the next speaker is Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you. Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I should just say to start, I, I haven't actually been, been to the site, so I wasn't on the committee, obviously, um, when this was considered before. Um, I'm just going to say a few words about the legal issue, but hope, hopefully in a helpful way. Um, I mean, it, it's a really fascinating legal issue that's been raised about the relationship between applications, variations, uh, the act and the, and the management practice. And, you know, I, I think all sides have, have, have really gone above and beyond in, in getting their advice. And we've got lots of fascinating documents that have been presented. And as I say, it really is an interesting legal issue. But I think 
you know, in my professional capacity, I, you know, very interested in it, obviously, but I think it, it's a point where we've got evidence that reasonable people disagree. Um, it's an unclear question as to what, what the answer to this is, and I don't think actually we can or should try and resolve that legal question in um, in, in this committee. There's a genuine dispute about what the law means, how these different bits of law relate to each other, and I think ultimately that can only really be decided by by the court. Um, so um, I'm not sure we can actually do that. I have a, you know, a lot of sympathy for the Fuse Lane position, um, but, but as I say, I, I, I don't actually think there's much more that could be done to resolve that internally within this committee. On the substance, um, I have sympathy with what the parish council has said, and I do have some concerns about highway safety. Um, I would be interested if we could explore taking those forward, particularly having a guide. If 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 um, uh, lorries are, are reversing up and down that lane, there's a public right of way on it. I, I think there is a genuine highways safety issue there. So I would be keen um, to hear from the officers if we could maybe toughen it up and take, take account of some of those parish council um, concerns. So it's the substantive issue of highway safety that obviously I think we need to decide on. On that, I do have some concerns. I'd be reassured if the parish council points could be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. And as, as I understand it, Councillor Richard Williams, what we have heard is that that is within the traffic management plan is to have the signal person going and, and parish council did recognise that as that could be something that further mitigated. What they did ask Longstone Parish Council is whether or not um, it could be extended to be all streets are included in the non-parking or s extend the list of those yes. um, streets. Yeah. Sorry if I didn't make that clear. Yes, yes, that, that, that was my point. Thank you. So maybe we could ask the, the case officer that whether that is a possibility. Uh, Chairman, I, I'm the next person to request to speak. Yeah, could we just ask for the case officer, um, Lewis, are you able to? Thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, I just want to clarify this point. So in the traffic management plan, the contractor parking is dealt with on digital park and there'll be a mini bus to ferry them from that to the site. I believe what the parish council is referring to is the parking of delivery vehicles, yeah. um, not contractor parking, because contractor parking is dealt with. Mm -hmm. So if I, would it be helpful if I shared my screen just so we're all looking at the same thing? So just bear with me. So I just want to refer to paragraph 3.2.4, which is workforce parking. And it's it, this um, line mm -hmm. here that the That's parish right. council is yep. referring to. Yep. So that says that no delivery vehicles will park on the high street, mm. Mitchcroft Road or Fuse Lane to maintain access way to the site and keep existing properties clear. Um, we could amend that to include all streets within Lonstanton. We could include that within the proposed amended wording of condition seven. Could we just have some advice from Dr John Finney about that and whether that would be standard practice? Thank you. Um, John, are you able to just elaborate on that? Can you hear and see me? Not, I think you have to stop sharing your screen, Liz. Apologies. Yeah, there we go. Is it all right? Can you see and see me now? I can hear you, John, but not see you. We didn't see you. Oh, the other time I, well, I, I will, I will. No, OK, as long as you can hear me, that's the important point. I mean, from the highway service perspective, if um, the contractor is they develop is content. I see no reason why they shouldn't be. I see no reason why there shouldn't be a blanket ban, as Mr. Tomlinson has suggested, across the streets within Longstanton. It it would be enforceable because clearly you would the residents would see where the vehicles were going and coming from, and if they breached that, then it would be a matter obviously for the planning authority to enforce. But I say from the highway authority perspective, it wouldn't be a significant issue. Good, thank you. So. Um... What I would like to do, members, is that we we move um, to a vote on that change to add that in terms of the traffic management plan. So we, we can, you know, within if we were minded to approve to vary this condition according to that specific traffic management plan, that there is a change, as we've just heard, to that specific clause for the delivery vehicles to be a blanket ban on all streets. Um, Chairman, we yes. would have to say with the exception of Digital Park. 
that's for the construction vehicles. Yes, uh, oh. we have to have somewhere for yeah. the chippies and the plasterers to park their cars. So are they going to be allowed to use digital park as well? If I could chair for you, so we would word in such a way. So I think contractor parking is dealt with in the traffic management plan because of digital park. I think the word we'd want to add to the condition uh, in line with what members would like would be notwithstanding uh, paragraph 3.24 in relation to delivery vehicles and then go on to say that they shouldn't park within any streets of London Stanton. Sorry, so so forgive me, I'm just trying to think practically speaking how these people who are properly doing building, are we, we must enable them to park somewhere. If I could for you, Chair, um, th this is in relation to delivery vehicles and not contractors. So this would be people delivering materials to the site. Okay. Right. Sorry, point taken. I understand. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. I misunderstood. Good. Um, Chris, you, you've asked to speak. Chris Carter. Ah, OK. <laughs> sorry, Chair. Yes, Lewis has covered yeah. that point. I think we just we've got those two issues, haven't we? And we've got sort of the contractor vehicle and that was the backing down and it was whether or not the parking and that's delivery park. And this one is specifically about delivery vehicles that are coming in. Um, and so I think as we've got so in relation to 3.2.4 within the traffic plan, notwithstanding that, that they shouldn't park on any of the streets. Um, that's what you're proposing there for Lewis. Toby, I see you got your camera on. Are you helping us with that? I'm trying to try, try and assist committee if I can. Um, I, I, I have read this plan. Um, I do recall that there was um, one particular street near Northstow that was identified for these vehicles to lay up in. Um, Lewis, I'm not sure if you're you're able to kind of find that particular um, part of the plan that you could show um, members, but I think this has been um covered by the um applicants in the plan already from recollection 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 mm -hmm. uh, for you chair i'll just share my screen to just show everybody this so it is within the traffic management plan T toby is correct um it talks about in terms of hcv off-site parking we've identified a section of sterling road in north Stowe which is currently utilised by various companies delivering materials, including ready mix, well, as it goes on, in and around North Stowe. Um, I think that's fine, but I don't see any concern with adding the extra bit that members want into the condition, because it really just makes sure that it's clear to everybody. I'd support that. Did you want me to just draft what it would look like so I can show members? Please, that would be excellent. Thank you very sure. much. Bear with me a couple we'll, we'll continue of with, with other with other um anybody who wants to make other contributions to the debate while Lewis is helping us to to draft what that motion would look like. Um, Chairman, I think I was the last person to speak. I think um if that's okay, Chairman, through you. Yes. Thank you. Um my feeling is that um I'm confident, having looked at the Countryside Planning Act uh, while we were talking, I'm confident that the advice that Toby's given us and the legal matter is dealt with, um, that this this doesn't relate to the temporary dealings with, you know, move, movements of vehicles along Fuse Lane. Um, so I'm confident that we're, we're dealing with that in an appropriate manner. And I'm relieved that we've taken up the the point that the parish council made about parking. I think this solution that's been suggested is very helpful and I think that will be great and be good when um, Mr Tomlinson has the wording. Um, so now I am confident to approve this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bradenham. Um, Councillor Dr Simi Hawkins. Yeah. May I chair? Yes, Councillor Dodge. I wondered if we could put an informative uh, regarding liaison between parish councils and residents, if any um, breaches um, are noted so that the site manager can be contacted immediately to get the matter resolved. Absolutely, I'd endorse that as well, Chairman, sorry. Right, Chair, thanks Chair, thank you very much. <laughs> 
Um, what makes things easier for people around within the community? And obviously we will come in as enforcement if we need to, but it's usually easier for the site manager to deal with these issues there and then. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. So, um, Lewis, if you could respond to that as well, whether an informative could be added. Apologies, I was on mute. Um, we can add an informative, yes. I'll just share my screen now just to show the proposed word and So I'll just read it out. So the development hereby permitted shall be carried out in accordance with the traffic management plan prepared by SLR Consulting version final one and dated December 2019. Notwithstanding the detail contained within the traffic management plan in relation to the parking of the delivery vehicles, no delivery vehicles during the construction phase will park on any streets within the village of Lonstanton. Thank you very much. And so I think we'll take one each each one in, in turn in terms of these different proposals. Um, so what I would committee, what I'd like to do is I would like to propose that as a motion that we accept this to be included within the recommendations for approval. Do I have a seconder? Yes, Chairman, I'll second that. That's Councillor Bradnam. Thank you. Um, knowing obviously that we haven't yet gone to we're not yet at the vote whether or not we are going to um, accept and approve the officer recommendation for the varying of the condition this is about what we're voting on if we when we get to that point so this is about a motion to include the wording on the screen within the recommendation as part of the conditions um, seconded by councillor Anna Bradnam um, can I take that by affirmation or shall I do a roll call agreed I agree Actually, I think because we have got some people who have registered concerns about everything, I'm going to do a roll call, I've just realised, in terms of the, just the, the, the legal proceedings of the whole thing have been um, registered. So, Councillor Henry Batchelor. Yeah, I'm in favour, Chair. Four. Councillor Bradnam. Um, four. Councillor Martin Khan. Um, four. Councillor Peter Fain. Against. Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Four. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Against. Councillor Heather Williams. Against. Councillor Richard Williams. Four. Councillor Eileen Wilson. Four. Councillor Nick Wright. Four. And myself, Councillor Pippa Halings. Four. That's eight in support and three against so that motion is carried as part of um, the recommendation once we get to the vote the next if i understand Councillor Tommy hawkins you would like to propose that an the, an informative is included um would you like to say exactly what that means? but it's about um including within the informative that there is some kind of liaison established between the parish council and the site manager um, in order to deal with any problems that are arising immediately, which does not take away the responsibility for enforcement of the council. Uh, I think yeah, you got that right, Chair. <laughs> Good, thank you. So you'd like to propose that. Is there anybody who would second that? I'm quite happy to second that, Chairman. That's Councillor Bradnam. Thank you. thank you. So if we go to the vote on that um, second change, Councillor Henry Batchelor. Four. Councillor Adam Bradnam. Four. Councillor Martin Khan. Four. Councillor Peter Fain. Four. Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Four. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Four. Councillor Heather Williams. Four. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Four. Councillor Eileen Wilson. Four. Councillor Nick Wright. Four. And myself, Councillor Pippa Holings, for so that is unanimous um, in terms of that being adopted as part of the recommendation. Um, we're about to move to the vote, but I see that we do. We have any other requests to speak as part of the debate before we go to the vote, Councillor Bradnam? Um, I think the only one we have additionally. I think Councillor Toomey Hawkins has already spoken, but I think we've yes. got a request from Councillor Martin Khan. 
Thank you. Councillor Martin Khan. Yeah, it's certainly very brief uh, to say that, uh, uh, I mean, generally uh, uh, satisfied with the proposals as amended, uh, but but in terms of the legal issue, uh, the there is a certain ambiguity, as Councillor Richard Williams has, uh, has presented. There will always be a certain amount of uh, uncertainty in terms of planning law. We have been advised that it's uh, that it is okay as the best of their knowledge. We mustn't be afraid of taking decisions always upon the possibility of some uncertainty about le legal law where we, get, we only can get the best advice and the best of our knowledge. Uh, and I don't want us to become mice rather than um, men or women, so to speak. Um, so uh, I just feel that that, that that needs to be considered you know, in dealing with our consideration, um, how we decide. Thank you, Councillor Martin. And I just think that, you know, we are committee members. We are not experts in, in planning law. All that we can do, I don't know if it's a, it's a necessarily a measure of sort of bravery it's about this is what we need to do we, we need to base ourselves on the council that we receive which is from our officers and from legal counsel and they have contracted independent legal advice um, that that's all we can do as committee members and i think as councillor richard Williams said if that is then taken to to be contested at a later stage and we all learn from that then then fine but at the moment as committee members i think what we must do is each of us now is hear what we've heard um, from our own from the advice that's been given to us and make a decision based on that the decision is around the varying of a condition which is condition seven it's on page 253 which is that we approve the application subject to the following conditions and informative and we have also just added a further condition and a further informative to that and I'll now go to a roll call um, to see all of those who are for this recommend, officer recommendation to approve the application for the varying of condition seven. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Four, Chairman. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Four. Councillor Martin Khan. Four. Councillor Peter Fain. Four. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Four. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Um, I don't think I've ever been called a mouse before, maybe a witch, but not a mouse. Um, and I am going to vote against it for the reason that um, I think we have to take the legal question into serious consideration. My understanding has always been Hi, as Councillor Deborah Roberts, we, we did. I'm really sorry because you, you do know we're just at the roll call of the voting at the moment. I don't want to lose that thread. And I, I think we did hear in your intervention how, well, we, how we, important to see that. I'm going to continue say, with the roll call. Councillor, yeah. you are against, and I understand that. Yeah. Councillor, because Heather, I think it's ultra vires. Councillor, or age of, and we can't do that. I am going to ask that we do not speak over each other. I'm going to continue with the roll call. We're in the middle of the vote, so it's for, against or an abstention. Councillor Heather Williams. Um, on the officer's advice, because for. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. For. Councillor <laughs> Eileen Wilson. For. Councillor Nick Wright. For. And myself, Councillor Pippa Halings. For. I'll make that 10 and 1. Thank you, Vice Chair. I will, I will count those up myself. I think we'll do it. So that's 10 and 4 and 1 against. And so that is moved for the approval of the varying of condition 7 with that application. Thank you, members. It's, um, we're doing a bit of a, a marathon here. Thank you to all the members of the public. Thank you to those that make representations on that agenda item. It's 2.24, we've, we've gone past the four hour um, rate, we agreed to do that. So what I'd like to do now is move that we have a break. Um, and I'm right now asking 15 minutes for that break, or does anybody, is that okay? Yes, Chair. That's Chair we don't have, we don't have to close. Chair, sorry, we don't yeah. have to close down, do we, Chairman? Just leave our machines on. That's what I understand. So we don't actually officially close the meeting. So everyone just sort of mute their microphones and their cameras. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, everybody. So um, it's 2.25, so that will be at 2.40. We will resume with the next agenda item. Thank you, everybody, for that. That was a, 
a tough legal issue, but we came down to sort of focusing on what the, the issues around that one and a long morning. Thank you. Take a break. As the break. Fifteen minutes long, I'm not going to put a slide up. I'm just going to leave it as is. It'd be a lot easier to re resume uh, when we come back. So thank you, Liam. Yeah, just be aware, everyone, that your microphones and cameras are still being broadcast. So like mute them and uh, switch your cameras off. Thanks. Thank you. I'll do that myself now.
and things so and the enforcement so nothing nothing that's going to engender a lot of debate oh. councillor wilson we can hear you oh Hello, Councillor Bradnam. So it's 2.40. Um, we'll just check if everybody's back so that we can continue with the agenda. So I'll go through a little roll call and just see if we're all here. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Afternoon. Hello. <laughs> Councillor Bradnam, I can see he's here. Councillor Martin Khan. Yeah. Thank you. Can't really hear you, Councillor Martin Khan, but that'd be good. Councillor Peter Fain. <laughs> Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Present, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Here, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Here. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Here. Thank you. Councillor Eileen Wilson. Here. Councillor Nick Wright. Present. Thank you. Um, so it was just Councillor Peter Fain. Councillor Peter Frame, are you with us? Uh, I'm just texting. Oh, here he is. Councillor Peter Frame, you with us? Oh. I've just texted Councillor Frame.
Councillor Peter Fain, are you with us now? Chairman, I've just tried to call him and got his answer phone, so. Ah, oh, there you are. Hello. Thank you. Councillor Peter Fain, you're with us, yeah? Do hand signals, Chairman. <laughs> I can see it on Zoom, Zoom. <laughs> Peter, are you, are you are you with us? If you can just sort of either say yes in the chat box or um, say yes. You've been ignored, Chairman. <laughs> He's there. Hi, oh. Peter. I can see you when you put your video on. Can you just? Are you able to speak? Yes. Thank you. You can hear you can hear everything, I'm assuming, Peter. So you can take fully part fully in the agenda items there. Thank you, everybody. So we're going to um, restart now with agenda item nine. Um, hello, Sharon. <laughs> Thank you. Agenda item nine, which is something I think really, really important. It's wonderful to have this in front of us now as planning committee. It's something that's been of um, great concern for all of us, of real interest, of interest to parish councils. Um, and things that have been even brought up in the meeting today and other meetings, which is about, you know, the way we do business and the confidence that we have in the procedures that we have, um, our processes and our relationships to make sure that we're doing the job that we need to do. And I think we all recognise the need for this review and we have the report. We've received the report and that's now in front of us. So Sharon Brown, who's the Assistant Director Delivery, um, is going to give a little presentation about that so we can consider it. What we're being asked to do, committee, in terms of the recommendations on page 380, um, is to note the content and recommendations as set out in the Planning Advisory Service report and note the arrangements put in place for a group to oversee um, implementation and you know recommendations around um, the recommendations within the report and also agree that an update report um, come back here to us in planning committee in April. Sharon, thank you very much for you want to give us an overview of this. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, just to provide some background in relation to this item. So South Cambridgeshire District Council and Cambridge City Council jointly commissioned the Planning Advisory Service to undertake a review of South Cambridgeshire District Councils and Cambridge City Councils planning committees, as well as the Joint Development Control Committee. And this was very much in the context of the bringing together of the shared planning service, the creation of the shared planning service and the ongoing wider service improvement programme, uh, which does include a number of process and procedural updates and alignments. The South Cams District Council review has now been completed and the report is in front of members and appended to this report and the uh, planning advisory service report starts at page 385 of the agenda papers. Um, the paragraph 11 of the officer report at page 380 of the agenda papers sets out the process carried out by the planning advisory service including interviews with members, officers and four parish council focus group sessions were also held. And so that process um, was taking place from July through to September. Just looking at the report itself, there are a lot of positives in the report in terms of the feedback from the planning advisory service. I'm just going to highlight a few threads. Um, the planning advisory service particularly comment on the council's quick move to the virtual committees um, in the context of COVID and uh, commend the guidance and information available on the council's website and the effectiveness of incorporating public engagement into that process. Um, some councils haven't done that, which pa the planning advisory service note. Uh, the revised chair's delegation process, which has been operating for a while now, the planning advisory service note that that provides an improved level of transparency. 
members have a good understanding of their roles and a good grasp of the plan led system and local plan policies and good accountability for decisions. In terms of national performance indicators, quality of performance, which means that there are a low number of appeal decisions lost against the council and that the speed uh, at which the council deals with planning applications is improving. The planning advisory service also note that the committee has demonstrated an ability to take difficult decisions on large scale strategic site planning applications. However, as expected, there are a number of improvements that are highlighted in the report um, that we need to focus on going forward. And the report sets out a number of recommendations. So I'll just highlight some of the areas. Uh, that the planning advisory service indicate where there is scope for further improvement. I would very much emphasise that some of the points highlighted in the report have already been um, taken on board by officers through other processes. So we're already part of the um, shared planning services ongoing service improvement plan. So items such as, for example, improvements to officer reports, officer presentations, and the need for uh, more pre-application presentations to planning committee. Um, there are other issues that are highlighted in the report that there is a need for more collaborative working between members and officers as we move forward. And there are suggestions about how we can use the member development programme that we've already put in place to assist with that. Um, we can also learn from best practice uh, from other authorities by reviewing, I think, jointly uh, members and officers, other planning committees and their performance. So there are a range of strategic issues and then there are some more what I would term housekeeping issues. Uh, some of the actions, uh, suggestions, as I said, have already been implemented. Um, some of those are in process, so the further engagement with parishes, which is also a key issue that's highlighted in the report. We have the three area development management teams now, and we do have a programme of engagement with the parish councils. There will be some quarterly meetings that will be set up during 2021, and we will be focusing on some of those key issues of parish concern uh, through those meetings throughout the year. So there are nine recommendations.
scope stated within the past report or until the terms of reference have been ratified by the planning committee and four minutes will be taken when the group meets and these minutes will be made available to all elected members and the public. Um, Chairman, could I, can I um, just suggest um, Heather, with, res with just with re respect to grammar, you might want to change in at the very end of your item one, you just refer to chairmen in the plural, uh, not chairmans. And then the other would be um, that the group should act as one voice. In other words, um, it's not they will report back to at the end of point two, it would be the group. Can I just suggest, um, Heather, with res with just with re respect to okay, I can confirm. I'm getting that back. We are now live as we were, so I guess if you wanted to repeat the four minutes before we uh, like the connection was dropped, then um, do so. But yeah, you're 100 percent live and the audio and vision is now working. Thank you. Chairman, should I reread my motion and then move my motion in that case? Grammar aside. <laughs> Chairman. Sorry, Heather, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Would you like me to read the motion and then move the motion as we're now live? Yes, just one moment. So, sorry, I'm sorry, I was looking at me. So Liam, are we now live? I'm afraid I missed that. Yeah, sorry, just to confirm again, um, yeah, you are now live as as you were before. So yeah, both sound and vision are all all going well. And it's yeah, well, yeah, you're good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good. Yes. So we now have that in front of us. Um, yes. And so Councillor Heather Williams, if you'd like to read the motion which is there. Thank you, Chairman. So the motion that I am moving is that planning committee supports the establishment of a joint member and officer planning improvement group. And one, the planning improvement group will elect a chairman as its first order of business and that the chair be an elected councillor. It's gone off the screen, which I'm reading from. It's um, on the council. councillor and given the powers, protections and authority that other chairmen of this council received by the constitution. The planning number two, the planning improvement group will produce a draft set of terms of reference, which are to include which committee or public meeting they will report back to. Three, no actions will be taken by the group outside of the scope stated within the past report or until the terms of reference have been ratified by the planning committee. Four minutes will be taken when the group meets and these minutes will be made available to all elected members and the public. In moving this motion chairman and committee members I would I would like to stress that it is an attempt that we can put procedural issues to to one side in the in the faith that they will be addressed by this process we don't want to distract from the issues but we have to realize that this group is not something that its establishment is permitted within the constitution it is completely new and therefore i feel from a governance point of view it would not be responsible for us to to carry on without knowing that information or knowing that information is due imminently I have utmost respect and I believe that um, our head of transformation is a, is a fantastic officer. However, to have him as a chairman, in my view, would be to put him in a conflicted position, which I do not believe is right for us to do. And he would have an arm behind his back because as, as an officer, as opposed to an elected member, he will not have the full powers that we would have if we were put in that position. So in fairness and protection of the officer and to ensure that this process is, is has teeth, as it were, and has all the powers and abilities 
that we would normally see as we're following a task and finish model, which does not allow for an officer to um, be a chairman. I believe it's, it's right that we have full collaboration, but that it should be politically driven by those accountable to the public, because we need to have confidence in this. And we start from the basis of getting off on the right foot, and we do that in the best way of knowing that the governance arrangements of this are good and they are tight and that all of us knows that this will be coming back to the public and then we may be able to rebuild that trust not only amongst ourselves but with our parish councils and members of the public also um, so that is my reasoning and i hope that this will be supported as it's mainly about process governance and transparency and I look forward to the debate where we can discuss the issues that have arisen from the report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, before we go into sort of the debate of this motion, do you have somebody who is seconding that motion? I do, Councillor Nick Wright. OK, thank you very much. And what I'm noting is in terms of, you know, keep us really on focus, so in terms of recommendations to committee in terms of what we're looking at in this debate, you know, are the issues around the planning advisory report? This is point B on page 380, which is noting the arrangements put in place for the group, the task and finish group to oversee implementation of the report recommendations. That's the context um, around that, as Casa Heather Williams has you know, referred to the process and governance of that group. Um, do we have, uh, do you want to take it from the screen now, Councillor Williams? Or whoever's- uh, Chairman, it, it's not myself. It's Chris Carter, thank you very much. Yes, um, Councillor Bradnam, do we have anybody who'd like to now speak to this motion? Um, Chairman, yes, um, we do have Councillor Henry Batchelor. I also had some small grammatical points that, she, that, that the motion that, that Councillor Williams might like to take on board. I don't know whether you want to take those. I think, and also I would ask, so sorry, Councillor Nick Wright, I should have asked you know, if you're seconding it when you would like to speak. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. And actually, I was down to speak straight after Heather Williams. Oh, were you? So, um, I, I was going to, uh, I would like to second the motion and presumably Heather will have a chance to sum up at the end. So I'm quite willing to speak straight away, if you wish. Thank you very much. And so, so I'd like to, you to ask you to invite you to speak now, Councillor Rose. Thank you. Um, and this is such an important issue because as members of the council, we it's in all our interests to have an excellent planning service. And there's no doubt over the last couple of years, we've we've lost confidence of our parish councils, which has always been fragile. Um, and we just want to come up with a scheme that will encourage that to come back. Um, we need to be viewed as transparent. So as members, we're all working in the same direction. And with that in mind, you know, we want something that will have teeth and make the right recommendations to the right group, whether it be cabinet scrutiny or just the planning committee. Uh, so very important we get this right. I think uh, Councillor Williams is spot on that it should be chaired by a councillor rather than an officer because it does put the officer in a difficult position um, with his fellow officers uh, in the future if, it, if he or she is chairing it. So I'm absolutely fully behind this motion and I'd commend it to the planning committee. Thank you very much. Councillor Bradman. Chairman, there were other speakers. Thank you to Councillor Wright for pointing out. So we did have a request to speak from Councillor Peter Fain and then Councillor Richard Williams, I believe, before Thank you. you. Councillor Peter Fain. Thank you, Chair. I sympathise with what Councillor Nick Wright has just said about uh, putting an officer in a difficult position to uh, chair this group. I think, however, that um, this doesn't go wide enough, actually. And one of the first things identified in the report is that we are trying, as we all know, to integrate a shared planning service across the two authorities with three planning or rather development control committees. Um, and uh, 
there are going to be some lessons that we can usefully learn from each other across the city boundary. Uh, I think we have to accept that what I, I think we're calling the, the pig now, which I assume is our way of um, planning implementation group. So, oh, so but, Councillor Peter Fain, I think we, we wouldn't use that acronym. It's one thing I was going to mention. Um, and I think Sharon, in her introduction, talked about the planning development group. Given Chairman, the I association really thought, with the acronym, let's call it the development group for now, shall we? Chairman, I hadn't really thought that that acronym would stick. Um, it's the planning development group, which I think is uh, what is recommended in paragraph 14 on page 382. I would suggest it has to go rather wider than just South Cams and that the recommendations it makes will be just that. I don't think they will be recommendations just to this committee. I don't see this as being within the orbit of this committee, even if it were confined to South Cams issues. I also think we have to bear in mind that this happens against the background of very significant changes in the whole planning system and that it may not be possible to resolve this in a satisfactory way within, say, the six month period of a task and finish group. Um, we may need to set up a working group to review this over a period and make gradual changes. The decisions on which will have to be taken by others and not by this committee. Thank you, Peter. Just for, just for the record as well, it's being proposed as a three month group, which is what was um, supported you know, at the scrutiny committee meeting. Um, just to clarify that point, that's all I'm saying there. Thank you very much. Who's next to speak? Um, the next one is Councillor Richard Williams, Chairman. Yeah, Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, yeah, I'd like to support the uh, motion that the other councillor Williams has, has, has put forward. Um, it, it, it does concern me a little bit that this, this committee's got no constitutional status, um, so um, it isn't really clear what rules it would operate under. And if it did operate under the default standing orders of the council and the chair would get a casting vote um, on the committee in the event that there was a disagreement or a, or a split a split vote. Um, and I really think that's an invidious position to put an officer in um, to give them a casting vote. Um, and potentially override a group of elected councillors. Um, I really don't think we should be doing that. So um, again, I'm sure the officer is, is, is more than capable of chairing this kind of committee. It's just for um, democratic and constitutional reasons. I don't really think it's appropriate for officers to do that. It's also worth bearing in mind what our constitution says about the role of officers, um, the role of officers being to um, advise um, elected members, but uh, the constitution says it's the role of elected members to take the policy decisions and the decisions um, you know, that, that uh, operate the way the council um, runs. So um, I don't really think it would be appropriate. Nothing, as I say, about the individual officer, um, but I don't think it would be um, appropriate either given the role of officers and members and the problems around things like the casting vote um, for an officer to chair um, the committee. So um, I support uh, the motion um, that's been put forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Rich Williams. Um, and I do, as I do understand, I think we do have our legal monitoring officer with us. So if there were any questions around any of the constitutional legal issues that people would like to clarify before um, moving to a vote on the motion, we could also do that. Who's asking to speak next? Councillor Toomey Hawkins, Chairman. Yeah. Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think, first of all, perhaps we need to make some clarifications here. This group of uh, people looking at these recommendations are not going to be making decisions. This is essentially a task and finish group, which is looking at the recommendations made in the PAS report. And then providing to the administration their recommendations on how we should go about implementing um, these recommendations. That to me is their task, is to say, look, these are the recommendations that we've made. Uh, speak to whoever they need to speak to, members, other members of the planning committee, um, staff, etc., planning, uh, you know, parish councils. Get all that information together, bring ideas forward as to how we implement these recommendations. It's not for them to make any decisions at all. So, in that light, I'm sorry, but I don't see 
that the planning committee at this stage can decide that it will be, to put it in some phrase I've heard in the past, judge and jury, frankly, its role is to, or the role of the task and finish group is to actually help the council to bring our just together as to how we implement the recommendations uh, in a way that improves the service, obviously. Um, and so I think for me, um, the, the, this, this motion, I think is the wrong one to put forward because it's not a decision making committee. It's a task and finish group taking forward the recommendations from uh, the past report. Thank you. Thank you. Who do we have next? Um, we have Councillor Peter Fain, although I think he may have already spoken. Councillor Peter Fain, you, you did come up with what um, a constituent. Do you have anything else to say to the motion itself? You, you I suspect my previous contribution may not have had much impact um, because I have already spoken. Thank you. No, no, it's just I knew you'd spoken before. I wasn't sure if you wanted to speak again. So the next person is Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you, Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you very much, Chairman. I don't think that, <clears throat> that this actually should be a contentious issue because I, you know, I've been thinking about this since the report came out and I'm really impressed by the positive um, attitude that we all seem to be now taking. Yeah, we've got various little things we think, you know, how did that happen? How did this happen? But, uh, you know, listening to Sharon, ever so positive, you know, she's really facing what she needs to do. And I think members are of, of this, uh, the same ilk as well, but it isn't a task and finish group. I think we really need to clarify that. It's not a task and finish group. It's a new idea. It's a new group um, formation that does not fit in with the constitution and we can't break the constitution. So therefore we we make it so that it will fit in that we that we don't break the rules. It, it's not a task and finish group because um, it, it's a joint uh, working group of both councillors and officers all you know participating in inputting so it's it's it is different and it's got to be treated in a different form so to me it's quite a good idea today to say as we are doing we support it which we which we do very very much um but what we need to see is is uh, its terms of reference and um, you know every committee on south cams has a term of reference this is not a committee at the moment and it's a new idea, so it has to have terms of reference. And, you know, like the other people have spoken, we do have confidence. We don't always agree with officers, but we have confidence that they are giving us good advice. But our tasks are different. It's for, as Councillor Richard Williams said, it's for uh, officers to advise based on their professional uh, qualifications and abilities and it's for us to listen but make the decisions and I think it would be an onerous thing to actually um, have um, a chairman uh, from the officers um, I, I think that puts them in an invidious position because they will have to be the spokesman and um, you know as I said that isn't the task of the officers um, and, you know, we all know that we really are expected, though I've been naughty at times, not to criticise officers and what have you in public. But, you know, this is this is not fair on officers. So I, I think, um, please, let's all just accept that we want good to come of this. We believe that good can come of this. It, it's, it's overdue when it's needed. And we all know that. But now that we are um, being positive about it, let's be just Let's just make sure we do it properly. Let's have it. This new committee with a terms of reference, with a, com a, a chairman of it, who's a councillor, who's accountable to the public. Um, and let's just get on with the job because, you know, they will bring back the terms of reference to us. We can see what it is. If there's something that we think's missing, we can add it. But they also, the main thing to, to remember is, at the end of the day, this group is working to provide this planning committee with the right uh, format to do our job properly in the future. 
and to improve on ourselves. We can all improve. Um, and it, that's what this is all about. It's about moving forward now. We've accepted the report, which is good and bad. It's it's a mixture. But let's just get on and, and take this motion forward. It, it's not stopping anything. It's okay. absolutely not stopping anything. It's being it's about us all joining up. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, so I would just like, I think if we can clarify some perhaps of the, the, the issues that have been raised. Um, and as I say, if we're looking, this is one of the issues around process and we would like to also talk about the substantive issues of content of the report and make sure that planning committee feeds into it. I understand that Rory McKenna is with us and he's our legal monitoring officer that can help. So there have been a, a couple of issues raised here, Rory, and I wonder if you could help us. Um, one, whether the remit of this is um, purely around planning committee or whether the recommendations that go around planning committee to whether planning committee can make this kind of decision um, when a scrutiny committee has um, already supported the establishment of this. As I understand, under task and finish, I think, um, conditions, you were saying, Sharon, but not you didn't use the word as a task and finish group. But if you could clarify that for us, Rory, whether or not there is a constitutional risk to um, an officer chairing that, as has been um, questioned here, um, and any of the other constitutional concerns that were, were raised around this. And also, from my own point, I would just like to query whether in the motion it's um, saying that the terms of reference would then need to come back to planning committee to be ratified, and whether that indeed is a constitutional um, necessity, given the amount of time between um, also different committee meetings. Um, yes, yeah, so in terms of the remit of planning committee to be able to question um, one, the constitutional basis for this group and the way that the um, group is established. Thank you, Rory. Thank you, Chair. So Chair, if I can sort of assist maybe and given the uh, given the background, obviously this has come via the planning advisory service and they have made it very clear by a recommendation eight that uh, this member and officer group should be set up um, on a task and finish model. So it's not a task and finish group, but their recommendation was that it should be set up on a task and finish model. Now, um, members will be familiar with task and finish groups and how they operate, um, but it's quite clear that the intention for PAS was that this group should not have that formality. So in terms of decisions being taken by the group, it's my understanding and, and, and I think it's clear that the terms of reference would be set by the group at the at the same meeting, um, but it's uh, it's clear from the motion that is being put forward in recommendation three that the terms of reference uh, would not be outside of the scope of the numerous recommendations that were contained within the PAS report. And if they were outside of those recommendations, then they would come back to planning committee. But I think the purpose of the group is set up to consider each and every one of those recommendations. And I would imagine that uh, when the group first meets, one of the jobs they will have to do is to try to ascertain which recommendation should go where. But I think it's probably fairly clear that a lot of them will come back to planning committee in, in any event, but that would be a job for the for the group. In terms of who chairs the meeting, um, as I say, that's that's a matter for for members really. Um, I think that um, the the purpose of this group is to um, create better decision making in, in in all aspects, and it's to assist the assist the uh, the, the planning committee. As I understand it, the group won't be taking decisions as such, but they will be making recommendations back to planning committee or whatever committee. Uh, may be required to consider each of the, the recommendations. Now, um, it, it, the group wouldn't have voting powers as such. So I think the best example I can give is recently involved in the constitutional task and finish group, um, uh, which was a cross party member group. Now, there was no decisions, no formal votes taken. There was areas of disagreement and and challenge and what happened in that instance that and I, 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 I must add that they were very few and far between thankfully but in areas where there might be disagreement um, it the, those views would be put 
back to the relevant committee. So if there was a split decision, for instance, that would be reported back as such. It wouldn't be reported back that there was a vote and that this was carried and that wasn't. It would simply be reported back that these were the views of the, the members of the group. And it would then ultimately be a matter for that committee to make a decision as to, to, to what recommendation they would they would then follow and adopt. Obviously, um, officers would have would have no voting powers. Um, I think that um, it, you know whether an officer chairs it, whether a member chairs it, that's obviously a matter for that's obviously a matter for for members. Um, I'm not sure if that covers all your questions, and if it doesn't, um, I'll be happy to come back in. But hopefully, that provides some clarification. Thank you. So what we're saying is in terms of the risk concerned around decision making, what we're saying this isn't a formal task and finish group, it has the sort of modality, sort of the model, as I understand, um, in terms of it has specific, you know, it's got something to do and it's got a time period within which to do that. And yeah. it would need to anyway within that first meeting look at, you know, how it's going to undertake that remit that it has, you know, and establish its, its terms of reference um, within um, that first meeting. Um, and so, as I understand, the motion is not looking to undo the establishment of the of this group no. um, within that, but the, the, the concerns around the risk to an officer uh, for an officer and member group that there are there because it's not a decision making body and it's not a formal task and finish group. Those those don't have um, concerns for you. They, they, they don't know that's that that's my that, that's my personal view, you know. But as you say, it's a matter for members. If members feel mm -hmm. that they would like that group to be chaired by another member, obviously that's within their gift. Yeah, OK. And in terms of where it reports back to, that's something as well. So partly you're saying this would you know, be deciding which are the most relevant areas, which could be planning or scrutiny or, or council. Yes, I believe, yes. I have to say, I think what would probably happen at the, the first meeting is that those those members and officers on the group would it would be a, I, I envisage this group to be very much discussion based actually and I think that there will be a discussion about what would be the most appropriate um, committee to consider uh, any of the, the, the recommendations or discussions back from that group um, and I think that a lot of them will be planning committee I can see a lot of those recommendations within the PASC report coming back to planning committee but as I say the group may have a view on 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 others where it's not entirely clear where the decision making lays. And it may also be that the group decide that not only, for instance, do they want to refer a matter to a particular committee for a decision, but they may also determine it appropriate to report back on certain matters to cabinet, for instance. Um, but that would depend on the, the discussions and the nature of the recommendation. The final thing was in terms of who ratifies the terms of reference. And in the motion at the moment, it's saying that would have to come back to planning committee to ratify. So it, it says, I think in number three, it says no actions will be taken by the group outside of the scope stated in the PAS report. And it says here, or well, or until the terms of reference. Possibly one would hope that if the terms of reference of the group are within the recommendations contained within the PAS report, then I, I hope, you know, would it be necessary to bring those back to the planning committee? But that might be something for uh, the proposer of the motion to consider. Thank you. OK, um, and I see. Do we have another clarification question for Rory before we then go on to the other speakers who've requested to speak? Um, Chairman, we can I sorry, can I would you mind? Would you permit me to jump the queue? Um, I just wanted to point out that I have another meeting to go to at um, which I must leave this meeting at quarter to four four. Um, but I just wanted to ask um, Mr McKenna, my understanding is that the, it's not for this committee to be determining how the task and finish group work. The whole purpose of it being a, 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 a task and finish group is that the task and finish group decides the terms of reference. And as you said, that would be one of the first things that they decide. And it would be for the, that first meeting to determine how they were going to work within the recommendations that had been made by the PAS report. They would never make a decision, as you say, they would only ever make a recommendation and they would determine which committee that particular recommendation was appropriate to, cons to be sent to. Thank you, Chair. So, Brad, we're just, I'm going to clarify again for everybody, so it's not a task and finish group. 
Yeah, can we just uh, make sure we're using the right terminology? Because there's a lot of we're going into some sort of weeds here around what that is. But thank you, Rory. Well, well forgive me, but at, at scrutiny and overview, I understood it was, but I may have misunderstood it at scrutiny and overview. I understood it was setting up a task and finish group. Can I can I just come in yes. there? Because I think it's probably helpful just to read from the recommendation of the scrutiny report. So the um, the recommendation, it was 7B of the report, said that the scrutiny and overview committee support the establishment of a joint member officer planning improvement group on a task and finish model to oversee the implementation of the um, the recommendations within the PAS report. So just to be clear, and, I, and I, th I think possibly it's the use of the language within the PAS report of task and finish, which is it's, it's designed to be helpful, but I think has maybe caused a bit of confusion, but it's not a task and finish group um, in the way members, I think, would un know and understand task and finish groups. Um, but it, um, it, it, it's one that was created on the, the model of one. Um, I think the, um, the, the bottom line is if you look into the Constitution, there's nothing within the Constitution which talks about a group of this nature. So we've had to sort of cobble together as best we can um, and within the spirit of what PAS have been asking um, us to achieve. And just if it's helpful, just recommendation contained within the, the PAS report does actually state, so it talks about examine the possibility of creating a joint member officer planning improvement group on a task and finish model to take the improvement recommendations contained in this report forward alongside other necessary development areas. So that's the that's the exact wording of the of the PAS report. I hope that's helpful. Good, thank you. Um, so um, can, can we can I also sort of can I ask Councillor Henry Batchelor, when Councillor Anna Braddon goes, would you be able to take over the, the vice chair support in terms of the speaker order? Yeah, I'm only a sub, but absolutely I will do it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And so can we go to the next clarification for um, for Rory? I know we've got a list of speakers. If we just sh should we just ask for any clarifications for Rory? I think the next person who'd asked to speak, Councillor Martin Khan. Councillor Martin-Khan. Yes, a lot, of the, a lot of the points were raised came up in the uh, previous uh, clarification uh, by, by Rory. Uh, basically, I'm concerned about the the protocol here. I'm not still not quite clear how the group was set up. Who is therefore going to be the, um, who they're going to report to? Uh, who makes the decisions? Whether this, uh, um, it, it seems to be, a dog's breakfast, I think, a, a, a confusion. Um, it would be clear, nice to be, uh, I'm not sure that planning committee could make decisions on the issues that are involved. Uh, are not, um, sure. Does that not have to go to full council? How would the uh, reporting procedure go? Could you give me some clarification about the, about the, the constitutional arrangements here? I, I, I think the truth is a lot of these matters are going to be resolved once the group meets to be, you know, that, that, uh, you know, we, we have to get the group sort of up and running. And once they meet, as I say, a lot of these these issues will be resolved. I can absolutely 100 percent confirm there's no need for this to go to full councils. In many respects, the group probably could have just been set up by by officers of operational uh, management, but it was felt that members could could feed into the, the process. And that was the uh, the reason why it was um, it's been set up in the manner in which it has. Thank you. So the next speaker is Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Thank you, Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, right, just for clarification, really, we've we've we accept that it's a group. It's not a committee. Um, That's correct. That's correct. Yes, it's not a committee. OK. And obviously, uh, it's been set up uh, through the administration uh, cabinet together with exec, looking at what was required and the time frame within which we wanted this to come back. It was supposed to be a, you know, a quick, uh, a quick look at the recommendations and what can be done and put that in place quickly. So we recognise the urgency of that. Um, and I'm looking at the motion, and it just seems to me, and from what you've said this group has to report to a point rather than to different committees. I don't see that it can decide which committees it takes recommendations to. The administration requested the, um, uh, the, the review 
And it really, you know, I don't see that the planning committee can implement, uh, you know, recommendations from the group. And from what you've said, it seems you're say, suggesting it can go to scrutiny, it can go to committee, it can go to cabinet, but we need a cohesive way in which the feedback from the group is dealt with. And to me, that seems to be to go back to the administration and it's the administration who will then be able to actually put in place what needs to be implemented. Am I correcting that assumption or not? So perhaps the 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 easiest way to try and um, to explain is to take one of the recommendations within the PAS report. So one of the recommendations, which possibly might be one of the most contentious recommendations, but we'll 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 go to it nonetheless. So one of the recommendations is to keep under review the scheme of delegation, so the planning committee focuses on deciding the most important planning applications. So when the the committee group, sorry, apologise, when the group meets. Um, and they consider that recommendation, it, it would be very, very clear that because planning committee is responsible for the, the scheme of delegation, that that group, for instance, wouldn't report back to cabinet on that matter because part of cabinet have no powers to, to, to set the planning scheme of delegation. Therefore, for recommendation two, for instance, that would 100% come back via planning committee. And so I think that when, and, and these discussions these are the types of discussions that I expect when the group is set up at their first meeting to go through each of the recommendations and take recommendation two, for instance, and say, OK, well, we know definitely that that has to be uh, that that should be fed back to to planning committee. Thank you. Um, if I may, Chair, but the, actually the scheme of delegation itself is not being looked at by this group. I mean, that is for the administration or the constitutional uh, group to look at so that uh, I just feel that we're trying we are trying to make this committee what it shouldn't be and I, I what I don't want to see is that we've got recommendations going to different parts of the administration that we don't know about or can't actually um, uh, you know monitor and that wouldn't be an effective way um, of working. Scheme of delegation is not for this for the planning committee, is it? And it's not for this group. <laughs> it is a recommendation, but they will they wouldn't be the ones looking at it. And that's just an example. And if I can, oh, I've lost it now. And also um, asking for the terms of reference. I, we fully expected that the group itself will determine its terms of reference at its first meeting. Mm. I take the point about the chair chairmanship of the group um, and that is fine. You know, uh, we're always looking to improve. So, um, you know, not having an officer if seen as the best thing to do, then that's fine. Um, however, its terms of reference shouldn't have to be approved by the planning committee. This is a group that's looking to help improve the planning committee and you can't be bringing back the terms of reference back into the committee is trying to improve. Um, and so I'm, 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 I'm still very concerned about this motion and I think it is, it's not in the right direction. And the group will be taking any decision anyway, so point three is, uh, is not relevant. And minutes will be taken as usual. <laughs> And you know this should not be a special request or a motion, I don't think. So I'm sorry, but I still I still don't see that we need three or four, um, or even two is required. So why don't we carry on with the group as has been set up? Um, let them have their first meeting, let them have their, their terms of reference, set that all up and start working. Otherwise we'll be holding them up. One is done in three months. Thank you, Councillor Jimmy Hawkins. I'm going to ask also Councillor Henry Batchelor, who has asked for a clarification question, Rory, before you come back on that one. Yes, thank you. I mean, it's in a similar vein to the other questions. I mean, I just want a bit of clarity on this motion that Councillor Williams has put in front of us. I mean, is this for, are the points in there for this planning committee to decide, or can some of the finer detail be thrashed out at the first meeting? That's just what I want exactly. some clarity on. Should we be deciding this now, or should we leave it up to the group to govern itself, essentially? I mean, that's just a, a legal question for you. Well, I, I, th I think 
that is ultimately a, a point for for members here today. Do you want to accept that motion, which case it's set by planning committee in, in, in and if you don't want it, then obviously it will fall to the it'll fall to the, the group to set up the terms of reference. So it's, an, it's it's entirely a matter for members how they wish to do it. OK, thank you. And um, Councillor Richard Williams, I think you're next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for letting me have a second go at this as well. I'm, 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 I must say I'm I'm not more confused. This is this is this. I know we didn't want to get stuck in in process, but Councillor Hawkins has just suggested that uh, this group is not going to look at the scheme of delegation, even though it's a recommendation. But is also saying the group will set its own terms of reference. I mean, both of those of can't really be true because if it can set its own terms of reference on the basis of this report, presumably it could decide to look a recommendation to, which is in this report. And nowhere does it say a list of the recommendations that uh, this group can or cannot take forward, as has just been suggested that somehow there is a list of recommendations in here that are for this group and recommendations which aren't. I, I find no list of that. I'm afraid this is becoming less and less clear um, as we go on as to what this group is actually going to do. Um, I, I, I did have a, a, another point of clarification, which is why uh, this couldn't be a task and finish group. Um, we're, we're creating this group which has no constitutional basis at all. Therefore, we have no idea really what the rules are that apply to it. So why couldn't it be a, 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 just a task and finish group as Councillor Bradnam is quite right when it was introduced in scrutiny, it was said it would be a task and finish group because of course task and finish groups can co-opt members to the group who are not elected members. So we could have a group of officers and members on a task and finish basis. In fact, under the task and finish rules in the constitution, which had non councillors on it they just have to be co-opted by the group and that i think would be you know at least a clear basis we'd all know where we were rather than this situation where we don't know where we are but given if, if this is the you know this is the, the proposal i think having some constitutional rules as in this motion uh, would be better but as i say I, i'm now confused as to what this group can and cannot do because it's been suggested there are things they can't do but that's not in the motion so now I think Councillor Richard Williams, yes. just as chair, what I'd just like to do is what, what I heard was it's actually about where it reports to on the recommendations. And I think that was Councillor Tumor Hawkins' point mm -hmm. is whether or not the issue of scheme of delegation, where that goes to in terms of a recommendation rather than whether or not the um, planning development group, you know, reviews the recommendations. Thank you, Chair. With, with your... If, if that is indeed the case, then this group can look at scheme of delegation. It's vital that an officer doesn't chair it because that's a really potentially contentious issue and not one that members we should be abrogating our responsibilities for to officers. It's not fair to officers to do that. OK, Thank and I think what we'll we'll do now, members, is take this um, to a vote. We're going to ask Councillor Heller Williams, you are able to come back and speak to the, the group now in terms of your motion, if you wanted to say anything additional at the end of that that debate. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so the first thing, the first thing that I, I would like to do is summing up is say that the conversation that's gone on, the debate that's been had is actually the, the main reason I brought this motion. The truth is we don't know. So we've been told that it's not going to be a decision making body. However, it will be deciding what it, what it can talk about and where that, that gets reported to. That in itself is a decision, so the two cannot compete. Other things that have been mentioned and words of probably envisage, you know, and, and so on and so forth. We, we've got a cabinet member who, you know, quite, quite rightfully is saying that the cabinet set this up so it should report to cabinet. However, nothing that we know it so far means that would actually have any basis or any reality or would ever even happen. And actually, to be completely clear, the scheme of delegation of the planning committee is not a political function. It's a, it's a function of the planning authority. It's a statutory function and only planning committee, no cabinet interference, only planning committee can actually adopt that scheme of delegation. So we've got conflicts there in itself as well. If there was a decision made about the number of people on this committee and the time it would take and how it, everything else and nobody's had involvement in that and we've heard that other than cabinet and officers 
we're relying on a task and finish model and a task and finish basis, but already cherry picking what we will or won't use in that. For example, the chairmanship where we've got clear evidence. Um, and we're being told that some of these things are not relevant and they're going to happen anyway. In that case, my argument would be what's the problem with adopting the motion? So we've had complete conflicting uh, information given here. It is entirely summed up why I brought this in the first place, because otherwise what we are doing is we are giving authority in supporting this today and the establishment of a group to be self-governing from, a, from a, this committee is a statutory function of this council, which is not a political function, a statutory function. And we are then going and saying that we are going to have this and it's going to cabinet. It should all go to cabinet all go in one place. No, you know, some of it might go this, that and the other. Support the motion. Let the terms of reference. This doesn't say this motion does not say that this committee says the terms of reference. All it does is ensure that the terms of reference comes back to us and we see it before any further action is done. Because right now we don't know what we're voting for. They should be allowed to set their own terms of reference. I understand that and that, that's why it's for them to do that. So there's a statutory body in here with the people and this is planning. This is an advisory service. This is we should be able to see that before it is enacted upon and then have the opportunity to raise concern as it is because right now truth is from this debate nobody knows and that is not a satisfactory and and the governance is so crucial to get gain confidence i'm sounding that people can't see that Thank you very much, Councillor Heather Williams. Um, and just as a point of clarification, I'm looking at page 388 so that we are all clear. Recommendation two, when we've referenced scheme of delegation, the recommendation, what it says is, the, isn't a recommendation on scheme of delegation. What it is is saying that it's kept under review. That's the recommendation and that a formal review is undertaken in no later than a year. I just want to clarify that point. Um, so what we have in front of us is um, this motion. We have scrutiny having supported the establishment of this um, planning development group. It's saying that in its first meeting it should set up its own terms of reference. It has proposed that the chair of that is head of transformation. That is something that could be decided by the group deciding on its remit. The recommendation for the way it was set up was put forward by cabinet of the administration to scrutiny and it was established at the, you know it was supported its establishment under that what we have is a motion which from councillor heather williams um, has brought forward we have that had that on the screen we've had just had that and debated we've had um, legal um, guidance and advice in response to some of the queries from rory mckenna in terms of some of those challenges that were considered constitutional challenges to whether or not it could be set up in the way it was. And as I understand, there, there aren't constitutional risks in the way it has been established and that much can be decided within the first meeting. Um, I understand that Councillor Heather Williams, what she's putting forward is a way of agreeing how that's put forward um, with the three points that were in that motion. So we'll now... Chair, Chair, sorry to interrupt, but can I just propose we go to a vote on the motion? Um, I'm just going to say that now. Thank you, Councillor Bradenham. So therefore, with that summary, which I think is one of the recommendations, Councillor Bradenham, is that we guide decision making by coming up with a summary of what's sort of been said, which is what I'm trying to do just there. Um, and therefore, we come to a vote on that motion, which has been proposed by Councillor Heather Williams and is seconded by Councillor Nick Wright. So I'm going to do that as I hear there are differences of opinion. So I am going to um, do a roll call. Councillor Claire Don, can you take your camera off? Thank you very much. Um, and we'll go to a roll call members. And this is, as I said, on B of recommendation, which is around sort of the process and governance of this group. Councillor Henry Butcher, this is whether you are for, for, against or abstaining on the motion as presented um, by Councillor Heather Williams. On Sorry, Chairman, can I just have clarification? Maybe my old brain's getting muddled at this time of the day. 
We are voting on the new motion, aren't we? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Chairman. Just want Thank to say we're voting on the motion presented by Councillor Heather Williams and seconded by Councillor Nick Wright. Good so chairman. you could say for, against or abstain. Councillor Henry Batchelor. I'm against, Chair. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Against. Councillor Martin Kahn. Against. Councillor Peter Fain. Against. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Against. Councillor Deborah Roberts. For. Councillor Heather Williams. For. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. For. Councillor Eileen Wilson. Against. Councillor Nick Wright. For. And Councillor Pippa Halings, myself. Against. That's seven against and four supportive. Um, therefore, the motion is not carried. And Chairman, I must leave at this point. Thank, thank you. you and thank much. you for your support, Councillor Bradenham, as well. Um, in support, <laughs> Councillor Henry Batchelor will supporting now in terms of the rest of the debate. Um, the rest of that recommendation to committee was around the substantive nature. One was to note that um, note the report, um, note this, we said the arrangements of this and agree that an update report on progress of implementation of report recommendations and of those recommendations coming back to planning committee in April. Um, and obviously, as we've just heard, you know, in April, but also some of the recommendations um, could be brought for discussion as well at, at planning committee. Do I have anybody else who would like to speak to the substantive issues within the report. As Sharon Brown said, she and Jeff um, are very much listening to any of those comments and recommendations that are there. It's not the only opportunity. And as I understand, um, Jeff is from a previous briefing is open to doing a survey to all committee members to make sure that um, there are multiple opportunities for planning committee members to provide input. Um, but yes, so on, on the substantive items now, committee, please. Thank you very much. Oh, in terms of the content, sorry, what's what I mean? In terms of the substantive. Councillor Heather Williams. Could you help first. me with the, with the speakers list? Yeah, Councillor Heather Williams first, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry, Heather, I think we may have lost you. Um, and one of the sorry, Councillor Heather Williams, I'm sorry, we've I think we've lost you in terms of both video but also sound quality, audio quality. I'm sure. Now I'm sorry, Liam, could you is is there an, an issue with the whole thing or is that just oh, with uh, yeah, no, like uh, to me, it, it just sounds like she's suffering like poor connection, you know, because you can hear little snippets coming through every now and again like that. That's what I would advise is, is just her Wi-Fi is, is, is playing up. So maybe just pause for a second now. Uh, yeah, wait to see if she Chairman. can get. Oh, Chairman, I'm back, but I think if I put my camera on again, I'm I'm going that's to. Fine, that's fine, that's fine. So if I can have my camera off. Yeah, that's fine if there's a bandwidth issue. Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. Um, I'm going to go really quickly just in case just in case it comes up again. Um, but so, yes, yeah, um, one of my parish councils has asked me in relaying them this report um, about paragraph 4.36 um, and really would like the council to take into consideration about weight. Um, what they've said is when there's a difference of opinion on the way supply to a legitimate planning consideration between an officer and a parish council that leads to officers recommending a different outcome, then the issue should be discussed with the parish council. And if it cannot be resolved, then it should go to the full planning committee for fairness. And I think I think that's actually a, a fair point that we should look at because we do have in 1.11 about the parishes being ignored. And later on, it does go on to say about the number of applications coming to, to committee. 
So I thought it was important to, to relay that message. Um, and then for myself, um, I, I do welcome some of the things in the report about um, I, I would like to have more regular updates on the five year housing land supply. I think that's something as a committee we've actually asked for on several occasions and to to my reference, I don't think we've ever had a had anything come through on that on that um, score. And I, I think to be clear, I think regular means not once once a year. Um, we are making decisions and we're asked often to take into consideration the um, impact on the five year housing land supply. So we ought to be more regularly informed than we are. So I look forward to seeing how that is proposed, but I would like to say that it should be more than annually. Um, and I really would like the, the group that um, looks at this to to look through and carefully look at what it says in relation to more cross party um, cooperation and support and information, because I think that in itself can lead to a breakdown in trust, not only internally, but externally as, as well. And I'm so just to be clear, clear I'm referring to 4.23. Um, I, I agree that the way that the council has adapted to virtual meetings has been good, as, as has just been demonstrated by my camera. It's not always perfect, but it but it is um, good strides forward. Um, and we do need to know, I, I think the in 4.18, what it says in relation to mistakes, you know, that that is that is serious. Um, it does need to be considered. And I think that would be in my eye, that would be the first thing to, to look at because, you know, we need to get our basics right um, and we need to start building faith. And we're not going to do that while we're having um, those sorts of issues. Um, I would also say possibly quite cheaply, as we have the chairman of the Staffing Employment Committee, that on 4.27, um, I appreciate that the influx of new staff, etc., is is a, um, a, a management issue. However, we do have a staffing employment committee, and we do look at things like retention. And I would encourage this group to look at the other committees that the um, council has and see where those committees can also be utilised best. So I think that's it. Just in case my my bandwidth goes again, I think I've highlighted through through the through the report that I would I would like more regular briefings um, you know and I I come at that from position as a group leader but for, for my group as well um, but however when it comes to recommendations in this report I do not feel in clear conscience I can support the establishment of a group where not only do we have confusion but we also do not have clear parameters clear governance and and I also now, as the motion has fallen, do not have a clear um, view of when we will get sight of that or what recourse it will take. And we do not know, we made quite clear, we do not know whether this will be a politically reporting group, like aka to a political body such as cabinet, or whether it will be focusing on the statutory function, which is apolitical. It does not give me confidence in what has actually been highlighted in the report about the need for more cross-party and apolitical nature and while I wish the group well because it's a very important thing that they're about to embark on from a governance point of view I think it's highly irresponsible to not have at least a recourse for that information and I can't support that. Thank you Chairman. Thank you very much Councillor Heather Williams um, and thank you for those substantive items as well. And I'm sure that they'll be taken forward and taken forward by the, the group as well as minutes from this meeting. Members, um, you know, this is partly our opportunity to have to have looked at the substantive content of this report. And I just wondered if, you know, there were things that you also others of you wanted to point out um, as planning committee in this opportunity in a way of feeding in on, on those recommendations. Any other comments you have on them or where you're sort of um, very supportive of those? recommendations. Councillor Roberts, Chairman. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you again, Chairman. Um, 
I'm sorry, but I've now lost confidence in this. Um, I think we've just lost a golden opportunity to actually make sure that we were setting ourselves on the right train. Um, I'm sorry, but it, it seems to me that this has been a terribly political vote. Um, planning is supposed to be apolitical. This was a chance for us, a motion just to clarify. Um, and it was a chance for us actually to indicate that that report had been taken on board. I'm afraid it hasn't. Um, and I have no confidence now in that what you're doing is actually going to uh, oblige um, the group of people who recommended to us um, the changes that we need to be made. So I have to say, no, I'm not going along with this. It's a whitewash now and it'll come back to haunt us. Thank you, Councillor Deborah Roberts. Um, just before the next sort of, as chair, I'm also one of the members of this group. And as I introduce this item, um, as I said, this is hugely important as a group. It's been put forward as a joint member officer group. And I recommendation one is about how we improve relationships and communications, the ability to have the kind of group that was described by Rory McKenna, our monitoring officer, where we work together in a discursive, deliberative manner, looking at the recommendations, understanding how that bringing in all of um, further confident contributions and evidence, discussing them um, and then providing the recommendations for that. Myself, as a member of that group, know that we've all said this report was fair in both what it said has been good, but also in its criticisms. And we need to take on board those criticisms. And I, as a member of this group, will and actually show everybody this will not be a, a whitewash in any way. And as I've heard from Sharon at the beginning, many of the um, recommendations that were about the way in which development management happens have already been taken on board and already changing and transforming practice. In, for example, the way in which the patch managers, development area managers are already um, setting up that way of working together with parish councils, as Heather Williams has said, you know, if there is more regular communication, they feel that they have the flow, they can talk through the concerns they've had with an application with the planning officers and the heads of those planning officers in that particular area before then um, a recommendation is made for it to come to planning committee will um, I would hope and I think the group would look at that these are ways in which we can do it they're already starting to act on those recommendations which shows that there is a real commitment to 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 really take on board these recommendations um, well, I do have other people ready to speak Councillor Henry Batchel who we got We've got councillors Khan and then Wright. Thank you, Councillor Martin Khan. Uh, <clears throat> simply, I, I wanted to comment that uh, I, I'm very much in favour of the recommendations of the report, uh, but in terms of the role of of the group, uh, I think it's clear now uh, uh, that the from all the discussions that the line of uh, of operation is uh, from 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 the group via the um, scrutiny committee then to cabinet, um, uh, so that that. That is a, for a clear way. I think the, the so the Mark, Councillor Martin Khan, we're not going back over the no, government. No, no, I just, I just so we, we're talking about the, the recommendations within the report, please. So yeah. I'm pleased of this. I'm pleased of this. Uh, I think it's got a, a an able. Uh, we, we have an able committee uh, uh, group uh, established who are perfectly capable of doing this, uh, uh, and I hope we can go forward and uh, 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 note the recommendations, and, and it's the right the right way forward it's not a it's not a rejection of some of the comments it's a it's a comment about um so, so martin thank you martin I, I, what i'm I, saying I, is I, we, we won't go over the goals what we're asking now is around the content and the recommendations themselves away from the establishment of the of the group what i'm hearing is you are supportive of the the recommendations which are in that report um yeah thank you uh, yes i am yes Thank you very much. And Councillor Nick Wright. Just to say that I'm supportive of the recommendations. Um, and I'm pleased Martin, uh, Councillor Martin Khan's just spoke then because uh, talking of the group, which he previously described before we tried to amend it as a dog's breakfast, uh, you know, it, it, it in his own words, um, 
I am really worried that this group has no direction, doesn't know who to report to, doesn't have any clear leadership. It is, as he called it, that at the moment. And that needs to be addressed very firmly and quickly to give us some guidance on, you know, how we're going to, you know, we're going to make recommendations on the recommendations that were put forward quite clearly by PASC. And, you know, it makes you wonder with this uncertainty, if they hadn't um, advised that we had to have this group, that we could have just gone ahead and implemented the recommendations. Thank, Thank you. you I, I am going to try as chair to say that we've had the motion which is around the governance, which was B. We um, will, uh, everybody, I'm sure all of the members of that group and committee committed to now looking at how we take it forward. What I am inviting in this part of the debate is detail around the recommendations themselves beyond the recommendation about the setting up of that, that group. So these are things that would feed in to that group and to officers. Thank you very much. Who do I have now, Councillor Henry Batchelor? We have two councillors, councillors Hawkins and then Richard Williams. Thank you. Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins. On the recommendations, please. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, I am thankful to the uh, uh, peer reviewers uh, for this uh, quite comprehensive um, report and just to let um, you know, those who are watching know that we have begun to take on board uh, a number of these recommendations. And um, you know, we knew we we're doing some things well, and we knew that some things weren't happening as well as they could. Um, you know, training is an important one, and one of the things that uh, you know members will notice is that we have started to do what we call bite-sized training sessions. Um, ahead of planning committee meetings on issues that you know members want to know about, and this has helped, I believe, in terms of actually understanding um, some of the issues relating to the applications that we then go on um, to to determine. And in terms of parish councils, I mean, parish councils have felt for a very long time, way past two years, well, you know, for as long as I've known planning committee, um, and it's it's the effect of thinking that they are not listened to because they're not told that they have been listened to and these are the reasons why their request isn't being granted and we are now doing better on that because we are now you know telling talking to them before um you know the decision is made as whether or not to go to committee uh they even when it is uh, the request doesn't get granted they now get notification of why that is, and that is helping them to understand rather than feeling that they're not being listened to. And I think the communications part of it, we do really need to get better at that, and we will get better at that. So there's good things in here, and I am looking forward to what will come out of the development group, frankly. Um, and I'm sure that at their first meeting, they will sort out. Well, we're not, well that will leave that one. Thank what you. What they're gonna be doing and how they're gonna be doing it. But this is a report which I think we can all stand by which you can all support because it enables us to serve our residents even better and that is the whole point of this so thank you thank you and i and i think what the development group probably will be looking at is not assuming that communications have got better because we've done something but also the ways in which we engage with parish councils to find out if they are really seeing you know that difference and not just assuming that yes councillor richard williams please Thank you very much, Chair. Um, there's, there's a lot I welcome in this report. I think it's very well put together. I think the group has done a good job. Um, and obviously, I what, what Sharon Brown said um, at the start of the meeting, I was very pleased to hear. Um, you know, I think the officers are approaching it in in, in exactly the right way. Um, I mean, I hope, as I say, I hope a lot of good can come out of this. I think um, thinking about the way that officers and members communicate with each other and the cultural behaviours the report talks about around that, I think that would be a very useful thing um, that we could do. Um, just in terms of understanding a little bit more about each other's roles and each other's perspectives and, and respecting those roles and perspectives, you know, on, on, on both sides, obviously. Um, the training, I think, could be very, very um, good as well. I mean, I'd, I'd particularly like to see maybe some briefing on specific issues that we know are coming up in planning committee. So, for example, we've had some questions about fallback positions um, recently. It would be useful if members yeah. could be given a short, you know, uh, short training session on 
the law around fallback positions before committee so that we're not having to try and work that out in committee. So I think a lot of good can come out of this report. Um, so I do, um, I, I, I do um, welcome it. I mean, I, um, I'd say a little bit just about, about, about the, the context of it. I mean, it, it's a shame we've had a party line vote, given that um, one of the things this recommendation, this report talks about um, is trust. And at this late hour, I would I would love it if we could iron out these procedural questions behind the scenes so that we can all start on the basis of um, you know, the best possible trust and confidence um, in, in the committee. And I, I will just say that my concerns about the constitutional basis of it, they're, they're not a party trick. They are, are genuine concerns about having a, a committee without you know, any, any firm constitutional foundation, but I accept we've had that argument. Um, but anyway, there's a lot I would welcome in, this, I welcome in this report, and I hope we can move forward positively. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Richard Williams. And just to clarify that, you know, that's why I brought Rory in, that um, it, it was just to understand and reassure people around those constitutional challenges that were brought up, not, not as a party political issue. Um, committee, I'm going to move now that we look and move to a vote around the um, the recommendations from officers on this and it is as one recommendation made up of these parts it's recommended that planning committee note the content and recommendations set out in the planning advisory service report note the arrangements put in place for the development group that will oversee the implementation of the report recommendations and agrees that an update report on progress of implementation of the report recommendations should be provided to planning committee in in april um, and I'm going to do a roll call. So please say whether you are for, against or abstaining in support of the recommendation in the presentation of this report. So starting with Councillor Henry Batchelor. For Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Anna Bradenham is no longer with us as I understand. Councillor Martin Kahn. For. Councillor Peter Fain. For. Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins. For. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Against. Councillor Heather Williams. Right, so, so A and C or B against. I thought that I might be going, I think I'm going forward. Um, because it says, I put it forward to a vote as one recommendation. Um, I'll I think change it to against chairman if that helps but yeah I'm sorry about that I think actually, I'm not against the group it's, it's no I understand uh, yeah I understand would if I'd have a motion to sort of divide it up okay um councillor Dr Richard Williams abstain councillor Eileen Wilson for councillor Nick Wright against and myself the Hailings for That's six, four, three against and one abstention. So the recommendation um, is adopted and we have noted the content, the arrangements and agreed that an update report come forward and wish. And I think notwithstanding everything that's made here, everybody does wish that development group um, really all strengthened and um, good luck with really taking this forward. Thank you, everybody. 20 past four. Thank you, Sharon, for presenting that. Thank you. Committee, well, we're moving to agenda item 10, but it's 4.20. Um, does anybody need a short break before we go into agenda item 10? Or can we just move forward? Chairman, I'm going to have to leave because my daughter's nursery is calling, so I may or may not be back depending on what they're what they're ringing about. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So just let Sorry. us know when you come back in. Thank you very much. I will do. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Anybody Chairman, else? Sorry to interrupt, but I, I will have to leave as well. Councillor Nick Wright, I have a meeting at five o'clock. Thank you. So, so Nick, are you leaving now or at five o'clock? Five to five. OK, thank you for letting it. So would you like us just to move forward? I and I'm assuming from that. Let's move on, please. Yeah, OK, good. Thank you, everybody. We'll move on to agenda item 10 in your agenda report pack. That's on page 401. Um, and this is a, about an enforcement action. Um, but, but given the recommendations 
um, which is a decision. Therefore, it's being treated in a way as an application because there will be public speakers allowed on this point. Um, and this is around 146 Cambridge Road, Wimpole. Um, and the lead officers on this one, Stephen Kelly. Sorry, I've lost my notes in terms of who will be presenting this one in terms of the officers. Yes. Nigel. Nigel Bla Nigel Thank Blazer. you, Nigel Blazer, and I'll bring you in. And what we're being asked to um, decide in, is the recommendation committee members that planning committee authorise the head of legal services in consultation with the joint director of planning and economic development. But in the event that engagement with the owner occupiers of the site is unsuccessful in securing compliance with the condition to initiate measures required to secure compliance with condition one of planning permission S stroke 0583 stroke 14 stroke FL through an application to the court for an injunction under S 187B of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990 as amended. Nigel, thank you very much for, for being here. If you would introduce yourself and then give us the context for this item. Thank you. Certainly, thank you, Chair. So, yeah, my name is Nigel Blaisby. I'm the Delivery Manager for Development Management. Um, I'll just share my screen with you. I've got a, I've got a presentation. Could you just confirm, please, Chair, that you can see the screen OK? Yes, we can. Thank you. Right, so this is a this is a very wide view of the site. So I'm just just to put some context in place. So the site is actually here, but I will be zooming in to, to show you it in more detail, of course. So here's the village of uh, Wimpole and the village framework is drawn fairly tightly around there and got the village of Arrington up here. Um, this is the avenue to Wimpole Hall, which is to the north. So this is the A603, which um, Cambridge is off to the east. And this is the A1198 um, that joins Huntington and Royston. So I'll just zoom in a little. So this is the site in here. My apologies that I don't have a red line drawn around it, but, it, but I'm moving my pointer around. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so this is... Um, this is actually the old Cambridge Road that you can see here. It, it joined up, and that's this is the old Cambridge Road. It's now a spur off of off of the A603. Um, and there's these are um, dwellings here, um, and this is agricultural land to, to the north. And we've got some commercial buildings over to the west. Well, I'll zoom in again. So again, I'm going to draw around the the edge of the site, so you can see the extent of it. Um, there's an access point is in here. Now this used to be an old builder's yard um, many years ago and there is a building on site here which is not part of the, the proposed action um, that, that has um, been there for many many years. Um, so you've got hard standing here. This is the, the mobile home, it's quite a large mobile home and then you've got a structure here which is an open sided um, sort of carport type structure. And then here you've got another building which is um, an amenity building. So, right, so my apologies, these are not up to date photographs, but they are representative of what's on site at the moment. So you can see this is this is the, the, the large mobile home itself. And then you can just see this open structure to the right, which is here. And then to the right of that, you've got this um, this amenity building. So I thought I'd do is give you a bit of a, a rundown of the background to the site, its history and, and what action we've taken. So in 1975, an established use certificate was granted for the operation of building and engineering business um, and then an application was submitted on that use, but then later withdrawn. Um, really in 2014 is when we first, the, the mobile home appeared on site and we received a retrospective um, planning application for the change of use of the land to residential caravan site for one gypsy family, two caravans including one static and the erection of the amenity building. Now at that time, um, because it was unauthorised development, we did a, um, an enforcement um, investigation. So these are the photographs you can see dated 26th of March 2014. Um, so the site was largely cleared 
Um, this base was put down and, and this is the mobile home that was later put on this base. So the amenity building, yeah, it was put up in this location here. So that's just another view looking back at the, at the mobile home at the time. Um, and then this is the point of access. Um, so the mobile home's actually moved over to the right from where, you know, where, where it is today. Um, right, so on the 26th of March, um, we served an enforcement notice and the breach of planning control alleged was without planning permission, changing use of the land to stationing residential occupation of a twin unit mobile home and carrying out operational development upon the land by laying hard core to form a hard standing for the mobile home. Um, and essentially the requirements of the notice were to cease the use and remove all the structures and hard, hard standings. So in June 2014, the, the planning application I referred to before that was submitted um, around the time mobile home was erected was refused and it was refused for four reasons. So we felt the applicant had failed to satisfactorily demonstrate that he and his family were actually gypsies for the purposes of planning policy. Um, we felt the development failed to preserve the character and appearance of the landscape and was considered incompatible with its location. Um, the site was felt to lie in an unsustainable location well outside of any village framework. So what I showed you, the, the group of dwellings that I showed you are not within any village framework. And then finally, we felt that the applicant had failed to demonstrate by way of a suitable transport statement that the continued use of the site was not resulting in harm to highway safety. Right, so um, they were uh, appealed um, in July 2014, both the enforcement notice and the planning refusal were appealed. Now the, the planning appeal was allowed, um, having regard to the personal circumstances of the appellant, but with a number of conditions, including condition number one, which is the critical one, and this one only granted consent for a limited period of two years, and at the end of which all of the all of the uh, mobile homes and buildings and structures had to be removed and the use had to cease. The only thing that wasn't included was the was the hard standing, which the inspector felt did not um, generate any harm. So the inspector was not prepared to grant a permanent permission, and these are uh, some extracts from the appeal decision. So the inspector felt that the prevailing sense of place has been compromised by the introduction of the substantial static mobile home on the agricultural side of the road, um, despite the established presence of the former building engineering yard structure. That was the existing building that I referred to. And the inspector said, I find the substantial harm to the character and appearance of the countryside would be caused by the appeal scheme in the event that the existing land use and proposed community building were allowed to remain indefinitely by reason of a permanent planning commission. And the realisation of sustainable development objectives will be similarly compromised and harm associated there which will carry similar weight. Now, as, as you know, the condition was not complied with and the use of the site continued. So as a result of that, in June 2018, we served a breach of condition notice um, that was not complied with. Um, we prosecuted um, on that basis and in December 2018, the owner of the site was convicted for failing to comply with the notice. We did receive another application in 2019 for the mobile home, but it was not registered or, or subsequently progressed. It was invalid and it, it never went anywhere. Um, the, the occupiers remained on site and then in May 2019, we again, um, the, the occupier was, was convicted for failing to comply with the notice yet again. So since then, um, the council has sought to engage with the occupiers, owners, to determine their personal circumstances and needs, but we have had no response. Um, a request for the occupier to complete a needs assessment was also made in early 2020, but again, no response was received. Um, local residents remain concerned with the unauthorised use and the harm identified continues to take place uh, on the site. Um, so if I just go through really the basis for the recommendation. So officers remain of the view that the site continues to give rise to planning harm as identified by the appeal inspector and that securing compliance with the planning condition of the original planning commission is in public interest. So one option would be to serve another enforcement notice, as you have seen in the report, but we Hi, thought this would, yes. Sorry, just one moment. Councillor Peter Fane, could you mute please? Because um, there's disturbance coming in, in Nigel's presentation. Thank you, Councillor Peter Fain. Can you mute? Thank you. I am mute, yes. Thank you, Nigel, thank you. 
Mm, thank you. Um, so one option would be to serve another enforcement notice as we, we've set out in the report, but um, taking account of the occupier's failure to act following the two convictions and the lack of engagement to date, this approach is not considered likely to be effective. So officers have sought advice from council, which has suggested that the most appropriate means to achieve compliance is through an injunction. Um, one or more of the occupiers of the site has been identified as having gypsy or traveller status, as I said, and the inspector broadly accepted this. Um, before any potential injunctive action is taken, the local plan authority would need to carefully consider the personal circumstances of the occupiers, recognising that the court will also consider whether the local planning authority has taken account of the personal circumstances of the defender and any hardship that injunctive relief might cause. So officers will again need to try to engage with the occupiers, both to continue to seek compliance, but also to undertake a needs assessment and to understand their personal circumstances. And as part of any application to the courts for an injunction, the local planning authority would need to consider any change in planning circumstances and the occupiers' needs and personal circumstances, having regard to Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the provisions of the Equalities Act, particularly having regard to COVID-19 statements, the adopted local plan policy H22 and the NPPF. So authority to seek injunctive action, we believe, may encourage the occupiers to engage, but should they continue to fail to respond, we feel we would still need to secure compliance with the planning condition because of the ongoing harm. And we, we therefore recommend that the committee grants authority to seek injunctive action to do so. And I'll just put the formal recommendation from the report up on the screen. Thank you, Chair. Apologies there. Um, yes, any clarification questions for Nigel? We have one from Councillor Fane. Councillor Peter Fane. Thank you, Chair. I'm surprised that the authority needs uh, approval from this committee. Uh, we don't normally require that for enforcement action to be taken. Why in this case, and surely in relation to the needs assessment, it's clear that's not going to happen before the uh, enforcement action, further enforcement action is taken. Um, can it not be negotiated afterwards? Um, Hi, John. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of the, the first question, um, the, the, the need for the committee to consider this is, um, is because of the scheme of delegation. Effectively, we don't have authorisation as officers to, um, to make this decision. It needs to be a committee decision. Um, could I ask you to repeat the second question, please? Sorry, I didn't quite catch it. I was suggesting that if the needs assessment has not been possible, that could follow once the further enforcement action is taken. Is, the, is it required to have the needs assessment before anything can proceed? Um, I, I think um, we we need really to understand the personal circumstances of the of the occupiers of the building. Um, that would be far preferable to just taking action in, in, without that. Um, we have tried to um, understand those by approaching the occupiers, but as I said in, in my presentation, we've been unsuccessful with that so far. They, they, they just have not responded to us. Um, so we, we would hope that if the committee is minded to grant us this authorization, that might help us um, in, in trying to engage with the occupiers. Um, but if if they if they fail to uh, engage with us, then I think we would still we still feel that we would need to approach the courts, and we would have to explain that to the courts in seeking the injunction that we had made every attempt to understand their circumstances um, before taking the action. But we're in a position where we feel we need to address this. This is a, a the, the mobile home has been there for many years now. Um, we haven't been successful with the action that we've taken so far. So we feel we need to take this step, um, but ideally we would do that in, in full knowledge and understanding of the circumstances of the of the occupiers. But if we're not able to engage with them, we 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 would like to take the action anyway. And it's up to the courts, of course, whether they would grant us the injunction. Thank you, Nigel. Do we have any more questions? Not that I can see, Chair. No. 
Good, thank you. So, um, members will now go to the public speaking section for this item on the agenda. Um, and I think we have a representation from the Parish Council. Councillor Ian Hack, are you with us? And thank you so much for your patience in waiting for this item to be addressed. Thank you. That's, that's OK. Thank you very much for the invitation. Can you hear me OK? I can, but I can't see you. OK, hang on. Hi, uh, camera. And, and Councillor Heather Williams, uh, I think, are you with us? But um, if you can turn your camera off, I think. We can see you now, Ian. OK, is that OK? Yes, and oh, half of you's disappeared. Right, OK, hang on, let's try that. Oh, That's that, better, yes, that better? thank you. Okay. And the first question would be whether you have authorisation to speak on behalf of the Parish Council. Uh, yes, I do. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. And you, you know the procedure, do you, by now that you have three minutes to, to speak to? Yes, that's right. Yes. So uh, so I've just prepared, uh, prepared some notes. Uh, so on behalf of Wimpole Parish Council, I support the application for enforcement action uh, 146 Cambridge Road. <clears throat> There's been a lot of frustration expressed by residents in Cambridge Road and the neighbouring Wimbridge Close, uh, the length of time this whole process has taken. Whilst I understand that each stage has to be completed carefully, there is a deep feeling of resentment that the applicant has been able to stretch the rules to suit their own purposes and that if the local resident has breached any planning laws in such a way they've not been able to have played the system in such a way and for so long. The residents have also expressed their deep concern about the considerable expense that this case has resulted in which ultimately falls upon us all as council taxpayers. Whilst I respect that this meeting is here today to discuss breaches of the planning regulations I would like to make you aware that over the last five years there have been many incidences of antisocial behaviour in relation to this site. Loud music into the early hours, dangerous dogs that have been allowed to roam loose resulting in at least three attacks which required police involvement, illegal dog breeding and frequently burning foul smelling waste which is uh, which obviously hasn't been very pleasant for the uh, for the neighbours. Such actions uh, I believe further demonstrate their contempt for abiding by the rules and any intent to integrate with the local community. I'd like to take this opportunity to, to thank our district councillor Aidan van der Waer and the officers at SDC for their painstaking work on this case and I trust now that there will be a swift and successful conclusion to this matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. And and as you say, what we must stick to are the, the material planning considerations that we have yeah, within us. Thank you very much. Does anybody like any questions to, to Ian? Can't see any, Chairman. Thank you very much. And so Thank now we move to local member, Councillor Aizen van Dijk. Um, yep, good afternoon, uh, good afternoon committee. Um, thank you very much for um, letting me speak. Um, so the report sets out, uh, I think very clearly, the planning considerations at hand. Um, as you've heard, uh, the issues around this, the use of this land began uh, nearly seven years ago. Um, and with the exception of these two uh, temporary years of, of permission, um, uh, the use of this land has been unauthorised. Uh, the planning harm is quite clear, and this was accepted by the appeal inspector who granted the temporary permission. Uh, the, the impact of the unauthorised use of this land has been very severe locally uh, and, and this has been really un unfortunate. Um, throughout the period, uh, the council has sought to, to respect the circumstances of the owners and occupiers. Um, the, the, the grounds for seeking an injunction um, are robust. We've had this uh, advice from, from council, uh, council uh, and the council, our council, uh, I think would have a very good chance of success um, at this point given um, uh, our actions thus far. I, I think it's uh, reasonable to move forward uh, with work on an injunction uh, on the basis proposed in the recommendation. That is, uh, uh, if the engagement with the owners uh, and occupiers does not succeed. Uh, the council, as you've heard, ha has sought to engage both on the planning issues and on the housing needs. Um, as this matter proceeds, I think we would be wise to allow officers some leeway in how to manage the interaction between the legal process and any engagement. Obviously, it would be uh, clearly better if engagement was achieved, um, but we do, do really need to move forward uh, nevertheless. So I very much hope you can uh, support this officer recommendation 
uh, in the report uh, and support uh, the council and especially support local residents as they seek to resolve this this long long standing and very serious planning breach thank you very much thank you and do we have any questions for um councillor van der Weyer? we have one from councillor wright Councillor nick wright thank you chairman my question is to speak when we throw the, the oh, okay thank you very much thank you very much um Councillor Van Dyer, I'll open this now to debate and we'll start with you, Councillor Nick Wright, and I know that you've got a time pressure as well, so thank you. Thank you, and I, I wanted to you know, say that we've heard a lot about harm in this and uh, planning harm um, and you know, the issue that it's been going on so, la so long. My concern is harm to local residents here uh, and you know, from two meetings with them a long way, a long time ago, it was absolutely clear at the time this was a damaging application and damaging the quality of life to local residents in spite of their every efforts to make it work. Um, it, it has not been successful and I fully support the recommendation and just urge everybody to get on with it as quickly as possible. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. And um, if we move to the vote, hopefully we'll be able to continue count with your vote before you have to go as well. Um, Councillor Eileen Wilson. Uh, I, I just want to say that I, I believe that the officers have made every effort possible to achieve compliance in this case. And if they feel that an injunction, taking, a, taking an injunction activity is the way to achieve compliance and make sure that all the interests are served, then I fully support that. Thank you very much. Do we have any more speakers? Councillor Hawkins. Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll keep it brief. Uh, we have tried everything. Um, and for us, this is a kind of, you know, last ditch effort to make sure that uh, we can remove the harm that is being caused um, to the residents, um, you know, in terms of their own, um, you know, well-being and amenity, really. And of course, you know, it's also our reputation as a local authority, because, you know, if it's taking this long to get this matter sorted, it doesn't help, um, you know, when people go, you know, council doesn't do anything. So I would really urge uh, members to please, um, you know, uh, vote for this and let us get on with sorting this problem out once and for all. Thank you. Thank you. And just from me, in um, what I really appreciate and respect is, notwithstanding the fact that this needs to come to this, this is one of the sort of the strictest forms that um, you know can be used, and it's obviously it's a, it's the last measure, and officers have done everything, and I very much appreciate. Um, the fact that Nigel made very clear and in the report that they will look at COVID in terms of the context of, of any of these decisions as well. Um, members, I'm going to take us to the vote then and I'll do a roll call. Um, and so it would be in terms of the recommendation of this is that we authorise the Head of Legal Services in consultation with the Joint Director of Planning and Economic Development that in the event that engagement with the owner occupiers of the site is unsuccessful in securing compliance with the condition to initiate measures required to secure compliance with condition one through an application to the court for an injunction and that's on page 402 um, paragraph six so please in the roll call let me know whether you're for against or an abstention and as i understand councillor heather williams i see you on my screen but i think you were out during the beginning of this presentation and therefore won't be taking part in the vote. Um, so I'll make the roll call. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Four. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Oh, Councillor Anna Bradnam had to leave us. Councillor Martin Kahn. Four. Councillor Peter Fain. Four. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Four. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Four, Chairman. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Four. Councillor Eileen Wilson. Four. Councillor Nick Wright. Four. And myself, Councillor Pippa Halings. Four. That's carried with nine votes. Um, 
Councillor Adam Bradnam had to leave the meeting. Councillor Heather Williams had problems, technological problems at the beginning of this and therefore wasn't eligible to vote on this item. We have a point of order, Chair. I'm not sure you can see Point that. of order, Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just checking that Councillor Roberts can vote on this. Councillor Deborah Roberts. I don't see why not, Chairman. I don't know these people. I don't know the case at all. Um, no, I've no so reason. It relates to gypsy and traveller issues. So what? And in the past, you have not been allowed to take part in the discussions on those issues. That's all. Should we take advice on that one? Do yes. we have? Uh, Chairman, I, you know, I'm not actually bothered one way or the other. I understand uh, whether I take it, but um, can I just take some advice on that? For, um, do we have legal advice on that monitoring advice, monitoring officer advice? Gone home, lucky <laughs> man. <laughs> Come for his tea. Um, Stephen, um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in view of the comment from Councillor Roberts that she's not bothered either way, could we invite Councillor Roberts to withdraw her vote? Can, can I do that, Councillor Deborah Roberts? Would you um, withdraw your vote? Um, I don't like being bullied, which I feel as though I have been by Councillor Toomey Hawkins. She's got a wonderful memory, hasn't she, when it suits her, um, but I'll withdraw. Thank you. I appreciate that. So the vote is carried with eight votes. And can I ask that um, in light of her intervention, which I don't find amusing, um, that uh, I probably will speak to the um, monitoring officer or get advice from him just in case. I don't want her jumping in every time. Um, it's something um, that is not relevant to anything today. The things that she's talking about happened years and years and years ago. Um, Thank you, Councillor Deborah. I think it would be good to, uh, to have, yeah, to talk to the monitoring officer. Thank you very much. So, committee, um, we now go to agenda item 11, page 407. Um, and this is the enforcement report. And Alistair, I think you're with us. Hello, Alistair. Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, you have this delightful thing where you, you <laughs> come in and rouse us for the very, very ending of our of our committee <laughs> meetings. <laughs> yeah, I'll be very brief because you've you. had uh, a long day. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Do you want I'm, to introduce yourselves as well, Alistair, just for people who yes. are maybe with us? Yeah, Alistair Funge, I'm the Acting Principal Enforcement Officer. Um, I, I do apologise that uh, because of the date that uh, I had to submit my report by, the December figures were, were unavailable. Uh, I will present these uh, next month at, uh, at February's meeting. Um, and because of the way th the thing works, I think that will be the, the way we will have to do it uh, moving forward. Um, I've got no updates on the report as it is, uh, but I'm happy to try and answer any questions if any member wishes me to do so. Thank you very much. Alistair. Are there any questions um, regarding the enforcement report, members? We have one chairman from Councillor Wilson. Yep, Councillor Eileen Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I recall at a previous um, planning committee meeting that we were advised that we would receive regular updates on enforcement action taken um, against um, non-compliance at Smithy Fen, and this seems to be missing in this report. Thank you very much. I see Councillor Nick Wright has also um, asked to speak, and I'm sure that's probably the same question, is it, Councillor Nick Wright? Certainly is, Chairman. <laughs> And I understand we have Stephen Kelly with us as well. I don't know, Alice, did you want to respond to that or, or Stephen Kelly is with us? I'm happy either way. I don't know if Stephen would like to say anything. 
No, go ahead, Alistair. Then okay. I've just been I've just been advised that he might be there to sort of also speak to this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this is, the council are, are looking at this. We had uh, a meeting yesterday with uh, a number of the departments, including including environmental health, the homelessness team, benefits. Um, it's been considered that it's inappropriate for. Uh, planning enforcement to take unilateral action because of the, the likely repercussions on other council departments and the individuals uh, tenants involved. So we're looking to put together a report with a course of action in, in order that we can try and safeguard some of the vulnerable people that are involved in this. Thank you. I see Sharon Brown is with us as well and has asked to speak. Sharon, do you want to add anything to what Alistair's just explained? Um, firstly, I would just like to apologise to those members who did request uh, the report at previous committee meetings and I know that members have mentioned this on more than one occasion, but I do want to uh, um, assure Councillor Nick Rice and those other members that we are working hard to be able to bring a report to planning committee but there are a wide number of issues there's not only the issues which Alistair has mentioned and I was at the same meeting that Alistair was at uh, which was a cross service um, cross council meeting to discuss the issues there's also um, a question of making sure that in respect of Smithy Fen any action that we take has been reviewed in terms of any actions that we may be considering in relation to any other gypsies and travellers sites because we do have complaints not only in relation to the planning service but also um, other services across the council um, in respect to some other gypsy and travellers sites as well so we need consistency of approach um, also in this very difficult constraints of covid and the implications of that we need to make sure, um, as Nigel highlighted in the previous item, uh, that any actions or recommendations for action that we take um, are considered in the current circumstances and uh, be very careful, say, that the uh, actions that we might be considering in relation to any planning matters might not have adverse implications in relation to other services within the council and their ability to deal with issues arising from that. So there are some quite complex issues, but we do appreciate that there is a need to update planning committee as soon as we possibly can. So we are working hard. Uh, we have this cross service officer group now uh, to put together a report and then that would feed into an update to planning committee. And I have been in discussion with Stephen Kelly, the director of planning and economic development about these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Councillor Nick Wright, do you want to come back on that at all? Thank you, Chairman. That's really appreciated. And this is exactly the reason why we wanted this reporting each month, the Planning Committee, because you note the meeting was yesterday, and that was because the meeting of the Planning Committee was today. And this has been going on since July 2016, I think, when the initial action was actioned. Um, you will note from the last item that was seven years it's taken to get to the injunction stage. Two years ago, this site, we noted this site needed to go to injunction. And in fact, that's what the planning committee was told that it would be uh, if you check the minutes going back then. Um, so it is very frustrating and as a councillor I'm very conscious that there's a lot of vulnerable people involved in this and it will take the full services of the council to deal with that. What we don't want to see is those the exploitation of those vulnerable people uh, uh, allegedly continuing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Nick Wright. And Councillor Eileen Wilson, did you want to come back at all? Yeah, yes, I did want to. Um, as a local member, this is something that um, myself and the other local member, we are criticised quite heavily um, by um, 
residents and the local parish council and if we could just be kept informed that things are happening then that that would be really very much appreciated just so that we can just go back to them and say well things are happening the council are aware and um this is being dealt with uh, because without any of that people have the impression that South Cams is not doing anything at all, is doing nothing at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think, do we have any more speakers on this or any more questions? Not that I can see, Chairman. Thank you. So thank you, Alistair, for presenting that in terms of the enforcement. And of course, what we're, we're therefore very anxious to sort of hear what's coming out of that cross member, cross service um, group that's set up. And members, agenda right. Thank you. Thank you. Alistair. Did you want to say anything else, Alistair? There? Um, I was just going to say uh, thank you very much for your time and I hope to have some update for you for next month. Thank you very much. And um, we now go to agenda item 12, which are appeals against planning decisions and enforcement action um, on page 415 of our report. Uh, who's presenting this? Thank you, Chair. That's me. Thank um, you, Chris. I, I don't have any particular updates to make um, other than to say that obviously it's a sort of 50-50 split on appeal decisions received over the last month. Um, nothing in any of those allowed appeals uh, would lead me to consider any theme in terms of appeal decisions being made. They appear to relate to site-specific circumstances rather than uh, anything more, more broadly. Um, but uh, happy to take away any questions if, if members do have any. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Members, do we have any questions about that? I don't think there are any, Chair. OK, thank you for that. And members, that's the, I'm just doubly checking to <laughs> agenda item, but that is the end of the agenda for our planning committee today. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for sticking with me as chair, acting chair in this meeting and apologies um, for any slips I've made in my learning role. And thank you everybody for the time that's taken that we really, really do um, do us appreciate and respect. And I'm now closing the meeting and Liam, you can let us know when we are no longer live broadcast. Yeah, sure. I'm just.